Yep, you look good to me. Okay, I just feel like the all the grays look different. I don't know. Yeah. Why. Oh, we're streaming live I'm now on YouTube. To... We're streaming live on YouTube right now. Mm, awesome. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chair. Hi. 
Um, I don't see if the chief is on. I, I get only part of a screen. So does anybody see if the chief has joined? Oh, and to uh, the right hand corner of your screen, Sandy, there's a little box that says view. Yeah. If you click on that, you should oh, be able to yeah. everything. Yeah. I'm well, sorry. actually, I, no, I'm, yeah, I'm on a, a compromise system. It's not a not a full size system, so I only get part of it. Okay, I, I see the chief is here now, and I see uh, chair and Bev. So I'll get started. Um, it's one o'clock. Um, I'd like to call the meeting of the Finance and Audit Committee to order for the 9th of November, twenty twenty one. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to recognize that Ottawa is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe host nation. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. The Ottawa Police Services Board honors the peoples and land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Today, Ottawa is home to approximately 40,000 First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Ottawa's indigenous community is diverse, representing many nations, languages, and customs. The Ottawa Police Services Board honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Uh, some housekeeping items I just wanna mention, we're currently broadcasting on Zoom. Although it is not our normal practice for committee meetings, we're also live streaming on YouTube today. Given the importance of the subject matter being discussed, namely the budget, we wanted to ensure greater access for the public to watch this meeting. Given this meeting is being held electronically, I want to caution there is a possibility of technical difficulties. Should we receive any disruptions, I would ask that everyone remain patient as we work to fix the issue and resume the, meet resume the meeting as soon as possible. I will now proceed with the confirmation of the agenda that the Finance and Audit Committee confirm the agenda of the 9th of November, 2021 meeting. Is the agenda confirmed? Confirmed. Thank you. Confirmation of minutes. Minutes 15 of the 20th of July, 2021, that the Finance and Audit Committee confirm the minutes from the 20th of July, 2021 meeting. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. Thank you. Business arising from the minutes. Is there any business arising from the minutes? Not hearing any, I'll move on to um, items of business. Uh, item number one, we have only one item of business today, the 2022 draft operating and capital budgets for the Ottawa Police Service. Before I turn things over to the chief and his staff for a presentation on the budget, I would like to make some opening remarks as chair of this committee and a member of the finance and audit committee working group. As most of these of those participating today are aware, the board passed a motion last November to look for opportunities to freeze or reduce the 2022 budget at 2021 levels. Last week, the service tabled the draft budget, asking for an increase of 14 million over last year's budget, which translates into a police tax rate increase of 2.86% plus an assessment growth of 1.7%. Clearly, an increase of $14 million is nowhere near a budget freeze. I do want to recognize the service had originally documented total pressures of 19.1 million for 2022. They went on to identify 5.1 million in savings to help bring that down. I want to commend the chief and his staff for that work. However, a $14 million increase is still not where we need to be from a budget perspective. And it's not because I don't think the OPS does valuable work in the community, quite the contrary. The reality is policing is expensive and the way our budget is growing is unsustainable. The over-reliance on police to address issues which are fundamentally social, issue, social issues needs to stop. And if we are really want to impact the bottom line, we need to address our biggest line item, our staffing costs, which make up 82% of our gross operating budget. I want to be clear, I am in no way advocating for an arbitrary number of layoffs to meet a tax levy target. The board has a responsibility for adequate and effective policing, and we cannot approve a budget that will prevent us from providing necessary policing services in this community. But what we can do is look for ways to reduce the cost of policing on taxpayers 
by earnestly exploring and committing to implementing outsourcing and civilianization where it makes sense, as well as transitioning some services currently provided by the police to other service providers who are better equipped to deliver those services. While I recognize these changes take time, I had hoped we would have been farther along by now in terms of our exploration of these initiatives. Our board was sincere in wanting to look for ways to reduce or freeze the 2022 budget at 2021 levels. This is one of the reasons we hired Strategy Corp, an external firm with expertise in policing to assist us. We are still in the process of reviewing the draft budget and looking for further reductions where possible. The board has between now and our meeting on the 22nd of November to hear from the community and decide what is an appropriate budget for the service in order to provide adequate and effective policing in this community. Chief, I will now turn things over to you for the staff presentation. This will be followed by the public delegations. Upon completion of the delegations, the committee and board members will have an opportunity to ask questions and make comments. Chief, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Smallwood. Uh, and my greetings to all the board members. Uh, Vice Chair, I recognize that you've provided the land acknowledgement on behalf of the Auto Police Services Board. Uh, I'd like to also just uh, state um, unequivocally that the Auto Police Service also honors the peoples of the land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. Uh, the Auto Police Service honors all First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples and their valuable past and present contributions mm -hmm. to this land. So I'll just uh, add on to your land acknowledgement in that regard. Uh, Vice Chair Smallwood Board, uh, the Auto Police Service has submitted uh, the draft 2022 budget to you uh, to ensure the continued ability of the Auto Police Service to provide adequate and effective policing in the City of Ottawa, while also demonstrating an efficient use of police resources and taxpayer dollars. The draft 2022 budget was also constructed to ensure that the Ottawa Police Service achieves the board's four strategic priorities, advancing community policing, modernizing the police service, supporting the health and wellness of our members, and improving equity, diversity, and inclusion. The submitted draft 2022 budget was built in a way that complies with the board's budget-related directions, motions, and resolutions. Specifically, the budget enables the optimal allocation of current resources to match workload and the effective engagement of community assets to share response to specific service demands. The draft budget provides the needed investments for the Ottawa Police Service to continue implementation of its multi-year plan for organizational change and improved service delivery. Changes and improvements that were requested by board members community members, and Ottawa Police Service members themselves. I would like to, in some cases, introduce, and in other cases, reintroduce our interim Chief Financial Officer, Kathy Murray. Some of you will know that Kathy was a long-serving, highly respected and dedicated member of the Ottawa Police Service before she took, took a well-deserved retirement. We've invited uh, Kathy back to be the interim Chief Financial Officer, as we go about our new search uh, for the CFO. I'm very grateful for the efforts of Deputy Chief Bell to, uh, to bring Kathy back. And, back. and most importantly, uh, for Kathy oh, yeah, well, uh, folks, if, uh, if people can go and mute for now, and most importantly, for Kathy herself to, um, to take up the challenge to come back in and help us until our new CAO Blair Dunker arrives and we're able to complete the re recruitment and hiring for the permanent CFO. So with that, I'm gonna invite Kathy to walk the board through the actual numbers of the budget. And I'll have some concluding comments at the end of that. Kathy, over to you and again, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, I, is it, it's okay? Yeah. Okay, we were having a little bit of uh, technical issues here, but I think we're okay now. Um, could, could we move the uh, slide up to the uh, Draft operating budget uh, table, please. I'm not sure who's there. We, that one, perfect. Thank you. So, no, I can't see it. But um, so the the this is in summary. There, the total uh, request that we're asking for is 14 million dollars. 
Um, that is broken down between uh, maintaining the services, which uh, is basically your inflation and contract settlements, which uh, equate to over $11 million. And then 2.8 is attributed to non-compensation items. Uh, and then uh, going down further, the FTE growth, we're, we're assuming no growth this year, and uh, which we removed the 30 officers that we had previously forecasted. Um, new services, um, uh, 5.2 million of funding is allocated for the new services. Uh, we continue to be committed to seeking ways to reduce the operating costs while maintaining those core objectives. The 22, uh, 2022 budget includes 5.1 million of efficiencies, bringing the total efficiencies uh, since 2012 to 25.1 million, including what we plan for 2022. Um, there's 600,000 uh, of efficiencies is for the fleet and facilities rationalization, 600K to efficiencies for the outstanding, uh, sorry, the outsourcing of collision reporting, and 2 million in management intervention targets allocated to savings across the organization related to training, travel, equipment purchases, and supplies. 1.9 million allocated uh, other organization alignments and efficiencies. User fees uh, increases in alliance with the board user fee policy ensures that user fees grow at the same pace as the cost. So, when we add that all up, it's $14 million, which we uh, would be funded, 5.2 million of that would be funded through the assessment growth of 1.7%. And the balance of 8.8 .8 million would be uh, funded through a tax increase of 2.86% for the police. If you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, we'll just recap the capital budget. So in total for next year, there's a budget of capital budget for 36 um, million, 35.6 million. That's made up of two portions, the renewal of assets and the strategic initiatives. The renewal of assets would include things like the fleet, uh, the annual replacement of vehicles, uh, IT infrastructure, telecoms, uh, facility lifestyle, uh, sorry, life cycle and uh, life cycle of specialized assets. The strategic initiatives would include uh, Elgin uh, retrofit, uh, IT comms, Queensview and facility initiatives um, and security. So all of that uh, summarizes what we're, we're requesting for 2022. And with that, I'll let the chief have some concluding remarks. Thank you again, Kathy. We again really appreciate you coming in. Last minute. Yeah, just if everyone in that room could go on mute. It's great. So again, thank Kathy for coming in at the last minute to support the organization in this transition period. Uh, Vice Chair Smallwood Board, uh, the 2022 budget process has been the number one priority for the Audible Police Service over the last 12 months. This has been the longest, most intense, and most in-depth budget process to date. Again, I wanna thank CAO Deputy Chief Bell, uh, former CFO Cyril Rogers, uh, the finance team for their efforts to put this budget together. They have been supported literally by every member of the senior leadership team in almost every area of the organization. I also wanna thank the community for their extensive involvement, engagement and input into this budget process. As was reported at the last uh, board meeting, uh, the community consultation was it itself a unique and unprecedented effort to engage all of Ottawans in, in uh, direct input into this budget. Uh, we know the board is continuing its consultation efforts uh, and we'll soon hear from another group of delegations around the budget specifically. And we will continue to support the board in all of those endeavors until the very end of the process. This draft budget demonstrates the Ottawa Police Service's commitment to fiscal accountability the ability to mitigate massive fiscal pressures that we face this year and in the, in the upcoming year, and our di diligence in presenting business cases for needed investments. The 2022 budget will enable the Ottawa Police Service to continue the implementation of its multi-year plan for organizational change. It has been an extremely challenging to balance the desire to flatten the cost curve of the budget while also trying to meet the increasingly diverse and competing demands for police services across the largest geographical municipality in Canada. The 
the Auto Police Service joins the board in its commitment to find that balance while building a truly different and better police service. We look forward to the discussion that will take place today and over the next several weeks. We look forward to participating in the question and answer period that may arise after the delegations. We will do our best to respond within this meeting. Vice Chair Smallwood, if there is any, question, any questions or information requests that we are not able to fully provide now, we commit to providing that in writing to the board by next Monday so that you have a complete set of answers to the questions that you raise or the issues that you explore on behalf of the delegations. So thank you very much. And we'll turn things back over to you, Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Chief. And thank you for your commitment to getting the questions answered. Um, and thank you for your remarks. I also wanted to thank Kathy for filling in, uh, coming back out of retirement to fill in and help out. This is, um, uh, as the Chief has said, been one of the most intense budget deliberations I've ever been part of, that's for certain. Um, so we're now uh, going to hear from those pre-registered to speak today. Uh, a reminder that only those who are registered and were approved to speak will be permitted to address the committee. I'd also like to remind delegates to focus their comments on the budget. Any delegation speaking to topics other than the budget will have their delegation curtailed. When I call your name, you'll be able to turn on your mic and video. Each delegate has up to five minutes to address the committee. The list of delegates on the agenda has been updated since it was first published. The board has also received four written delegations, which have been shared with the committee and board members as they were received. I will now call on the first, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll now call on the first uh, delegate, uh, registered delegate, and that is Nora Antenhoff of Vivic Research. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. So my name is Nora Ottenhoff, and I am here today to ask this board to vote against the proposed 2022 draft budget. On November 5th, the Ottawa Police Association President, Matt Scoff, released a statement in which he claims that Chair Diane Dean's approach to the budget appeases a small group of community members seeking major change in policing. Matt Scoff refers to Chair Dean's tweets where she says the board will refine the draft budget as troubling, but what is actually troubling is the idea that he does not seem to find the value in civilian oversight of the Ottawa Police Service. Is he advocating for absolutely no oversight to police, a completely rogue department that consumes 10% of the city funds? Scoff's questions what expertise this board has to review a police budget, seemingly forgetting that this budget fits into a larger city budget. It does not take an OPS executive to tell you that increasing a $376 million budget by 14 million when public housing receives only 15 million is not an effective use of city funds. The massive police budget actively consumes funding that could be used to improve the living conditions of community members, a practice known as crime prevention. His argument relies heavily on the alleged comments made by the chief an interesting source to quote, given that Chief slowly lifted his suspension for breach of trust and obstruction of justice in January of 2020. Scoff states that upon being confirmed Chief of Police, Chief slowly identified the need to increase the size of the OPS and now refers to those who want to see fewer police as a small group of community members. In response to Scoff's claims, I will be reading from a Toronto Star article titled, Deputy Chief Peter Slowly Slams Bloated Police Budget in which Peter Slowly can be counted among the small group of community members calling for just this. Deputy Chief Peter Slowly passed over for the Toronto's top cop job last year, says blowing up the current police model is the only way to slay the force's 1.8 billion plus budget. Until policing stops being focused and driven on that reactive enforcement model, it will continue to be exponentially costly, Slowly said. And unless radical changes are made, slowly said, he fears for the future. I've never seen policing at this low a point in terms of public trust and legitimacy. I feel there's a crisis in the offing, not just here, but right across North America. Slowly also dared to say what few police leaders will admit publicly, that a thoroughly modernized police service can operate with fewer officers without compromising public safety. 
We run around all over the city in the most unfocused way, reacting to what you call us for, as opposed to trying to understand what's going on and putting our most important resources in the best place, Sully said at a small gathering hosted by the Studio Y Fellowship Program, which is backed by the MARS Discovery District, a local center for innovation. In this article, it is easy to see that Chief Sully is referring to Toronto, and I will acknowledge that the context in Ottawa is different. In Toronto, the police budget might be 1.8 billion, but it occupies 8.7% of the city budget, as compared to 9.5% in Ottawa. There are 388 individuals for every police member in Toronto compared to 400, sorry, 541 in Ottawa. But Slowly himself admits that fewer officers would not compromise public safety. His statement highlights the shortcomings of the cop to pop ratio as an indicator of public safety and as a relevant justification for increased funding. Slowly mentions that trust in policing is eroded as seen in the recent OPS survey, which revealed that distrust of the OPS has gone up by 19% since 2018. I would like to highlight here that this is a misuse of the word percent. Distrust in the OPS increased by 19 percentage points from 10 to 29%. This actually represents a 190% increase in distrust. One is a relative change and one is an absolute change. In the draft budget, one sentence I would like to highlight is, without public trust, the police cannot legitimately exercise their duty nor effectively support community safety and well-being planning. The survey revealed that 59% of the population has moderate or little to no trust in the police, meaning that as it currently stands, the OPS does not support nearly two out of three Ottawa residents. Policing in Ottawa is driven by a reactive model. Officers respond to such a wide array of calls they could not possibly be specialized in all of their responsibilities. Freezing the budget is not the radical request it is made out to be. Chair Deans, please do not cave to the manipulation tactics of Matt Scott. Please keep the budget frozen. You have the authority to strike line items, whether people like it or not. Use that power and freeze the budget. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nora. That was amazing. It was dead on. <laughs> well done. You're, uh, <clears throat> you're, uh, it's good to see you back again because you've certainly been very conscientious and diligent in, uh, in keeping our feet to the fire and we appreciate that. Um, I'm going to look to uh, the board members first, uh, whether Bev or the chair have any questions. I'm not seeing Bev uh, yes, I see the chair has a question. So Diane, I'll uh, turn it over to you. You're on mute, Diane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Nora, for your deputation here today. Um, you suggested that we strike some line items. I wondered if you had any specific uh, suggestions, what line items you think we should be striking from the proposed 2022 budget. Yeah, um, as we've discussed in previous delegations, one we feel strongly about is defunding the um, the line items put towards mental health and allocating that to community services instead. Um, other obvious ones include just things that um, really we don't see as needing to be within a municipal budget, things like dry cleaning, um, lunch vouchers, um, just unnecessary spending um, that, that shouldn't be paid for by taxpayers. Thank you. Those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, now, I don't see any other board members with their hands up. Uh, I'll just check again. I have to scroll through all the faces. Uh, I don't see any board members, so I'll go to the chief. Chief, you had a comment. Thank you, Vice Chair Smallwood. No, I, I withdraw my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so there being no other questions that I can see, I'll, I'll thank Nora again and uh, go on to uh, Samia Ahmed of Vivek Research. If you could uh, turn your camera on. Hi, 
Hi there. I'm just getting Hello. Out. Okay, so hi, my name is Samia and I'm here to talk um, about, I'm here to talk to this board about voting against the proposed draft budget and instead only approving a freeze. And I believe there was a question about which line items which should be striped. So I can answer that. Um, this question was addressed to Nora just before me. So currently $91,600 um, in line item 502395 is allocated to memberships. Um, and we'd like to know memberships to where. Um, and then $60,800 in line item 502650 is slated for miscellaneous rentals, which differs from equipment and vehicles. So we'd also like to know what this includes. And then there is about a million dollars for line item 502899, which is slated for police related services. And we'd like to know what this refers to specifically. And lastly, for line item 505981, um, there's about another billion or another million um, slated for police related supplies. So we'd love to know um, what this refers to. Um, yeah, okay, now I'll start with what I wanted to say today. So I think it's a bold faced lie to say that there are not additional efficiencies that are possible in the budget. It is also inconceivable to increase the funding to police when other city services remain so underfunded and countless community members have called to have police involved in fewer interactions. The board should understand that slow wait times are not a byproduct product of understaffed police services or inadequate funding. Slow response times are what happen when police refuse to cede any of their responsibilities to groups that are better equipped to respond to their calls in the first place. As it currently stands, the policing budget is higher than the libraries, public health, and the transportation budget combined. Trying to frame the OPS as underfunded in any way is insulting to anyone who has looked at the city budget or try to access non-police services. Looking at the budget by line item, like we just did, shows the immense potential for increased efficiencies in terms of public safety outcomes. For now, the board only needs to find an additional 14 million in efficiencies. In 2020, OPS reported receiving 6,000 calls for service for person mental health distress. By their own admission, this data does not include calls related to an alleged crime where mental health distress was a contributing factor. Wouldn't reallocating these calls to a non-police response reduce pressure on police and require less funding? Last year, fewer than 1% of calls were listed as priority one calls. OPS's website shows that priority one calls have average response times of 15 minutes. Other services, like affordable housing, have wait times of up to 10 years. The long police wait times that residents complain about are suggestive that the reasons they're calling about are not police priorities. In comparison, 80% of calls were listed as priority three and four, and 10% were listed as either five, priority five, six, or seven. Wouldn't it make sense then to suggest that these low priority calls could be reallocated to non-police responses? Can someone on this board give me a situation where a priority six or seven call would require an armed individual with an emergency vehicle to respond? The board needs to reallocate all calls deemed low priority to non-police responses. If someone is needed to take a report, unarmed city staff can play this role. Again, no funding is required for this transition. I would like to end this allegation by reading the OPS's description of policing included in the intro section of their budget. The traditional model of policing has reached a tipping point resulting from a confluence of factors including overstretched, overburdened, under-supported police service members, systemic discrimination, particularly anti-Black and anti-Indigenous, workplace sexual violence and harassment, charter and human rights breaches, inadequate social safety net, inappropriate supports for mental health, addictions, housing, et cetera. I couldn't have said it better myself, but adding $14 million to this force is in no way moving away 
from the traditional model of policing that the report so aptly described. It's enabling the OPS to continue without any consequences or accountability for the dangers they present in this community. Please vote no on this proposed draft budget. Thank you, uh, Samia. That was uh, perfectly timed as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are, I think your presentation was pretty clear and you raised some questions that we as a board can look into. Uh, we may already have some of the answers, but it's certainly something that we can pay attention to. We, uh, but I see uh, Member Sueda has uh, a question for you. So I'll turn it over to Member Sueda now. Uh, thank you, Chair Smallwood, and uh, thank you, uh, Samia, for your delegation. Uh, just a question. Uh, you mentioned that um, uh, the mental health response is probably best done by uh, uh, another group other than the OPS. Um, and I know on several occasions the chief has, uh, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the chief has acknowledged that he's looking for partners for, uh, for, for a community group to take over or to at least help transition that mental health response to these other groups. Do you know of any community groups that are willing and able to start taking on that mental health response? Thank you for your question. So I think this was addressed in um, the last board meeting and what we're asking for is no police involvement. Nobody wants to be partnered with the police. There are services that exist but the point is that police cause harm and we don't want them there. So that's that's the root of, of this, of what I'm trying to say is that we police are not helpful. They're not doing good things. Like we don't want them there. I feel like that's a little bit lost. And I want to make that clear is that we're talking about zero police involvement, no police at the table. Okay, so if that's the, if that's the case, is there a group right now that can take that responsibility over? So that the police, because currently it's falling in the police's lap, and um, and arguments can be made on both sides. But I'm just curious: is there a group that you're aware of that can take over that? Um, there's a lot of groups currently on currently that I know of, um, such as Ottawa Street Medics, who who take on some of this responsibility. But of course, they are underfunded, they are understaffed, and there's and they just don't have the resources to, to do this work like on a, um, on a bigger scale. So if they had adequate funding, then they would be able to do a better job. Okay, so do you know like how much funding they would need to take on that responsibility? Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but Vivek Research did write a report um, that we presented also multiple times in the board meetings where we have broken down the costing and we've outlined all the resources that um, a group like this may need. So I can, I, like I can share that, I can share the link with you again, uh, we, but we have presented it multiple times and we do have the costing done. So if you were interested, yeah, we can get that to you. Yeah, I definitely remember reading something about that in one of the reports uh, that was sent. But yeah, if you can share that again, that'd be uh, much appreciated. And do you know if these groups, any group would be available to take on the response for mental health immediately? Because there's always going to be a transition period. Um, I given the, given the funding, sorry to interrupt you, given the funding, can they take on the responsibility immediately? I'm not in a position to speak about anybody else. But I'm sure like many people, there's loads of groups that are available to do this. And but there's always um, I feel like there's always strings attached when you work with the police. So the city needs the money needs to come from an independent like the city and not the police in order for a group to to be confident that there's going to be no police at the table. Hey, thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Sueda. Uh, I'm going to go to Member Nerman because you had your hand up before and then it went down, then it came up again. So I'll assume you're next in line. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Smallwood. Uh, uh, just, a, just a clarification. Uh, first of all, Samia, thank you for coming and uh, giving the heads up. Uh, I, I believe uh, you are aware of that uh, the four, out of the 14 million, uh, what I understand, 2.54% that is about 11 million is a contractual obligation towards the collective agreements. I, I, 
I am sure you're aware of that, right? Okay. Well, I wasn't, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I wasn't able to find any copies of the collective agreement online. Um, so if that could be made public, that would be really good as well. I believe it has been posted on our website. Uh, and uh, Chair Dean or Krista can clarify that, but that is available mm -hmm. on our website. Can you send me the link and I'll send you the link to the report that, um, that we were talking about before? Yeah, I will request Hannah to do that. Now, uh, second thing, uh, 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 Chia Smallwood, if I'm correct, and the discussions we are going through, uh, which Member Sweta, building on Member Sweta's uh, question about the mental health and the alternate provisions, uh, an immediate need. Now, for instance, hypothetically, uh, the board decides to reduce the budget. So how the how the funding the funds will go into these do we have the direction or the power to appoint any agency uh, any mental health agency to alternate to the police services or that this money will go back to the council and that the council will decide that's where correct. the money will go that's correct uh, if we don't take the money we get we put a request into the city for the budget. The city approves it and gives us that money. Any money we don't take would be up to the city. I believe the chair is, is has been working on to see if we could provide some um, possibility that we could give a suggestion as to where the money should go, but we cannot, as you've said, we cannot direct where it would go. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next person is uh, member uh, Johnson. Your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for your delegation, Samia. Um, I just want to um, get a little bit more information on your comment that no one wants to partner with the police. Um, I, it just concerns me. And um, my understanding, unless there's been a change, is that there's been a mental health uh, crisis team working with officers from the Ottawa police for over 20 years. Now, perhaps there's been a change in that program in the last year, I'm not sure, um, but certainly that is one group of mental health professionals from the Royal Ottawa who do work and have worked for many years with the police. And I guess, so, so that's just one comment. My question to you is why uh, don't groups want to work with the police? And I'd like to actually, after you comment, hope uh, she slowly can comment to this as well. Thank you for your question. Um, so I believe you're talking about the mental health unit that's part of the police department. But again, um, uh, I think I mentioned a few times already, but the presence of police causes harm. Uniforms and guns and vehicles like that just aren't like it, it's a trauma response for a lot of people. And it's not like, I, I, I feel like if you would read the report that we worked on um, uh, and that I've mentioned many times, it would, it would answer some of your questions because at this point, I feel like we come every month and we tell you what we want and what we're asking for. And there's not really, like you just forget it before the next meeting. Um, so yeah, and I, I don't really appreciate like being put on the spot and like being asked all these questions when really they're answered in our report. Um, and I can't, I can't speak for other groups and I can't speak for right. others. Okay, and, and yes, okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, that wasn't the point. And maybe I just, your comment that groups don't wanna work with the police, just, just you know, um, maybe some groups don't want to, but I don't think every group doesn't wanna speak work with the police. And may I hear uh, Chief Slowly's comments now to uh, groups partnering to the police if he has any uh, comments on that? Thank you. I'd like to jump in really quickly. So what I meant um, by- Maybe I've just turned over to the Chief, so I'll let him speak next if you don't mind and you can comment afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, through Vice Chair Smallwood, uh, Member Johnson, thank you for your question. I, I will call on uh, Acting Deputy Chief Dunlop in a second because my list will be far from complete, but you did ref reference the Royal Hospital. It's a huge partner for us on a number of levels. In fact, I've had several phone calls with the CEO and 
graciously on her behalf, uh, the, their full executive on a range of ongoing partnerships that we have and new ways for us to work together. Um, as this board knows, Deputy Chief Bell uh, helped to convene a group of other healthcare providers uh, to create a guiding council around which a mental health response strategy could be developed uh, through the very important and timely intervention of Chair Deans herself and through the support of city officials. We were able to move that initial effort led by Deputy Chief Bell around a mental health strategy that specifically aligns with the Vivid Research Report um, that is now under the guidance of the now approved City of Ottawa Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Uh, we have long-standing partnerships with many social service providers, not-for-profit agencies, um, the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, I will invite uh, Acting Deputy Chief Jamie Dunlop, who, who presides over the vast majority of those uh, partnerships, to give another range of, of other partnerships that we currently have uh, with the community. Uh, while I do accept um, the delegation's premise that there are a number of community groups who currently do not want to work with the Ottawa Police Service for very legitimate reasons that we are going to have to address through ongoing trust building exercises. The vast majority of our social providers, social service providers and not for profit sector agencies are working in coordination and cooperation and in some cases, very strong long-standing partnerships with the Auto Police Service for which we are extremely grateful for. Uh, Jamie, if you're able to provide any additional information to Member Johnson's question, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Uh, you know, keep trying to trying to keep it directly on track on just the mental health piece because uh, we have so many different connections. If you just take a look at Centertown, for example, right now, and some issues in and around uh, in Chinatown and what have you, our members working directly with the different programs and community-based groups there, uh, where they take the lead, or, and we are there as in a support role. Uh, that's helping with. Uh, homelessness issues and addictions issues, both on Dundonald Park and down through that street, of working with those uh, the street paramedics as well, as, as mentioned, which is a volunteer group doing wonderful work. Um, we, we engage in that piece all the time. Our, our community police officer works with the local counselor uh, to, fear, to, to work with directly with them, particularly when you're talking about social issues, not criminal issues, in terms of how can we connect better with you, what do you need from us or from our teams, and how do we support the role you're trying to do to support those individuals. Uh, down, <coughs> excuse me, down in the market as well, with inner city health. Um, we try our best to support the work being done by our shelters, working with the leadership team now down there to, uh, to uh, deliver social services, if you will, in a broad, broad, broad spectrum pattern using all the different social services and the city services that are available um, to begin to support these uh, individuals or society that are suffering from addictions or mental health or whatever other supports they may need. There's also uh, working with the unsheltered uh, task force for those who find themselves without homes, maybe in encampments. Um, that is something the police is involved in as an active partner, um, but involving uh, the expertise that we need for people from the shelters, addiction counseling, mental health counseling, cultural uh, awareness, whatever is required, uh, work with those individuals that find themselves in those camps and the police are there um, as support, as required, as requested by those professionals that are doing that, that role. Um, it, it, it is a long list of community partners that recognize and we try to work with. And most importantly, I think that the change that I've seen over the last couple of years um, with police and with these boards is us, us taking an active role and stepping back, if you will, and being a partner at the table and not leading the table and turning to the expertise um, that we, is actually required to help those individuals and us providing that supportive role as requested by them. Um, so if I could also maybe address, when we talk about civilianization, uh, you mentioned about the different level of priority calls uh, that we take. Um, just a little correction there. Um, the priority calls for 15% is not accurate for a priority one. Uh, the goal is uh, under 15 minutes, 90% of the time, the reality is our response is uh, average under seven minutes, um, not 15 minutes. And as well, when you look at those other priorities, the reasons those are set up is we begin to determine what does require an armed police officer. So, so many of those lower priority calls actually don't go to, to mobile response. Uh, we have civilians actually that respond to a lot of those calls and some of them are actually farmed up to community groups. So such as, uh, you know, if you have someone just simply, there's no crime in progress, there's no injuries, things of that nature. Um, it might be followed up through a telephone call reporting through a civilian on our end or even online reporting. Um, and this, and if necessary, followed up by investigators. When you begin looking at priority six, seven, that actually could be some social agencies that we actually engage to respond instead of us. Um, but it also could be um, things such as property pickup, stolen bike, 
uh, that's located, found, our property room will go around, pick those things up. So they're not necessarily, you can't look at the different priorities and assume that police attend to all those. We actually can't. Uh, we just simply don't have the time or the resources to do so, which is why we tend to limit where our patrol officers and response officers go in terms of those priorities. Um, we had to divert those to online and telephone reporting a few years ago, uh, simply because of the workload was no longer possible. They end up waiting for days in order to get a police officer to respond. So we uh, altered our our, uh, our our delivery model a few years ago to actually address the fact that we didn't have enough officers to respond to all those different priorities, and we use different means to do so. I hope that answers those questions. It, it does. Thank you so much. Um, and that really... I think paints the picture of the complexity of the response needed by the community in Ottawa. There's all sorts of calls with all types of responses needed in a very challenging time that we're in during the pandemic. So, um, yeah, so, so, but I do think we need to move the needle on this and I think we're working hard to do that. And I also think that the trust issue is really important. And I, I know you spoke to that, Sammy, very well. Um, so I do think that's very important. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Because I did move from you to Chief, so I just want to make sure I didn't cut you off. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to clarify about community groups. So we're talking about groups that are rooted in community. Those are the groups that don't want to work with police. Okay, um, thank you for that. Thank you. Also, I want to quickly address um, the what the OPS staff just told us that a lot of the a lot of the calls are responded by community groups. So I'd like to know why is the police being funded if they're not doing the work? And I'd also like to know um, why why it's so difficult to make this like why it's so difficult to make the change. And like you've already mentioned, that the police isn't the right aren't the right people to respond to a lot of the calls. So I think it's just, I think we're, we're talking about the same thing. Like we, we can move away, we can take that money, reallocate it. It just seems um, pretty straightforward. And also in my delegation, I did say that I'd like the board members to answer these questions and not OPS staff, because they're the ones who represent us, the community. Okay. So thank you. I'm gonna turn back to the chair now. Um, because okay. my Excuse understanding me. is that, um, you know, we're asking the questions here. So I'll turn back to him just as a... Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I just wanted to mention to you, you asked about the the uh, uh, arbitration award. It was posted on the uh, website today. It just posted today. And the address is ottawapoliceboard.ca. So it's up now. Um, so with that, I'll go to uh, Chair Deans. Uh, I think you're the next one. Member Small, Smallwood, uh, I'm in your hands on this. Uh, this particular uh, delegation um, asked for some specifics in terms of um, uh, areas like memberships, miscellaneous rentals, police related services and police related supplies and what those were. So I would like to hear the answer to that question. I don't know if you want me to hold that question until after delegations or yeah. because it's arising out of this delegation if we should ask it now. I think it'd be good if we could hold it because we're going to have a lot of questions about line by line on the budget. So if we could okay. hold it to then, I think that'd be good. We have uh, several other de delegations that want to hear. And, and I also wanted to say to Samia that uh, your delegation, your previous delegations did not go unheard. I, I attended several presentations by Whitebird Clinic uh, to hear, uh, and that is something that you and others had raised and, uh, and, and I did. So uh, it wasn't that your previous delegations weren't there. They absolutely were. And we do appreciate your coming and taking the time to speak to us because it does help. Uh, and sometimes these answers take a while to get, but we are working on getting them. So thank you once again very much for coming. Um, I'm going to move on. The next person on the list is Robin Brown, but I'm not sure if Robin has signed on yet or not. I'm not seeing Robin Brown appear. Uh, no, I still don't see Robin Brown. So um, I'll move on. The next person on the agenda is uh, Marie Evelyn from Volunteer Ottawa. Hello, 
Hello. Hi. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to make a brief presentation before the Police Services Board Finance and Audit Committee with regard to the 2022 Ottawa Police Budget. My name is Marie Eveline and I'm Executive Director of Volunteer Ottawa. And specifically, Volunteer Ottawa would like to address the issue of fees for criminal record checks for volunteers. Volunteer Ottawa is a membership-based, not-for-profit Canadian charity. For almost 65 years, we have been a leader in helping people make a meaningful difference in our community by linking organizations, seeking volunteers, and individuals looking for opportunities to give back to our community. We support over 250 not-for-profit organizations, post almost 35,000 volunteer op opportunities annually, and have over 7,000 individuals in our volunteer, volunteer pool. Over the past year and a half, Volunteer Ottawa pivoted our services to address needs unique to the pandemic. In addition to our regular volunteer opportunities, we offered COVID-specific support for over 4,000 volunteers signing up to help with COVID-related activities. Many of these volunteers were new. As you are aware, Volunteer Ottawa strongly objected to the implementation of fees for volunteers when they were approved in the fall of 2019. With the pandemic and its impact on volunteering, BO requested that during the pandemic, the fees be waived for volunteers to get their background checks, citing the need to pull together as a community to ensure that the needs of all were met and that volunteers could assist where required. Although the request was initially denied, in October 2020, the board approved a motion to waive fees for background checks for volunteers until the pandemic is deemed over. BO applauded that decision. However, we do not support the final component of the motion, which states that these fees will be reinstated once the City of Ottawa enters into phase three of Ontario's action plan for reopening. 2022 will be a very difficult year for many not-for-profit organizations as they struggle to financially recover from the pandemic and reintegrate volunteers back into their program delivery models. Resources will be tight and they will be relying more and more on volunteers to fill the gap between increasing demand for services and stagnant or reduced funding. Anything that serves as a barrier to pandemic program recovery, such as fees for background checks, should not be reinstituted. In recognizing the importance of volunteering in our community, on October 7th, 2021, the Ontario government introduced legislation requiring police services to conduct and provide the results of criminal record checks and criminal record and judicial matters checks for volunteers at no charge and provide up to five free copies of the results if requested at the time of the initial request. BO supports this legislation, but it is, does not go far enough. It does not include vulnerable record checks, which comprise the majority of requested background checks. We are requesting that as we move out of the pandemic, the Ottawa Police Services Board demonstrate further leadership in extending the moratorium on fees for background checks for volunteers indefinitely including fees for vulnerable record checks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marie. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Is, is there anybody who would like to ask a question before I move on to the next one? Uh, no, I don't see so. I wanna thank you uh, very much once again for coming and uh, you, obviously your message was clear. And um, uh, thank you for your presentation today. You're welcome. Uh, the uh, next uh, speaker will be Councillor Riley Brockington. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to you and to your committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the committee today and um, uh, certainly have attended past finance and audit committee meetings uh, over time. Um, I have followed the police services budget uh, over many years with interest and certainly am interested on behalf of River Ward residents and taxpayers to see the budget evolve over time. I do think it needs to be reflective of the, the needs of our society and needs of our modern day society, which continues to evolve and continues to have high expectations 
for the police services budget. I do want to thank all sworn and civilian members who serve in the Ottawa Police Service, including uh, the people who serve on the Ottawa Police Services Board. You do have a, a challenging job and I appreciate your service. I mean that sincerely. Um, I don't have prepared notes, but I do want to focus on three issues. First, last year I voted against the budget because I did not feel it made sufficient progress to evolve the service and service de delivery that the public is demanding. Let me just say that um, there are many groups, volunteer groups, who have invested a significant amount of time uh, coming out to your meetings and providing input, and they do represent segments of our society. I do acknowledge that. Um, however, there is a strong difference of opinion in society about where we would like to see the police services go. And so your job is to balance everything that you hear before you and with all of your other contacts and make decisions that you think are in the best interests of us. And I know, I know you know that, but it has to be said. But the voices that you hear constantly cannot be ignored. They are making some legitimate points and you have to find a way to address those points. And so my first main issue of three is, is that transition, that evolution of our service, where we talk about the potential for some service provision to go to third parties, parties that have expertise, whether it be mental health, community or social services. This is absolutely the, the way we need to go. There will always be demand for policing, sworn police officers, but really uh, to have that, that bundled approach where you can have a police officer and or a community subject matter specialist or expert to accompany calls or, or be dispatched alone is definitely the direction we need to go. And there is a plan, but I think where the OPS struggles is you're struggling articulating this plan publicly. You have to do a much better job um, publicly sharing and talking about the chiefs and your plan going forward about how you're going to get there, because I don't think you're successful in that front. You have to do a much better articulation of that evolution, both in 2022, but in years forward. That's my first main point. Second is the NRTs, the neighborhood response teams. Certainly uh, appreciated our chief making this a priority. When he came to Ottawa, there was a huge gap here. And we know the benefits of on the ground within community uh, policing and, and building those synergies and collaborations and partnerships with the community. I still think there's room to, to grow here. I, I still think there are um, some shortcomings in this program where there needs to be a better, again, communication, articulation of what those annual objectives are in various communities. At the end of the year, did the NRTs make, make their objectives? How can we have continuous uh, conversations with counselors and community leaders with the NRTs? So I'm very appreciative of the investment in NRTs, but I think there needs to be improvement in the items I've just mentioned. And finally, the number one safety issue in my ward, I hear about it uh, all the time. It was the number one safety issue when I first door knocked and it continues to be the number one safety issue and that is speeding in our city. We have a speeding epidemic in Ottawa, in every neighborhood, on and every type of street. And uh, the police certainly are not the um, uh, silver bullet solution to this problem. They are one ingredient to the overall recipe where you have to look at a whole bunch of other factors, city investment, road engineering, re-engineering education, but we need more police and uh, or more focus from the police. This can't be just ad hoc project noisemaker where they go out uh, certain times of the week. This has to be a sustained ongoing focus with daily results across the city for speeding. And I don't know if there needs to be greater partnerships with the city on you know, triage streets or others, but, uh, and I know you're out there. I know the police is out there, but um, I heard all summer 
not enough, not enough, not enough. Very legitimate concerns in our residential communities about speed. And what I'm looking for is an investment on sustained units, not the patrol units. You just do traffic issues nonstop, and it has to be much larger units than what you have now. That is the number one issue. Thanks. So, Thank you very much, Councillor. That's uh, we're a bit over five minutes now, so I'll turn it to, uh, first of all, board members. Uh, I see uh, Member Sueda, you, would, uh, you have a comment or question? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Smallwood, and thank you, Councillor, for your for your delegation. Um, I have a question, uh, and it's kind of you, you touched on something earlier with regards to possibly the police or the police board maybe not articulating uh, what has to be done, and um, and this came up in previous uh, board meetings where some delegates were suggesting that we have something like a mobile crisis unit, and. Uh, uh, to respond in particular to mental health. Now, we know, and as I think it's been talked about quite a bit, that uh, if we remove funding from the police uh, to um, for whatever reasons, and that money to be allocated towards a mobile crisis unit. Um, and as you know, uh, as a city councillor, um, that we can't as a board direct where those funds go. So I guess the question I have for you as a city councillor is have you brought up motions at the city to kind of introduce a mobile crisis unit? And this can kind of bridge the gap between where, because I think the chief has said on many occasions that he wants to kind of transition the mental health response, but we can't do it through, through what we have right now. So have any motions been introduced by yourself or anybody at city council to help bridge that gap? Certainly not by me and, and not by council as a whole. I do think that we have sufficient partners in Ottawa that can take that work on. And I'm not the expert. Uh, I think there, yes, there might be some reluctance from some to partner with the police. But um, if this is an organization's subject matter expertise and they exist because they want to help address problems in our community, they'll take funding that can be made available. And by refining what the mandate and scope is, I'm convinced that can be done. But we just have to get all the parties in the same room and hammer out what that would look like, right? It's kind of like driving a standard car. We've got to take our foot off clutch and, and go to the accelerator and, and be a seamless transition. So no is the short answer, but I'm, I'm convinced it can be done and we have the expertise in Ottawa to do it. Yeah, because I'm just concerned that, you know, right now the police budget uh, makes up about 10% of the city budget. So there seems to be a lot more money within the city itself. And, uh, and I've heard on occasions, um, you know, members of the city council and, and different delegates talk about it. And I'm just wondering why it hasn't come forward uh, at city council. Uh, I can't speak for council. We were certainly eagerly awaiting a new police chief. We have the right person in the job now, and I, I do believe he's he's steering the, the service in the right direction. But in my opinion, it, we need to go further, faster. And um, I look to Chair Deans and others to, uh, you know, put heads together with community and protective services as well. And, and get us moving in, the, in that direction. So um, I don't have every answer now, but I do believe it is very possible. And from my residents who support the police but wanna see significant change, this is the change that they wanna see. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, Chair uh, Smallwood, if I have one more question, I just wanna uh, direct to the Chief. Certainly. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Brockton didn't raise the point about uh, traffic, and I know this has been a big issue among a lot of city councillors about uh, speeding and, and whatnot. Um, is there any reason why we can't go ahead and put more traffic light cameras or speed cameras around the city? Is there any reason why uh, you don't want to do that or you do want to do that? Can you, if you can just speak to that, please. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Smallwood, through you to, to Member Sueda. Thank you. Um, uh, Member Sueda for your question. It's actually been raised a couple of times over the over board meetings since my time here. I believe Member Meehan might have actually had an official inquiry which we provided a response to. Um, but I'll be, be very clear. I am absolutely in support of 
uh, an extension, uh, a significant investment and extension of the use of, of automated red light cameras, speed enforcement technology, and other types of similar technology. Uh, Councillor Brockington is among 100% of his peers who have put traffic enforcement and traffic safety, if not number one, at least in the top three of their constituents' concerns. Uh, and that is consistent literally across every jurisdiction in Canada. Ottawa is not unique in that whatsoever. Um, in fact, this position aligns with the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police resolution put forward this year by Waterloo Region Police Chief Brian Larkin. Uh, I don't have the exact translation in front of me, but I can provide that to the board for its consideration. But I'll paraphrase it as every jurisdiction in, in Ontario should consider a significant expansion of the use of these automated technology um, traffic uh, safety devices. What's important there uh, is not so much the use of these devices because they exist here in Ottawa and they can be scaled. They produce revenue, which can cover all of the costs of, of the operation of them. And they produce then a net profit, I'm gonna put that in air quotes, for the municipality. What was important in the Ottawa Ontario Association Chiefs of Police resolution was that the second part said, after paying for the system expansion itself and its ongoing operation, any additional funds can and should be considered by the municipality for investment in its community safety and well-being plan that can fund the six priorities of the plan that was just approved by the city of Ottawa. Homelessness, poverty reduction, housing, system navigation, anti-racism. We have the ability to address two major problems in the city. We can invest in an expanded automated program for traffic safety and we can take beyond the operating costs of that, fund the community safety well-being plan for its effective implementation. None of that needs to come to the police service, by the way. Not one dollar, not one cent of that needs to come to the police service. So thank you for your question. I'd be happy to expand on that at a future public meeting, but I would support that 100%. Uh, just one one quick question, maybe. Um, is it do you, whose responsibility is it to implement these red light cameras or speed cameras? Is it the OPS? Uh, I believe that would have to come through council, but I will defer to Jamie Dunlop to see if he has any direct feedback on that. Yeah, that, that is correct. It's uh, speed cameras are not uh, not uh, under the Ottawa Police Direct Control. It comes from city council funding them and placing them out. Oh, okay. So that so chief, I guess you don't have okay. So that means that the city would have to put it forward. I thought, I'm sorry, I thought it was uh, under the police, uh, under the OPS jurisdiction. We would support it fully, but it would be up to the city to make that decision and then get the approvals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Member Sueda. Um, Mr. Chair, could I just add something about cameras? Certainly. Certainly. Thank you. Um, the Transportation Committee recently dealt with this issue. We have um, a number of red light cameras that are all in school districts currently. And um, the report came back to Council recommending an expansion of that program, but staying within the jurisdiction of uh, school districts. And the reason, by and large, that um, that, uh, that decision was recommended or that approach was recommended um, by the city staff is because there is a broader sense in the community that, um, you know, everybody that gets caught gets a ticket um, in, in an area. And there are a number of streets in the city of Ottawa that are improperly posted in terms of their speed limits. And it is seen as somewhat of a cash grab. If we have artificially reduced the um, speed limit on a road, take for example, Hunt Club Road, where we've artificially reduced the speed. The, the road was built to carry traffic at 80 kilometers an hour. We're, we reduced, council reduced the speed to 60 kilometers an hour. If we put a red light camera in there, it's seen as a major cash grab. Um, um, and people don't appreciate that approach. So that was sort of the reason that the city staff feel that we should be very trepidatious in our approach to rolling these out in a broader context. Having said that, as a um, member of the Transportation Committee, I presented a motion to the committee to, on 
a pilot basis as a city to um, look for opportunities, perhaps the most egregious um, um, speeding areas in the city. We have roads that are well-known um, raceways where cars are out there racing at night in a very dangerous manner. I think those would be very suitable for uh, an expansion of the program. And so there is an intention now, the city staff are going to recommend, I believe, I, I don't have the motion in front of me, but I believe it will be for 2023, uh, four new locations that we will test out um, how it would go to put them in areas that aren't just associated with school zones. Uh, so that um, um, some people see it as the tip of the iceberg and it may be something that we roll out um, across the city and uh, we may hear a lot of negative feedback and decide not to move in that direction. But um, to Councillor Brockington's uh, point, speeding is a huge issue. Um, red light cameras are a very efficient way to slow down traffic because uh, uh, they, they produce a lot of tickets and the, the ones that we have in school zones have produced a lot of cash and revenue that goes back into um, opportunities to re, um, rebuild roads and re-engineer roads more in keeping with lower speed limits. So uh, that money all goes back into that program. So I, I think there is an opportunity. I don't know what the public tolerance is, however, for um, rolling them out in a much more broader context. And so we're going to dip our toe into that water and see where it takes us in the in the uh, years ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerry. Uh, Chief Slowly. Thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chair. Um, just on the traffic theme, and again, there's sometimes a, a misunderstanding of the amount of resources that are available um, in the city on any particular issue, but traffic being almost universally the number one community-based issue. I think it's relevant to provide some additional insights here. And again, I'll rely on uh, Acting Deputy Dunlop if I get any of these stats right. Currently, our traffic unit is, is staffed to have 33 officers in there. Because of our inability to do our hiring last year, we were, they're now currently at 20 of the 33 positions that are filled. They, those 20 members have to cover off two shifts, days and afternoons, and includes the weekends. So at any given time, the maximum number of people of those 20 officers that's available for policing, traffic policing, which Councillor Brockington specifically asked, not the general police service, trafficking, at any given time on those two shift rotations, there's only a, a maximum amount of 10 officers. That does not include those officers need to have uh, days off, vacation, uh, when they're sick with the flu or anything else. So we're looking really at a number between seven, eight across Canada's largest geographical municipality. So when we had literally every one of the ward councillors and the vast majority of their constituents saying, I want proactive, customized traffic enforcement for dedicated traffic officers, just understand that the actual number at any given time for that is around seven to eight 10 at the maximum until we can restaff those positions. If we are able to complete the 28 FTEs that are still approved for hiring this year, Chair Deans, a percentage of those hires will go to getting our uh, traffic unit staffed up to as close to 100% as possible. The remaining areas will go to our guns and gangs unit and our violence against women units, uh, sexual assault, um, partner assault and human trafficking. But that is a number one concern we have a 60% staffed unit that simply cannot keep up with the demand for all the councillors and all the ward constituents across the city. Thank you, Chief. Um, before I go to the next participant, uh, I just wanted to, if I could ask participants other than the panelists to refrain from putting their hands up, only registered delegates will be called upon to speak. Thank you. Uh, I see Jamie Dunlop. I'm sorry, I missed your hand. Yes, thank you. And uh, the chief is dead on in his stats there. But I also wanted to add just to give uh, you a, a clear uh, thing on the pressures on the traffic unit. They're also, of course, where we have the demonstrations that we have. Uh, they are specialized in ro the rolling roadblocks. You have to move to, in order to maintain the safety of those demonstrators. Traffic unit is required for that often, um, as well as uh, many other duties they have in the city, including escorts, things like that. So that's, that's all the different things that that singular traffic unit does. 
but we all uh, also saw that uh, an increase in those, those uh, uh, stunt driving. Um, well documented the paper was almost have a, roughly about a 60% increase in the stunt driving we've seen and also the seizure of cars. Um, so it's, it's been a very busy uh, couple of years uh, with the traffic unit as it is. Mr. Chairman, bef before I go, can I just make one quick request? I know you've got a full agenda. Yes, please. Because speed enforcement cameras can only be used by provincial order in school zones and safety zones, we are restricted. Municipalities in Ontario are restricted where they can be used, not on Heron, not on Baseline, not on Hunt Club, uh, not on Carling Avenue. They're not school zones. That if the police services board uh, felt so inclined to write a letter to uh, Minister Mulrooney and ask her to uncuff municipalities in where they can use this technology and allow us in consultation with our communities on where to put it, we will have a much greater ability to address speeding in our city, not just school zones and safety zones, which are very important, certainly top of my list, but we need much greater flexibility going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I, I did want to, I was going to make the comment that I've attended uh, dozens and dozens of meetings with city councillors, and that has been virtually the number one issue with almost every single one of them was speeding. So I think it would make sense that as a board, I'm not sure how much effect it would have, but I certainly I would be prepared to support that we write a letter to encourage the use of, of radar, photo radar and red light cameras to, uh, because it is such a big issue. So thank you very much. Thank you for attending, Councillor. And uh, I'll move on to the next delegation now, which is Farnaz Farhang. And um, uh, I would ask if, uh, they're there if they can join us now. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, you have five minutes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm gonna obviously keep my comments to this proposed budget today, starting with the fact that despite the board's direction for a budget freeze, the OPS have clearly misunderstood their assignment and are asking for even more money than last year, most of which only goes to salaries and compensation. A counselor wrote a letter citing the need for more people to be able to answer 911 calls. Yet the same counselor never does anything to advocate for more money for Ottawa Public Health to fund paramedics or ambulances. And I know that the city plans to hire 14 new paramedics and buy 12 new ambulances for 2022, but unlike the projected numbers of the hypothetical cops that you need for a growing population based on no evidence as to how increasing cops per population growth is going to actually increase safety and well-being, we do have city stats that show that the paramedics reached level zero 400 times in 2020 and 550 times in 2019 meaning there were literally no paramedic crews available if someone in the city needed a medic or to be transported to a hospital or to respond to calls. And when people call 911 with life-threatening emergencies, it's paramedics that are going to be of use. So the more cops to provide emergency care argument either comes from a willfully ignorant place that you don't understand what police were created to do and their inability to meet that need or an intentional attempt to override the concerns of those most harmed by the police while still leaving people with no care. And if the goal is to detask the police and create capacity for care, then it makes sense to actually spend money to expand those services instead. There are a bunch of forecasted numbers in the budget report, including projected costs for the future budgets. 15.1 million for 2023, 16.3 million for 2024, and 14.3 million for 2025. And it's being justified under this framing of letting the chief of police fulfill his modernization vision. But after 2024, he does not plan on being the chief of police anymore. So I don't think that it can be a justification for the continued calls for expanding the OPS, particularly amidst calls for defunding, detasking, detasking and alternatives 
um, as a means to addressing safety and well-being concerns. These are deliberate future plans that are being made to expand what we are highlighting as harmful. The board has acknowledged the need to address systemic issues within the OPS. Systemic means a culture of hypermasculinity, power imbalances, with a side of a savior hero complex that isn't healthy for the community or even the police themselves. And I don't know what the vague 5.1 million in the proposed budget means for an OPS culture change, but it won't work. We see how quickly the misogyny and resistance comes out against the chair of this board with the slightest indication that you're just looking at making changes. Imagine how vulnerable community members with no power feel. At previous meetings, it has been framed that provincially, uh, the provincially mandated community safety and well being plan is a way for the community to participate in the business of policing. The safety and well being of people should never be treated as a commodity or a political talking point. It's the livelihood and quality of life of people, attributing economic value to people's basic needs, like housing, for example, is kind of violent. But I've heard residents raise concerns about their taxes, um, and they always raise concerns about footing the bill of services. And unfortunately, the first place they seem to target is social and care supports. Um, and, uh, but we always seem to find money to mobilize violent enforcement against the same people who would need to access those social and care supports. The NRTs shared with pride that they were going to be targeting encampments. I've heard counselors on this board refer to unhoused people in the byword market as the elephant in the room in need of hiding or displacement in the context of a conversation about tourism and the beautification of the city. You do land acknowledgements every meeting and I'd like to, you to reflect about how the entitlement to think you know what's best in terms of controlling what spaces and land looks like and how it should be used in profit seeking ways is a continuation of colonial violence. A number of pri priorities keep being listed and they're also in the community safety and well-being uh, report. Food security, housing, health supports, harm, re harm reduction, uh, transportation, and now severely underfunded respite centers that are carrying the brunt of a variety of crises. And this board has continuously badgered some delegates like uh, member Swida and member Johnson did today who call for um, alternatives and you ask for the details for ready-made solutions. And you do it with this sense of fake urgency because you're barely advocating for the other solutions that you already agree on. And I kind of find that the fake urgency is used to shut down these conversations. If you- the board, Can you wrap it up now? Or, Your time's up, so can you wrap it up? <laughs> um, if you, the board and council in general are serious about listening, learning and change, Start with funding the priorities you already understand and agree on and no more window dressing and no more money to cops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farnes. And thank you once again for, for taking the time to come and speak to us. Uh, are there any questions that uh, anybody has that they would like to ask of the delegate? Comments? No? Okay, so thank you very much, Farnes. And I'll now go to uh, Councillor Sean Menard. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chair, and, and hello uh, to the Chief, uh, Deputy Chiefs and uh, Committee uh, Board members. I, I appreciate the time to speak to you today. Um, you have a very uh, difficult but uh, important job in front of you, and I, I would argue it, it's likely, you know, really a crescendo um, in the conversations that have been happening in this city uh, for a couple of years now, and really a, could be a powerful turning point uh, in the way you respond to a lot of the, the calls for change and to establish a hope for, for some people that do feel, feel hopeless. So I, I did want to start off with a bit of a challenge function for the committee by presenting some information to you. Um, we, we have heard that OPS has a um, lower than average officers per capita uh, than the rest of Canada. 
And uh, I did some digging and, and wanted to present some of those findings because I think it requires a closer look. Um, the stats do show um, if you're looking at an, at an average, we are lower. Um, it changes if you're looking at um, uh, medians. And there are other circumstances as well. Um, we have a much lower police reported cr uh, crime rate, um, far below the Canadian and Ontario averages. Um, we also have very large federal government presence, as you know, and RCMP policed areas in Ottawa. So there, there are some distinctions and differences right off the bat compared to some of the other cities um, and, and crime rate is a, is a major factor. Um, we've also heard that any freeze uh, would result in uh, job losses, which the budget report assessed based on the total value of the reduction as an equivalent assumption for a reduction in FTE. So for example, um, the assumption on FTE is $100,000. So a budget freeze to 2021 levels uh, would be about a, you know 135 FTEs. That direct correlation was made, um, and that the, the the statements were also made that these reductions would be the new recruits we just hired. And, and I think there's several important caveats uh, with that report. The first is that it's very unlikely that uh, newly hired recruits would be first affected. Um, every year there is turnover in the service, as you know, people that leave naturally through attrition. And those FTEs without people um, losing their jobs would be first to be reoriented in any case. Um, the second is that in recent history, the, the total increase to these budgets has never seen that direct correlation of new funding to new FTEs. So for example, a $10 million increase would go to several places, not just a um, uh, hundred new FTEs. Um, that happens often. So um, it, you keep, the direct correlation is, is a bit off there. And further to that point, most businesses uh, loaded labor rate is about two times their salary. So particularly for a larger organization like OPS, and I think you have about 2,100 staff at OPS. Um, so it's not just straight salaries, but benefits, supporting infrastructure, supporting personnel, overhead. Um, so by doing the calculation where it said, if you froze, you'd have a reduction of 130 to 140 officers that would actually assume a salary closer to, to 50,000 per officer, um, given our, the two time, um, uh, loaded labor rate, which, which we know is, is, is not accurate. A starting salary, um, obviously is a bit higher than that, but your average salary, your average FT would be much higher. Um, the last piece of information I just want to share with you is, is how much this budget has grown. Um, it has tripled in 20 years uh, since after amalgamation. Um, and it has been the fastest growing budget of any major department in the city of Ottawa. It, it has outstripped tax growth and population increases. So it has grown a lot in 20 years. Um, so my recommendation, my suggestions today for the board, and it's not necessarily for this meeting, but at the board meeting when you, when you get to it, is, is to look at a freeze of the budget with the explicit recommendation to city council that this is conditional on the funds being used by the city to establish 24 seven mental health outreach teams. And the reason for this is twofold. You would be freezing the budget, but you'd also be reallocating calls traditionally handled by the police. So for example, you'd be reducing workload for uh, police commensurate with a budget freeze. And in fact, it's reasonable because we know that mental health response teams actually save resources and can improve outcomes. Um, and so cities across Canada are moving in this direction. The city of Toronto has already moved uh, in, in doing this and um, their uh, mental health outreach teams will consist of crisis workers trained in de-escalation who are going to respond to non-emergency, non-violent calls instead of police. Um, I mean, member Sueda asked the question around some of the costs. Their pilot teams are estimated to cost upwards of about $8 million annually. Um, there's a, a request from council uh, for staff to work with the police on a reallocation of funds from the police budget to ensure the cost of the pi pilot will not result in new financial burdens to Torontonians. Um, so can you, can you wrap up your, over the I will. Thank you Thanks, very sir. much chair. And I'm, I'm basically done. I just to say that this, this pilot, um, in Toronto, um, there's three different geographically, uh, high priority areas, as well as 
um, the city's in, uh, a fourth that will serve the city's indigenous community, um, recognizing the intergenerational trauma and um, um, a negative history with, with police. So I think there's, there's ample examples of how this is working in other cities. And the transfer of these funds could be a big shift in Ottawa uh, towards what we need here, which is a, that pilot on, on mental health outreach teams, if you structure it correctly. So <laughs> I hope you will uh, take those adv that advice. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. And we have a question for you from uh, Member Nerman. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Manad, uh, for coming over and for your delegation. Uh, quite useful information. <clears throat> and as you know, I'm not a counselor, so not aware of the things, but I'm just building on what my uh, colleagues and uh, previously Councillor Brockington has stated. In your, in your advice recently, uh, a few minutes ago, you stated that once we make this vote to the budget, we should, should be subject to, to the city. So here is my question, and if you can enlighten me, that for instance, we agree to your advice and we cut say X amount of dollars uh, on the mental health crisis, which you are recommending for 24 seven units, how the council will work. Because at the moment, at the moment we need it as member Sweta has rightly stated that the transition has to be, it cannot wait for weeks, months, or even days. It has to be right away. The transition from 911 to that has to be right away. So according to you, if we, if we do that, if we freeze that budget and we give this subject to the, any recommendation to the council, how long it will take to be in, in action? If you can enlighten me, please. Yeah, so you can't direct city council on its budget, but you can make your best recommendation to them based on the calls that are being received by OPS now to, to uh, start to reduce that workload over time. This sort of thing doesn't happen instantly. I mean, the chief has said that and others have said that as well. It's not overnight that it happens. Uh, there has been working groups established. And again, to member Sueda's question, I, I was the one who brought the original motion that talked about alternative forms of policing, mental health outreach teams to city council. We have had those motions come. That was almost a year and a half ago. Uh, so we've had those tables set up. Um, uh, both through police and through community, and, and now they're, uh, they are working. Um, in Toronto's decision to set this up, there was several months of transition uh, with a pilot set to begin um, after six months. So there will be some time to do that. You need those funds to start to transition. But if you don't start somewhere, you're never going to get there. And so in this case, uh, I don't believe you're going to have uh, massive deficiencies in service. Um, you will have that transition. There will be ample people that apply for those positions in this city when they're posted uh, with expertise uh, already um, in hand from schooling that already trains uh, on, on these aspects. So um, this is the example that we have in Toronto now is, is a shining example of what we can do as a city. Uh, and I would emulate that exact um, um, uh, model that's being instituted in Toronto. Uh, so I appreciate the question, uh, Mr. Nerman. Uh, thank you, thank you. I have just a follow-up on this. So hypothetically, we have to vote on this budget on November 22nd. And assuming, and assuming taking your advice, we, we send this proposal to the city with subject to on this uh, pilot, say a pilot or something, and say in three months, they, they reject that proposal where the OPS would stand, where the services would stand. So if city council rejected those recommendations, I don't think they would if the police board is sending a budget reduction uh, in the neighborhood of what it is taking in Toronto to get this started. Um, I don't believe the city council would reject that. I believe they would um, begin to institute those funds immediately. Um, uh, but should they reject it, should they come back and say no to it, um, then obviously uh, there would need to be a review of, uh, you know, a go forward situation uh, for OPS and for our mental health outreach teams. The, the, the thing about this is it's a priority for the city. We've said we want to do it. Uh, we've said we need to do it. We just haven't put money towards it. We haven't started that transition. It, and this is the year to start that transition. 
um, take the months that it's going to take to get there. Um, but it, it needs to begin now. So um, I think you'd have reassurances if the budget came in lower than what you're predicting now uh, with the recommendation to council, that would uh, be very powerful for our council to um, reallocate those funds uh, to something that would reduce workload in OPS over time. Uh, Chair, I have one final uh, uh, follow-up uh, to the councillor. So, so as I, I, I will, re I will reiterate that we are in the midst of uh, passing of the budget for 2022. Your suggestion of alternate services appears to be good, but definitely it is fraught with some risk whether the council will approve or not approve. What if they reject and come back and putting the OPS into, into the state of the confusion? Don't you think these suggestions should be good for the falling, for, for the falling budget cycle, say 2023 instead of 2022? I don't, Mr. Nerman. I, the reason I, I, I would say I would strongly recommend against that is that it has been years now of, of delegations and hope for this sort of change. That funding will be needed at some point this year. It'll give the city a kick to get started to make sure that that hiring occurs in 2022. Um, and, and if the city rejected it, the city wouldn't say, we're going to reject that and not put it into mental health services and then not put it back to OPS. Uh, I know the way other councillors think on this. So uh, in all likelihood, if that is a rejection, that's going right back to OPS anyway. Uh, so I, I would not wait another year it does a disservice to the calls for change that have been going on now. The, the, the impetus is to start right now, um, to begin to, to make this work real, and you do that with funding behind it. So uh, I would strongly urge you to, to start to make these changes now, uh, which, which is where I think we, a lot of us want to end up anyway. Uh, I, you know, talking to some uh, police officers on the street, they say the same thing, that they need help right now with mental health, that that is one of the fastest growing issues they have to deal with, and they're not fully equipped for it. Uh, they want that support um, because they're having to deal with situations that they shouldn't be having to deal with. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Norman, Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair Smallwood, uh, and thank you, uh, Council Bernard, uh, for your delegation as well. I just want to kind of build off of what Mem Member Norman was saying. I mean, there's we have, a, we have a reality to the process as well. And I guess I had a similar question to Councillor uh, Rockington, is that, okay, if, if you're suggesting that $8 million worth for Toronto, we can assume something less for Ottawa. And I guess the question that I have is, how come these motions haven't come from city council for $4 million or $5 million or $6 million from the general city funds as opposed to the OPS funds? And then we can start that way. And then as the chief has been saying over and over again, is that we transition to something. And that way we, there's, there's a more controlled and um, a responsible transition to what you're talking about. Because I, I agree with you. I think we're all trying to get to the same uh, end game here. It's just how we're going to get there. And I'm concerned that if we, if we do it um, immediately, that it could cause a lot of distress in the services that the OPS provides. Whereas if it came from council asking for four or $5 million, similar to what you described in Toronto, that it would be a smoother transition. So just a few clarifications. The, the pilot in Toronto is a pilot. There's only four areas. It's, in eight, it's a 7.2 million to $8 million pilot. Not fully sure how much it'll cost at the end of the day when it all washes out, but that's, that's the pilot, those, those four, outreach teams, 24 seven service with one in, uh, indigenous focus, uh, uh, mental health outreach team. Uh, a pilot in Ottawa would likely cost less uh, as a pilot, but over time, you're going to see those resources increased, which actually reduces workload and saves money for police. So just to say it, the pilot is, is the pilot, that is the transition. Uh, you don't, you're not, you're not uh, uh, transitioning into a a pilot, you, you, you start with the pilot as the transition. From there, as the pilot works its way through, there may, may be a need to increase that as we see more calls for mental health come into 911 uh, and those the triaging that happens or through 211. Uh, that, is the, that is the transition. So, um, and to, to your point, I have brought motions uh, on exactly this. The one that was passed, um, 
talked about the, the consultations that have been ongoing now for um, uh, more, more than months. It's been, I think, a year and, and a, a little bit uh, since Chair Dean's return to uh, City Council. Um, and so uh, th this is uh, well established. That was unanimously passed by City Council. Um, and the reason why it makes sense to transition these funds from OPS to do this is because the whole point is that it's reducing workload with OPS. Uh, that will take off pressure from OPS as that transition happens and as those calls are triaged to uh, frontline resources that are not OPS staff, um, that are our city staff as a fourth emergency service pilot, as we've seen in many other cities. So uh, I hope that makes sense, is, is, is not to just keep increasing uh, one budget when there's a, a potential reduction coming elsewhere, we have to find those funds somewhere. And in this case, it makes most sense that it come um, from this uh, budget line item. I agree about, uh, you know, to your point that, you know, the more we get OPS, uh, the less uh, OPS should get. So there's no, I don't think any of us uh, dispute that. I think it's more of how we get this thing started. And you might just need some seed capital, um, uh, again, from, from city. Uh, to start it, and then that transition can uh, can start taking place year over year. And uh, as as that pilot grows and becomes more of a permanent thing, then then the transition that the amount of funding needed for the OPS will decrease. And I guess it's just a matter of how do we start this. And I get that's where I kind of I'm just trying to I'm struggling to kind of understand that transition process. But again, thank you for your delegation, uh, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Swinnon. Thank you very much, Member Sueda. Member Johnson. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'm just going to build on, on my two uh, board colleagues' previous comments here. And uh, Council Mount, thank you for your uh, delegation today. And you mentioned that the councillors unanimously supported this mental health kind of crisis team. Uh, just to clarify, I just want to confirm that's what you're saying, that they unanimously support what i'm saying is we've supported two motions unanimously which have spoken to alternatives to policing for enhancing community safety with mental health resource teams as examples cited in both of those motions which is what everyone has uh, agreed it makes sense to transition towards okay okay um so then why has nothing happened about it at the city then and I think that's just a further question to the steps and the process and the, you know, why hasn't the city begun this then? Much, much has been done. The city has begun this. Uh, there have been working groups uh, with uh, community stakeholders, the community table, uh, police at that table uh, with others uh, in the city manager's office has now been referred to the city manager's office. We just had a release recently of the work that's already been accomplished um, to move towards this um, within within that uh, that table uh, and the work of our community social services and city manager's office. So we there has been work inputted to this. Uh, that that work uh, is important and it it, it is ongoing. Uh, what I am getting at is that there is a call for change right now. The best way I see that manifesting itself is the creation of this fourth emergency service. If you want, I think to be responsive to both community and the other calls for alternative safety that are going on, that is one of the best ways that you can begin this transition with this budget cycle. So um, take the point about, um, you know, direct calls for uh, this emergency service starting from city council. They have been there uh, and the work has been done. We need to expedite that work. That will not happen unless there is funding attached with a 22 budget priority that says city manager you're tasked with this. You need to get this done in this this operational year as a pilot project to begin. So, appreciate the uh, the questions, Member Johnson. Yes. Okay. And thank you. And that's quite helpful, actually. Um, just based on your experience as a counselor, to get from the point you're at now uh, with social services and the plans to actually actioning this, what kind of time frame would there typically be? I realize you want it to be expedited, and that makes a lot of sense to expedite it and. Uh, you know, it sounds uh, like it could be, you know, a very good solution to the complicated issues that are occurring in Ottawa right now during the pandemic and the really high number of mental health issues uh, that are occurring in our city. I'm just wondering, though, in terms of actionable time frame, based on your experience as a counselor, 
Yeah, um, others, as you could see with this. Certainly. Thank you. Others, other cities have been uh, in the neighborhood of six months or longer. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, the benefit Ottawa has is we've seen other cities go first in Canada. Um, so this, uh, this work has been done by other cities that we can emulate here. Uh, but I still think you're looking at a, a timeline of likely six months uh, getting off the ground. Now, that's still a 2022 timeline. Uh, it still makes sense to make these changes now in this budget cycle. Um, but you're still looking at a transition time. Um, and the way you allocate resources during that transition time is an operational decision. Uh, but, but certainly I could see it taking um, that long. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much, uh, Member Johnson. Uh, Councillor, I just I want to make one comment, uh, not a question, just a comment. I have had great frustration with that use of the chart, uh, what is usually called the cop per pop chart, and I've repeatedly asked them to stop using it. You'll notice that it's set up and it, it orders the, the cities uh, by the population, uh, cop per population, as if that is the determining factor in the, in the order that you should see cities in. If you take that same chart and reorder it based on crime severity or cost of policing, what becomes very obvious is Winnipeg and Edmonton shoot right to the top of the list which would seem to indicate, therefore, that the and the cost of policing, the more money you spend, the more severe crime you have. And, and the more police you have, the more severe crime you have. And I'm not suggesting that that is, is a reasonable interpretation, but I don't think it's any less reasonable or more reasonable to use the cop by pop as a determining factor. As the police themselves in their budget report put out, Ottawa is unique, 80% of it is rural. We should not, under any circumstances, be comparing it to Winnipeg, Vancouver, Calgary, or any other city. So they really, the chart shouldn't show up anywhere because it, it, it's like the old lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can twist them and turn them any way you want to make the message you want out of them, and they do us no service at all, and I don't know why we keep getting them thrust on us, and I don't know why they're in the budget this year. So not a question, but just a comment. Chief, slowly over to you. Thank you, Chair. I'll have a brief comment as well. If we only use the cop to pop, that would be inappropriate. We provided a range of statistics and other information for the board to consider. That was one data point amongst many. I appreciate everything you just said and agree with it. Um, it would be disingenuous to use that as a single or the dominant uh, statistic. Um, in regards to the uh, Councillor Menard's comments around the national capital region, that is one of the things, uh, Chair Smallwood, that um, does make this unique. This is the only national capital police of jurisdiction in Canada. Um, there was a comment made by Councillor Menard that the federal police uh, service, the RCMP is around here. So that must offset the policing demands that we have, quite the opposite. Uh, the RCMP has been withdrawing its services significantly over the last several years. In fact, that was a primary mandate of RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky when she took office that has left a deficit of additional resources that used to exist for the Ottawa Police Service to rely on that no longer exists and has been diminished significantly. In fact, the requirement of police with jurisdiction has expanded and is now a pressure on us operationally and financially. We get some amount of monies from the federal government, but not anywhere near enough to cover the full amount of operating costs that we have to provide into the area. So while I appreciate Council Menard's sense that there should be extra police support in the area, it's actually the opposite. It's a drain on resources and a pressure in our finances. Um, the second area around FTE counts, I appreciate the councillor's um, uh, attempt to understand that amount. I'd be happy to unpack that further should the board require more information on that. We can provide that in the in the follow-up report that we committed to the board on Monday, should they choose to, to pursue that further. Um, this isn't an average cost. We've done, our, we've done over $20 million of efficiency savings. A lot of that has come on our civilian staff. While there is the possibility to, to find further civilian reductions, it's very, very limited. That is why the vast majority of any reductions will come from the uniform side of the house. And under the collective bargaining agreement, the councillor may not be aware of it, it is last in and first out if you're reducing the size of your FTEs. So the vast majority of FTEs that would come from a significant budget reduction would be uniform members, and 100% of those FTE reductions 
would come from our recent recruit graduation classes, which are our most diverse grad graduation classes in history. Those are just simple facts. There's no glossing that on whatsoever. The counselor mentioned the pilot program in Toronto. I have to tell you, I've looked at the pilot program in Toronto. I have a lot of connections in the city of Toronto. It's interesting, but it's very early days and they have not gone anywhere near close enough in their evaluation to determine what the final outcome will be. We have looked at more um, mature models, the Edmonton Police Help Model, the Denver Police Star Model, and of course, one that is probably most well known, the Eugene Oregon Police Cahoots Model. In every one of those cases, they're predicting a minimum range of 10% transfer of demand from police to community, up to the highest range that we've heard of, and I believe uh, Chair Smallwood, you mentioned this at the last public meeting, the CAHOOTS upper range model is in the low 20% range. Those are just mental health calls. Those aren't total calls for demands for service. I believe, Councilor Menard, you may not be aware, but I've just been informed the now approved community safety well-being plan for the city of Ottawa. Uh, the CSWB staff are actually looking at the Denver Star model as the one that they want to invest in, not the Toronto Police model. The Denver Star model, uh, Deputy Bell and I actually reached out to the Denver Chief of Police earlier on this year as we were starting to curate our work around forming the Guiding Council. Um, in fact, um, we looked at the Denver model and they showed early promise. Again, the Denver Police Chief said his numbers were probably in the range of 10% of transfer of responsibility. While these are not insignificant, they are not massive amounts and it's taken them quite a while to get to that level. The CAHOOTS model has been in existence for three decades. They've only got to a maximum number of 20%. The belief that the vast majority of these demands can be transferred to the community does not exist anywhere in, in, in the research that we can find. Again, I'm happy for people to point us to other models out there that can produce better, better outcomes. Last but not least, this board approved the budget in 2021. That included $1.5 million to go towards a mental health strategy. We fully committed to that. Deputy Chief Bell led the creation of the curation of the guiding council. Uh, senior healthcare prof professionals and respected organizations came, came together and, and formed that council. Through the leadership of Councillor uh, Diane Deans and our chair, she was able to get that council allocated over to, moved over from the Ottawa Police Service uh, directly into the community safety well-being plan of the city. Councilor Menard is very right. There's a lot of work that's been done in that area. Almost 100% of it came from the efforts of the Ottawa Police Service to curate the Guiding Council, which now sits under the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan, which we continue to support. So that great amount of work that the Council referenced is almost exclusively from the efforts of the Ottawa Police Service and commitment to the monies approved by the board last year. Last but not least, 1 million of that 1.5 million was grant money that I secured through negotiations with the Solicitor General. Some $987,000 were committed by the province to support the co-delivery of mental health services in the city of Ottawa. All of that money was sent to the local Ottawa Lynn. They were supposed to use that money to support the efforts of the Ottawa Police Service in delivering on this mental health strategy for the entire city of Ottawa. None of that money came to the Ottawa Police Service. In fact, there was no communication whatsoever from the Ottawa Lynn to the Ottawa Police Service saying that they received those funds and were committed to working with us to advance that strategy for the city. That is essentially the problem when people think that they can take money from one bucket and give it over to another bucket and have a proper partnership and a proper strategy implemented and, and, and evaluated. So we are very much in favor of a co-delivery, co-production model. We're very much in favor of other agencies taking on some significant portion of the demand that has been unfairly placed on the police service, but it doesn't happen in the way that most people think. It's a very difficult pro program to, to, to execute. It doesn't just take months, it usually takes years. And in the case of, of CAHOOTS, decades. And we're committed for the long haul. We wanna get going on this as quickly as possible. We have asked repeatedly for pilot projects or, or startup projects to happen in the city for whatever combination of reasons and other members have asked questions, the city has not found its way to actually starting any type of program. The only program that they have started on is the one that we started and transitioned through the help of chair deans over the community safety and well-being plan. Thank Thanks, you very much. Sir.
Thanks very much, Chief uh, Member Nerman. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chief, for a follow-up response to Councillor Munard. But honestly, I'm getting somewhat confused now. Uh, there is a proposal that the, these mental health services be taken out of the service and there should be an alternate model. I am fully supportive of that. And now you are saying whatever model, it may be a Toronto model, Cahoots model, whichever is the best, but what are the timelines? And uh, we should be mindful that we are in the, we are here on a 2022 budget cycle. So when, when this partnership and all that, according to you, Chief, will be practical going forward? Yeah, Member Nerman, thank you for the extra question. We're ready to start. We were ready to start a year ago. That's been our point. Let's get going on this. So what is holding on? We committed, uh, you've asked the question several times. We've committed, we, we had an approved budget from this board, committed $1.5 million for a partnership in the city to start a pilot project or multiple pilot projects. We could use the Toronto model, the Edmonton model, the Cahoots, the Eugene, Oregon model, this, the Denver model. Pick a model. Let's get going. You've had a number of reports come from the city, the Vivic Research Report from 819-613 Hub. You've had the Coalition of, of, of Ottawa uh, Health Centers who've, who've had their report. There are any number of reports that say, hey, we should start doing some sort of, a, of work to transition this. Now, some of them start from defund police and others start from let's have a partnership. But regardless, the city of Ottawa has an amazing array of social services, not-for-profit sectors, and a city that has a community safety well-being plan that has now been approved. We have committed funds in our operating budget over a year ago to start that work. We have started that work through the efforts of Deputy Bell and, and our partners around the, the Mental Health Council, Advisory Council, which is now with the City Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. We're ready to go. Let's get going. I don't know what's blocking it, but we've been fully prepared to do it and we are to this day. Let's get going. Uh, so thanks, <clears throat> thanks Chief. Uh, just final, the final comment now. Say for instance, uh, uh, in how much days or how many days or week, if you are given a go, go ahead, this model or this transition can be in, in force? Tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Member Nerman. Uh, Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chief, uh, just to uh, follow up as well as what Member Nerman was saying and what uh, Councillor Menard uh, talked about. So it, it seems like from what Councillor Menard was saying that there was unanimous uh, approval for several motions uh, at City Council to move toward in this direction. In your communications, Chief, with various City Council members uh, and the Mayor, did they give you any reason why the city would not be funding these motions that, that, that have been spoken about? And we've had a range of communications with, with city staff, um, certainly since I've arrived here. Uh, again, we've offered ample opportunities, lots of examples around how we could start to work together. Again, I just, there, there's uh, probably something that bears reference here. Right now, we have a number of these partnerships already underway. We have a mental health unit that, that puts a police officer and a mental health practitioner in a car that responds to low acuity, low threat level calls. That's been in place for a number of years. Some of the funds that we sought from the provincial government were to expand that so it could be a 24 seven basis so that we could actually get to calls on weekends and late at nights, particularly in suburban and rural communities that don't have a significant percentage of social service providers available to them. We have partnerships with Children Aid Society and our youth outreach workers. We have partnerships with the Boys and Girls Club for diversion, particularly youth diversion in the pre-charge and post-charge area. So we have a range of co-production models, referral models, diversion models that are already in place. Any of them can be scaled at any time. What we're talking about are new projects, new pilot efforts, new initiatives particularly in the area of mental health and addictions. And again, we've been advocating for that for as long as I've been here and longer than before I was here. For whatever combination of reasons, this city has not moved forward substantially on it. You have a police service, a full executive team, right down to our frontline members who are ready to move in that direction. We're begging for it. Let's just do it. 
Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Member Sueda, Member Johnson. Yes, thank you. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we're having a good discussion around this. So thank you, Councillor Menard, for getting this discussion going and your patience as we continue it here. Something uh, Chief just said about this program, does it start from defunding the police? And as I listen to that, um, you know, I think that's a little bit what we're talking about. And I just wanted to ask the chief to give his perspective briefly, um, or whatever time, maybe I shouldn't say briefly for this, because this is a really important question. Um, so, so what does defund mean, or how has it impacted the service, and how has this impacted you as a, the police chief? Thank you. Thank you, Member Johnson. Uh, it's a, it's a, a challenging question. I'll, I'll do my best to, to reflect on it. Um, I think there's a range of, of definitions and, and perspectives around the concept of defund police. And, and for, for the purposes of your question, I will, I will set aside the concept of abolish the police, which a number of delegations present where they want no police involved in anything. So let's just set that aside. And, and I should just at this point thank our ASL communicators. They've been fantastic throughout this program and they're working so hard. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, defund police, I believe, is where the majority of people on this call, Councillor Menard, myself, Councillor Smallwood, sorry, Chair Smallwood, are actually talking about. How do we actually look at getting the right resources to people at the right time to achieve the right outcomes? I and every other police chief of any major jurisdiction have been on record for years saying that we should never have taken on the vast majority of the mental health and addictions calls that were put on the plate of the police decades ago. What we have not had is a whole of city, in this case, whole of society discussion around how to reverse that process. If we reverse that process, if we put those calls as much as possible into the hands of other service providers, whether they be federally funded, provincially funded, municipally funded, or funded through the larger charitable and philanthropic uh, uh, processes, then we'll probably get closer to that point of right services to the people at the right time to produce the right outcomes. But that process that we have currently in place right now took decades. I'm not suggesting it's gonna take another series of decades to get there, but it's not going to happen in one budget cycle. It's not gonna happen in six months. And despite the best efforts, it's not gonna happen with a pilot project. It's going to take time and it's gonna take partnerships. It's gonna take information sharing. It's gonna take resource sharing. It's gonna take shared commitment. I'm all for that. Let's keep moving in that direction and let's accelerate that if possible. What I am not for is the part of the defund movement, which quite frankly has been unfortunately um, in some cases undermined by misinformation and disinformation, by marginalizing institutions like the police service, by discrediting legitimate efforts or ignoring legitimate efforts. Um, and, and so we lose the ability to actually have meaningful conversations with potentially very good partners so we can start working together and actually move the needle on this. We've almost wasted an entire calendar year by this type of divisive, polarizing, and non-productive efforts around getting a mental health strategy going for this city. And that's a shame. So we, we still have 11 delegates left. Um, I'd like to try to move on unless there's some other pressing questions at this, if we can move on to our next uh, delegate. Is that Thank okay? you, Chair. Thank you very have much, uh, Councillor Menard. Uh, our next uh, delegate is Julia Hammer. Hammer, Hammer. If uh, Julia is present, if she could turn her camera on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Julia. You have uh, five minutes. Please uh, proceed. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia, and I'm here today to ask that the board vote against the 2022 draft budget and instead raise the budget, allowing the police force to make do with the $332.5 million already at their disposal. 
I'm a resident of downtown Ottawa, and I do not want more police on our streets. I do not want the police that we currently have to have a constantly escalating arsenal of personal weapons, including tasers, and I do not want the police creating a false narrative that they are essential in keeping us safe, when in reality they are both actively harming people and siphoning money away from the people who are doing real safety work. I want that money to go to public health, to frontline groups doing harm reduction, food delivery, and shelter support. Sandy, in your opening remarks, you say that it is the board's goal to limit the budget while maintaining adequate levels of policing. But what does that mean? What would adequate levels of policing look like? What does it mean if every other service is not at adequate, adequate levels of operations specifically due to the allocation of funding and responsibilities? And what responsibility does this board have to understand how these budget decisions directly impact the survival of people in the city who are constantly being denied their basic needs by services that are stretched beyond their means. The only thing that OPS is promising with their ever ballooning budget is greater force, greater control, and greater security. Security is not safety. To quote abolitionist Miriam Kaba, security and safety aren't the same thing. Security is a function of the weaponized state that is using guns, weapons, fear, and other things to make us secure. All the horrible things are supposed to be kept at bay by these tools even though we know that horrible things continue to happen all the time with these things in place. Cops do not provide housing, they do not provide food, they do not provide transportation, they do not provide support or resources of any kind. Granting this budget increase will not only fail to make our communities any safer, safer it will actively withhold money from groups who desperately need it. Groups have been extremely clear that they do not want partnership with the police and understand that safety work does not include the police. It is extremely disappointing to hear members of this board act puzzled at the idea that community organizations do not want to work with the police, as this is an issue that has come up time and time again in these meetings. It is also disappointing to watch delegates, especially those who've been regular speakers at these meetings, be constantly put on the spot to name perfect complex alternatives to policing and then have their responses muted or spoken over. This is a wildly inappropriate way to engage with delegates, especially in a forum like this, which, as we all know, is not a forum for discussion and where board members hold all the power. It is also an insult to the time that delegates have spent preventing, presenting research data and their own lived experiences to this board, only to have members ask basic, basic questions that only tell us that you haven't really been listening and you don't really care. I also don't believe we've ever seen OPS held to the same standard of justifying how their behaviors are promoting safety or representing effective or adequate policing. What is the cost of having police continue to operate as is? The fact that one of the reasons that alternatives, the fact is that one of the reasons that alternatives to police are as limited as they are right now is because budget increases like this one continue to be approved and that responsibility, that responsibility falls on every board member who, can, who supports continuous budget increases without understanding the ramifications of those decisions. Just because you are not responsible for dictating where this money could otherwise go does not mean that voting to give it to the to the police isn't actively keeping it away from other services. Level zero describes when there are no ambulances available to respond to 911 calls. This means that if you or someone you cared for were having a medical emergency and required immediate EMS support, you would not receive it. In 2020, this happened 400 times, and in 2019, it happened over 500 times. This year's city budget begins to reduce the COVID-19 funding going to public health but it is clear that in this regard and many others that our healthcare system is crumbling and people are unable to get the care that they need. As we hit level zero more than once a day in this city, it is not acceptable to have police respond to calls that ambul ambulances cannot because they are stretched too thin. Meanwhile, approving a budget increase of this size for the police. Police do not keep us safe and cannot respond to our crises and giving them more money to pretend that they can is dangerous. Finally, I'd like to remind and empower the board on their commitment to freezing or reducing the OPS budget. Contrary to the incredibly belittling and misogynistic comments by Matt Scoff, this board, and especially you, Diane, are in exactly the right position to demand financial accountability and make budget decisions for the greatest good of the city. To suggest otherwise is an intimidation tactic based in the fear of not getting what the police think that they deserve. That fear is a reflection of the power that you do have over this budget and the role that of police and the role of the police services board as a whole. Suggesting otherwise is to suggest that the police are only accountable to themselves. These comments were made on behalf of the Ottawa Police Association, 
who continue to fly the hate symbol thin blue line flag outside of their office without recourse, despite requests from this board to lower it. Acting to freeze the OPS budget is not only an act of harm reduction because of funding, but it is an indication that this city and its residents do not exist at the whims and wants of the police service, and that we can imagine a city that thrives beyond idolized notions of security, control, and force. Over $100 Thank you, Julia. Can you, can you wrap up now? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could wrap up now. Thank you. Yeah. Over 100 delegates spoke at last year's budget meeting and were told to be patient and wait for next year. And here we are. The time to freeze the budget is now. Thank you. And I will not be taking questions. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much, Julia. I, uh, I don't have a question for you, but I did want to make a comment. You, you had raised the issue of adequate and effective policing. And that is a really important point. And it's one of the reasons why I've been concerned about the use of the cop per pop statistic, because often the argument is made that, uh, and in fact, in one of the councillor's letters to the board, it talks about the fact that uh, we're falling behind in our cop per pop. And so uh, generally speaking, what off, the argument often is if, if other communities in Ontario, other services have so many police per population, uh, adequate would be defined as we should have the same thing. And I don't think that that uh, is what it is. We should be looking at outcomes and, and that's what how we should determine what adequate policing is. So I uh, thank you. Uh, Julia is not taking any questions. So I'll move on to the next delegate, which is Sam Hirsch. Sam, if you're with us, if you can turn on your camera. Hi, Sam. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You have five minutes, please go ahead. Thank you. So, hello, um, bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Sam Hirsch, je suis ici aujourd'hui comme plusieurs autres fois, comme l'année dernière, juillet dernier, pour en prononcer contre encore une autre augmentation budgétaire pour les services policiers d'Ottawa et de vous demander d'utiliser votre pouvoir pour le bien et pour la première fois se positionner avec les gens d'Ottawa et non les forces policières. Uh, the police seem to be one of the only organizations or departments in this city who can rely on a stable increase to their budget despite their performance and despite any budget shortfalls or economic hardship that happens to our city. Take transit, for example. Uh, earlier in March, when ridership was down, instead of making it more appealing to come back and uh, to transit and easier, the city simply decided to cut service. While for policing, police can commit sexual violence, can constantly gaslight residents while they speak intimately about their experiences, refuse to enact a reasonable mandatory vaccination policy while others, uh, other workers are at risk of being fired, and still be in the running to receive a huge funding increase. There's a double standard here at work. Uh, whenever they come with an ask, they all, almost always get what they want. When it comes from money's like, uh, for money for weapons like tasers that are causing harm or, ex or extra weapons or money, more money to hire more officers, what other agency has this type of double standard in our city? None, and it shows in the full budget document. 15 million on affordable housing, as we've seen for the past three years, despite the incredibly worsening housing crisis, little to no mention of the city's flagship environmental program, Energy Evolution, meant to curb the city away from more carbon emissions, another fair increase that will likely deter more people from our faltering, embarrassing excuse for a trans system, and perhaps most egregiously and shocking to me in this budget, $27 million for the 95 so, uh, social service agencies in our city, many of the ones who you all claim to support so much, $27 million. Uh, in what reasonable society would many of these organizations representing hundreds to close to thousands of workers that actually do the work to help address mental health crises, food insecurity, and poverty reduction would be scraping over a meager, paltry $27 million while the Ottawa police, one organization, mind you, gets uh, close to $400 million. And not only that, but spends it on things that mostly cause people harm. Uh, chair Deans, uh, surely as, as the former chair of the Community and Protective Services Committee, you're, you're aware of the struggles many of these organizations face when it comes to funding. Uh, to, to funding. So how, how is this reasonable? How do you find this reasonable? Well, there's, you know, this is not a random set of coincidences. This is the policy choice. There's no reason this has to be this way. The city has the money to reallocate to these organizations and other departments to ensure multiple crises are well addressed, but doesn't. And I know many of you will argue, as you have in the past, that we don't have the money in the city proper to, to create mental health crisis units and need to go to the province, but, but that isn't the case. With $4 billion, we could certainly spare the $15 million, as Vivek has pointed out, uh, it would take to create one. 
and we can start uh, procuring the funding now, as Councilman Arn noted, let's not push this, this back as you push the freeze to this year. Continuing to push this issue year after year means it will never happen. If police were begging for this, as Chief Stoley said, then it would already have been done already. A large reason the police ask for money in their budget is the apparent increase in demand for their service, but, but this isn't even consistent with their own survey they conducted where 73% of residents think that some mental health services should be shifted to other services. Demand may have gone up, sure, but the survey confirms that a vast majority of people would rather have someone else to call regardless of, they, of where they live, and that includes the suburbs in, the, in that survey. And you know, many of you have characterized the main issue with the police as an issue of trust or of optics. The police need to talk about their plan in a better way, but it's not trust issues. It's a structural issue and a systemic issue. It goes beyond trust. And I'll end with this. Um, you know, I saw the letter that Matt Scoff, Ottawa Police Association president sent. Not only does his letter insult you and your integrity, uh, Chair Deans, multiple times, but it also insults the thousands of residents across this city who have spoken up and asked for a better city and minimizes us to a small fringe group of community members. You all at this table hopefully know this not to be true. Scoff thinks that he and his dangerous band of supporters within the auto police force can continue to control the agenda without any oversight when it comes to policing. But you all can show him by voting down this budget and supporting a full freeze, not a partial freeze or anything of the sort, that this isn't the case. You all need to show Scoff the importance and need for civilian oversight because clearly he doesn't think the police need it. And by extension, Chief Soli, who has not disagreed by the, uh, by the way, by the sentiments expressed in that letter, I would agree with that too. I haven't heard him disagree with the sentiments of Matt Scoff. Whenever people push for change, they can, accept, they can expect pushback and intimidation. Don't let Scoff bully you out of your commitment to a freeze and a better city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Is there anybody that has any questions? Uh, I don't see any. Thank you very much again, Sam, for uh, coming before us today. And uh, I'll now move on to the next uh, uh, delegate, which is uh, Mohamed Miguel. Hey guys, how's it going? Hello, Mohammed. You have uh, five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Yes. Okay. So, um, hello, Chair, uh, Board members, as well as uh, Chief and Deputy Chiefs, and most importantly, my uh, community friends. Um, so, I like I like to take the time first of all to uh, thank um, our community leaders in helping us and fight for this budget freeze. Uh, such as CAMS, uh, Coalition Against More Surveillance, Ottawa Black Diaspora Coalition, uh, Coalition, and Horizon Ottawa. You guys are the uh, true uh, force in our safety and improvement. And also, thank you to uh, Councillor um, Riley Brock, uh, Brockington and Sean Menard. So, anyways, um, five minutes is going to go pretty quick. So, I'll go. I'll go and see what I have to say. Um, so, I'm here again and again, um, asking you guys to. Um, uh, stop the OPS uh, budget increase. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's mind blowing how much the city and the chief um, is misinterpreting defunding uh, versus abolishing. What we are asking is you guys to prevent the OPS from continuing to receive excessive budget funds because this would only allow OPS to keep terrorizing our communities, um, especially my communities, um, BIPOC communities, but more policing, uh, it's not the solution, right? So um, not only that you guys have neglected all of my community, especially in uh, the Bi BIPOC community, um, it's like a clear, you guys are like saying a clear, we don't care. Um, so what we are asking is that every year the OPS gets a budget increase while the crime rate is declined. So auto residents can't even afford a single, um, full trip transit fare, forget about a monthly pass. Um, we're facing a high eviction rate due to not having any affordable housing. And yet OPS get new equipment, new patrol cars, um, new firearms. And what they do with those equipments, they go back in our communities and they start causing problems. So this is why we don't want armed officers to participate in our community growth because you guys are creating more fears um, and stress in our communities. So this call to freeze the budget is more about 
more it's more than just a municipal uh, demand, right? It's it's about investing differently, reducing our society reliance on policing, um, minimizing uh, the impact of policing in our communities and meeting the needs of our communities. And this call to basically freeze the budget is to invest into uh, community growth, such, such as for the uh, benefit of uh, education, medical care, affordable housing. Um, and it's simple and precise. We're not asking a lot, we're asking fair and to be treated uh, just. So, um, and she slowly uh, uses the term rebranding, uh, increased diversity. Uh, we know this isn't, this isn't true, right? I mean, it's all a lie. You simply want it to make it look different and improve, but it offers the same way, right? The OPS has failed to develop a mental health strategy despite asking $1.5 million. They failed to train their officers to de-escalate uh, situations and continue uh, to racially profile BIPOC residents. Um, so the auto police services don't provide healthcare. Uh, they don't provide nutrition. They don't provide housing. They don't provide medical care. Um, you guys are the one who basically provide these uh, well-being services. So if you guys are going to keep increasing the budget, we're going to keep facing cuts on our necessary um, uh, services. Now, what we are asking here is do not pass uh, this budget because not only that it is an insult uh, to us uh, that we keep coming back every month, month after month and asking you guys to freeze it, but you guys don't understand that we are your priorities. We are the, the frontline providers. We talk to our communities, we ask our communities and basically the main concern is our safety, our housing, our health and our growth. And that should be your top priority. Now, I wanted to go back to uh, member uh, Sueda asking for any contact information of uh, community leaders where uh, you know you guys can basically communicate with us and work with us. Um, so what we are asking here is, um, what we are saying, I should say, is that we um, deserve the funding uh, to service our community needs and we deserve to live free from surveillance. And we do have certain emails, if you want to write it down, um, Councillor um, uh, Sueda and any other counselor interested in that. Um, I can give you info at uh, horizonottawa.ca if you want to write it down. I repeat, info at horizonottawa.ca. Uh, also, Coalition Against More Surveillance, C-A-M-S dot Ottawa at gmail.com. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Is that is that it? Are you because your time is up, or did you have that's, something else? Uh, that's it up? for me. I just want to thank you guys for your time, and Good. yeah, much appreciated. Thank you very much for coming, Mohammed. I'll check and see. I don't see any hands up, but um, I, I did want to thank you for taking time once again to come to speak us to speak with us. Thank you. So, have a good day, guys. Uh, the next speaker is Zhu Zhu. If they are present, could they turn their camera on? Hello all, I'm back again. To be totally frank, I stopped signing up to speak these meetings for a while because it became clear to me that the board had no intention of ever acting based on community members input, no matter how much research and hard evidence we are backed by. While that has not changed, I hope that with the hundreds of millions of dollars at stake today, members of this committee choose to break this pattern. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that I, along with many other delegates today, am asking you to cut the Ottawa Police Services budget or, at very, very minimum, refuse to approve an increase. The proposed 2022 police budget is cartoonishly out of touch with the reality of living in Ottawa today. I want to reiterate that we are talking about a $14 million increase to an institution that already receives more than $346 million a year. This is outrageous. In contrast, 95 social services in this city operate with a total of $27 million shared between them. This is drastically lower than the $66 million they have previously asked for to sustain basic operations. 
Anyone who has ever needed to access one of these services themselves, or else work there themselves or refer people to them, knows how catastrophically underfunded they are. On social media, OPS regularly attempts to demonstrate its goodwill, with little mind to affected persons' privacy, with brags about things like its involvement in responding to overdoses caused by the toxic drug supply. But services in this city, constantly stretched thin, do this every single day and save far more lives, and yet do not get anywhere near the same operating budget. The only mass spectrometer in the city that harm reduction workers have access to, an incredibly vital piece of equipment for drug testing, has been malfunctioning for more than half a year. Imagine what people on the actual front lines of this devastation could do with equivalent funding at their disposal. An article in the Ottawa Citizen just today discusses both the vital function of respite centers and their impending closure due to lack of resources. In my own experience, even just in the past few months, more and more incredibly necessary community resources have shut down and vanished, to very immediate concrete and detrimental effects on individual people living in precarity, and with only grassroots groups with absolutely zero funding whatsoever to fill the gaps. On November 23, 2020, this board moved to look into reducing or freezing the budget this year, after nearly 100 people showed up to express their opposition to the current status quo. The budget report this year seems to conclude that that is impossible without affecting delivery of, quote, adequate and effective policing, and the service our community demands and deserves. But it is common knowledge at this point that the issues we respond to with policing are caused by, and could be better addressed through, giving communities resources instead. Crime prevention does not look like uniformed officers with guns, even when those officers are more diverse, more integrated into our communities, or whatever other doomed to fail reform effort is now being put forward. Proposals like this $2.2 million investment into a culture change, through strategies like implicit bias training, hilariously miss the point, even aside from academic evidence that now demonstrates that such trainings and efforts are an utterly ineffective waste of resources. The services our communities deserve are not policing, no matter what its appearance, but actually affordable housing, safe consumption sites, an accessible and safe supply of substances, and so, so much more. In this sense, focusing on any one budget line is almost misleading, though I am sure that my fellow delegates have and will also give much more detailed instruction on exactly how this committee could strike out certain costs. If we are committed to only ever responding to the crises before us reactively and taking the information about staffing and project needs at face value, there will always be more reasons to be found to funnel money into policing. We could give them over a billion dollars, as Toronto does, or even several billion, as with cities like Los Angeles in the US, and it would still never be enough. This, again, and always, is because policing is never the answer. It is a parasitic drain that only ever exacerbates the social issues it claims to shield us from, though it is perpetually ineffective at even that. To actually create a better future for us all, we must instead be willing to divest from policing altogether. Again, all fact and evidence bears this out. There is a massive amount of peer-reviewed, academically rigorous literature in support of this model. What I am saying is the only, and I repeat, only approach to policing and policy actually consistently in keeping with the established facts. When will our municipal decision makers actually act accordingly? Oh, and as a final note, since members here seem to be more engaged today than usual. If you have any questions for me, you may have to exercise some patience as I compose my response. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, for the delegate? I don't see it, so I wanted to thank you once again, Sue, for taking the time and, and uh, presenting before us today. So thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, delegate is Bailey Gauthier. If, uh, if Bailey is present, if they could turn on their camera. Well, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out my audio. Oh, sorry, my video. Ooh. Hey, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my face is right there. Hello, everybody. Hi, guys. Hope you're doing well. Hi, uh, David. Okay. Thanks very much Hi. for coming. You have five minutes. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks for being here, everybody. And just like all the work that's been going into this. Uh, just wanted to like take a second to thank you all for the energy. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I just had a couple things I wanted to talk about. I'm super excited to see this budget get taken out line by line. Um, there's a lot of... Oops. Um, a lot of interesting things I think that can get shaved off in this and I think you guys are on the right track for a lot of stuff. Um, however, um, 
Hang on. Oh, yeah. No, um, so there's just a couple things I wanted to talk about. And um, one of them was in regards to Swida's uh, comment about like the mental health strategies and stuff like that. Um, one of the, just to kind of like supplement onto that, it was like, we want like there always seems to be this like urgency of like well what replaces police to mental health response and it's just like the fact of the matter is that we just we need you out of it like that's one of the biggest things and um the problem is it's like nobody's been able to come to the board or express their lived experiences with these mental health calls like the people like when police intervene in mental health calls there's been no space for people to tell their stories and how that's impacted them and that's one of the uh I would say factors in why this uh, response seems like you would understand it if you listen to their responses um, and the amount of harm and why it's important to remove policing from mental health. Um, and the thing is too, uh, one of the big reasons that I just wanted to uh, like touch base on is uh, the quality control of which officers end up in those responses. There is no way to know which one is going. And that's where you end up with a really dangerous situation because it's like, if you have the wrong officer responding to the wrong mental health call and they end up using a taser on someone, which the OPS has explicitly stated they use in mental health calls, someone's going to get killed. And that's why we need you guys to remove yourself so that we can now have the space to create the safer alternatives. We need the removal of police response because the quality control is not there. And part of the reason for that is there's no accountability for police officers. And that ties into the OPA, which Diane Deans, congratulations. Um, don't listen to Matt Scott. The nerve of him to come out and even say and try to undermine you when you guys have been showing up time and time again to get this work done. Just like they've had every opportunity to show up to the board. They've had every opportunity to engage the public with their side of things and they haven't. And the fact that they're just coming out to say, well, you're doing it wrong. Like, no, 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 like that's just, <laughs> you guys are doing great for that. Like, just don't, the OPA is one of the biggest hurdles for this situation. And that's because you can't hold police accountable. And that's why we have such a huge money sink just in that area of the budget. And I know we can't touch them, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be on the table. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of it. I'm just super excited for this. Like, I'm so excited for you guys to go through and like finally comb out all the stuff. And I just wanted to encourage you guys too. like any money you can give back to the communities will help so many people. Like, I know it doesn't seem it seems counterintuitive right now, like less policing and stuff. But if you can get any money into the hands of the right people, you're going to help so many people. And I just really want to encourage you guys to like, don't give up. Don't don't like get scared by the like the future of it. Just understand anything you can get out of it now will make a world of difference to people and you'll save lives like that's the thing it's just it's just gonna be like i don't know i'm just really excited and um i don't want you guys to give up uh, i think that's it <laughs> thank you thank you very much bailey and i can assure you uh, knowing the chair as i do she won't give up she won't back down and she's not intimidated by but i don't want to speak on her behalf but i and I would want to say the board is absolutely committed to it, to its carrying out its responsibility. Uh, I believe there's a question for you from Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Billy, for your, uh, for your delegations and uh, and all your energy. You, see, you have a lot of energy and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good that you bring that to it. Um, I, it's, it just seems like from all the discussions that we've been having, everybody seems to be on the same page. I think everybody seems to be on the same page. I just... I think that where the problem is, is how do we get there? And, uh, you know, we can do a, a cold turkey flip and then just and, and flip it completely. We can do a transition. We can, there's many approaches to it. And I think that's where the confusion seems to be coming in. I don't think it's, um, I don't think, uh, it, I'll speak on, on behalf of myself, but I don't think any of us um, think that we don't need a different response. I think it's just how do we transition to the right services? And that's the, that's the reason why I'm asking so many questions and getting input from everybody. But uh, I just want to thank you uh, for coming by and for all your energy. Thank you, Member you. Sueda. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. So Bailey, once again, I want, want to thank you for coming. And as Member Sueda said, for your enthusiasm 
and uh, we are absolutely uh, dedicated to working towards uh, uh, seeing, as Member Sueda had mentioned, the transition to make sure the right people are responding to the calls uh, that can provide the best assistance that, to, for people that need it. So thank you very much once again for coming. And so uh, I'll now move on to the next uh, delegate, uh, which I understand um, Mandy uh, has cancelled, Mandy P has cancelled. So the next person would be Keldon Bester. If Keldon is present, if they could turn on their screen, that would be great. Oh, sorry, I just see, I'm sorry. I just see that, I see uh, Mandy has raised their hand. So Kel uh, Keldon, if I could ask you to hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, I had been told that Mandy wasn't present, but uh, so I'll tell you what, if we could, Mandy, if you could hold on, we'll, we'll let uh, Keldon because he's, or he was on the line. Um, okay, Mandy's up, so we'll go ahead with Mandy. Uh, and I, I do apologize to Keldon. I had understood that Mandy wasn't present, but apparently Mandy is. So Mandy, over to you. Um, and sorry, sorry for that confusion. No, sorry, I actually canceled because I was in between work and I'm in between offices, but I, but I tried to make it, so I'm here now, so thank you. Um, so bear with me. So today I, I come into this space uh, as a mental health professional, uh, as a nonprofit service provider who's worked in our most delicate communities for a very for a very long time. And you know, there are many of us that would love to be here today to share and echo the voices of our most delicate communities and how deprived and fragmented and broken we are. But unfortunately, uh, there's a fear of being vocal. So um, just because there's a handful of us today doesn't mean that we are the minority. In fact, we are the majority that continue to do this work that is often under-recognized, under-resourced and underfunded. The reality is that we're starving, especially many of us who are grassroots, who are black and racialized led organizations, who have direct links to the communities impacted, who are doing the root cause work and who are essentially at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to funding hierarchies. Uh, we as a community has been you know, screaming about the pu public health crisis for decades now. We have been screaming about the lack of resources and you know, COVID-19 put a spotlight on years of systemic inequities. Uh, we have ent entertained a massive expansion in policing for the last 50 years or so. So historically we have invited them to address every social issue and including the gaps of education system, unemployment, homelessness, mental health, and youth violence. So what we know for a fact is that despite increasing the police budget every year to police our way out of social issues, we are still sitting in one of the greatest national crises of all time. So what is clear from this is that what we're doing has been working. So when we are asking for a freeze in the budget or to defund the police, what we're really saying is fund the community, fund what we know works, reinvest in real safety, this militarized police approach is an example of a failed strategy. And yet we throw money at this failed strategy, despite the fact that there is no evidence to show what they do and how they do it actually works, given the amount of money they get each year. Um, and each year, grassroots organizations have to meet uh, a set of boot camp rules to sustain funding, to survive, to you know serve the community's uh, actual needs. So I know there is you know, in individuals that will use shootings and gun violence to justify more policing, but the majority of homicides and victims and survivors and gun violence are young people, specifically black and racialized youth who come from historical disenfranchised communities. So we need to acknowledge that gun violence is preventable through a public health lens. And, you know, the police have even said it, we can't police ourselves out of gun violence. So we need to be, you know, investing in um, community healing, uh, preventing community trauma, that's what creates safety and the police don't have the resources or the capacity or the ability to prevent or heal communities uh, source of pain. So even if we're paying, paying them, you know, their solvency rates are low. You know, take Toronto, for example, over the years, they continue to have a bloated policing budget and yet it's raining bullets. They have been, uh, you know, just this year, 354 shootings, 143 injuries and 40 deaths. And, you know, why do we continue to talk about community violence without talking about police violence, you know, the police are not innovative, they can't modernize themselves, they literally have one tool to address everything from sexual assaults, youth violence, gender based violence, mental health, and that tool is violence. So that in itself is a major public health issue. And, you know, we are in a mental health pandemic right now, and that nobody wants to talk about this. No one on the political stage is taking this seriously. And the raw truth is, it will take years and years to recover from the impacts of COVID. And we know that COVID did not play fair. We know what communities will feel the intense burn of this pandemic. We know which communities will have to pay the social and emotional costs of attempting to recover from this pandemic. You know, I work with young people 
I've never seen so much anxiety, depression, and symptoms of trauma. You know, kids are back at school, but, you know, they're back with their brain steeped in traumatic stress for the last two years. And now they're expected to learn and succeed under these conditions. This is our future. This is our generation. So I asked the board, like, this isn't about flipping a switch and having police disappear tomorrow. But I fully understand that that process is is scary. And, you know, we've been conditioned to believe in our hearts and our mind that police create safety. But, you know, their access to weapons and violence is what actually has conditioned us to feel safe. And, you know, we hear about these partners that are willing to work with police, you know, great. But it's also the same partners that have no understanding or connection to the community communities most impacted. So whatever strategy is created will be just out of touch and out of odds with the community's needs. So let's shift the responsibility towards, uh, you know, community safety to the people who are better equipped to deal with this public health issue. And, you know, this budget request does nothing to recognize or respond to the community's needs. It's empty promises to redeem themselves under this false premise of reforming a rotten and cancerous institution, as Chief Slowly has confirmed for us. So COVID-19 was a blessing and a curse. It gave us a moment to reset. It was a wake up call because we have been hitting that snooze button for way too long at the expense of the community. So, you know, I really appreciate the board who's attempted to step up. Chair Deans, you know, for actually doing your job on this budget review, despite the backlash by the president unit who currently has bypassed the system that benefits him to sit on that throne with two criminal charges and argue without evidence that budget cuts cuts would make the, our city unsafe. So. I want the board to be reflective and mindful of what side of this history do you want to be part of because our demands will not change and it will just get louder. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mandy. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are any questions. Yes, uh, Member Johnson. Thank you, Chair. And um, I just wanted to make a comment and really thank Mandy for all her work in mental health. Um, it's a challenging time and I too have been seeing the rise in anxiety and depression in young people and in my patients of all ages. So thank you for what you're doing in a challenging time. It's uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Johnson. I don't see any other hands up. So um, Mandy, once again, I wanna thank you for taking the time in between tasks to, um, to stop in and, and talk to us. Thank you. Um, I'll now see if Keldon Bester is, um, is if I can get Keldon back online. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, and thank you very much. And, and I really do apologize for that confusion, uh, getting no you up and getting it on. So thank you very much. And uh, you have five minutes, please go ahead. Well, thank everyone for your time. Uh, my name is Kelvin Bester. I'm an independent consultant and researcher based in Ottawa, and I'm speaking today to ask the board to vote against the proposed draft budget and instead approve only a freeze. I've reviewed uh, the city budget and request additional information to justify why the 2.86% increase is in the best interest of the city. First, the justification mentions, and this has been discussed uh, previously uh, by, by the vice chair, uh, that we have the second lowest officers per capita of the 12 largest Canadian cities. Um, additional information wondering, is there an ideal number that the board hopes to achieve? And is there empirical evidence to support an ideal uh, popular uh, police per population or however described? Um, second, the justification mentions that focus areas include uh, developing alternative responses to social issues. We've heard a lot about mental health and addiction. Given these alternatives are designed not to include the police, I'm wondering how that factors into a need for a budget increase. In addition, there's a list of the cancellation of the grant for the school resource officers program as another budget pressure. Um, given that the grant supporting the program was canceled, uh, why would the OPS, or it's unclear to me at least, why the OPS would need this funding to be replaced. Additionally, I uh, seek some clarity regarding some specific line items, and I'll walk through these individually. Um, line item 502395 is allocated to memberships. That's about $100,000. I'm wondering if some more uh, clarity can provide what kind of memberships, memberships to where. Um, line item 502650, this is about $60,000 for miscellaneous rentals. Different from equipment rentals, just looking for more clarity on what that actually includes. Line item 502899, there's about a million dollars for police-related services. Again, unclear what, uh, at least to me, what, 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 what makes up that million dollars. 
And finally, about $900,000 line item 505-981 is slated, slated for police-related supplies. And again, that's just an area I'm looking for more clarification. Um, I ask uh, specifically that OPS, OPSB board members and not sworn officers reply to my questions. And with that, I thank you very much for your time today to everyone on the call. Thank you very much, uh, Keldon. Uh, I'm looking to see if there are any questions um, with respect to the specific uh, issues that you had raised. We will be um, going and um, speaking to the, uh, we will be asking specific questions at the end once we've heard all the delegations, but I think it's pretty clear where you stand and, and where your preference is as far as it goes. And so um, I thank you. As I said, I don't see any questions for you. And so uh, I'm gonna thank you once again for coming. Sorry for the confusion at the beginning. And um, we'll go on to uh, our next uh, delegate, which is Inez Hillel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Inez. Um, thank you for coming again today and um, you have five minutes, so thank you. Great, well, I, my name is Inez and I'm here to speak on behalf of the big research. So I'm here to ask this board to vote against the proposed draft budget and instead only approve a freeze. Just before I get into what I plan to speak about, I do wanna address a few things that came up in this meeting. So first addressing member Johnson, it's not trust issues. It's us trying to get state violence out of our communities. So you can't simultaneously build trust while lying through your teeth about where the money is going and holding the city's funding hostage. Second, long wait times have come up a number of times, but that doesn't necessarily need to translate to more cops if you're paying attention to what people are saying. Detasking the OPS from their multiple responsibilities is a great way to reduce wait times. Guaranteed housing, higher incomes, comprehensive healthcare, drug decriminalization, and safe supply which can also be known as crime prevention, are other great ways to reduce wait times. Finally, one last time, all non-police responses, such as CAHOOTS, need to be coupled with a social safety net. Co-production, co-delivery models are not effective. The presence of the officer is still traumatizing to the person receiving care. Police obligations under the Mental Health Act override the ability of the social worker to direct the course of the interaction. There's still a weapon on the scene. I could go on, but I hope you all get the idea. Am I allowed a time? I would like to focus on a question that was asked in the September meeting by Councillor Meehan. So to refresh everybody's memory, on September 7th, on uh, September 27th, Councillor Meehan said, and I'm quoting verbatim, as a councillor in a suburban area where people are crying for more police, and I know it's happening in many communities, I've had issues on the weekends and at nights trying to get an officer. We're so understaffed, and I hate to use the term, but the police to population, we are a growing city, growing crazily. We don't have the police to answer the calls in some of these communities, and the residents that I represent are dismayed and disgruntled and unhappy when I tell them that the police officers in the south end of the city have this wide area to look after. And they just have to wait sometimes. So I wonder, what do you think I should be telling them? Their voices are just as legitimate as your voices. So this next couple minutes is going over what can be given as an answer to the concern, concern constituents of Stitham. And these are also questions that board members should be asking themselves when constituents come and call for diametrically opposed actions. The interpreters are struggling to hear you. Can you adjust your set? Thank you. Sure. Is this more clear? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so first residents should ask themselves, are they someone that's likely to experience interaction with police? Is that interaction likely to be negative? And would they be less safe if rather than a police, an alternative, more specialized service was made available to them? Residents who come to these meetings to call for increased police presence citing concerns about homelessness should ask themselves why they are not calling for more housing. Those who cite concerns about drug use should ask themselves why they're not calling for decriminalization, safe supply, and harm reduction. Residents concerned about traffic should ask themselves what additional benefits does introducing a gun to the scene bring? What does an ideal police traffic enforcement look like? Is that a police at every corner? A police in the passenger seat of every car? Can we not collectively imagine a less violent, more effective way of enforcing traffic rules? 
Residents who come to these meetings to call for increased police presence should ask themselves why they are comfortable with their safety coming at the expense of the safety of marginalized community members. Unlike police, alternative response means that everyone can get help when they need it. It's also crucial to remind residents that a freeze to the budget will not result in the disappearance of police from our communities overnight. They will still have $376 million in their hands, but that freeze could mean more access to supportive housing or health services. The board should be asking those questions. Delegates are reminded by board members that counselors have a responsibility to listen to everyone, that not everyone wants a freeze, and that people who want police increases are valid. No one said they weren't. And yet, you have a responsibility to listen to every member of the public. But you listen, and then you think critically of what is being said. Those community members who come to these meetings to ask for more police begin their delegation by citing which concerns lead them to feel as though Ottawa needs a larger police presence. Rather than hear those concerns, you only hear the call for more police. Here are concerns. We are concerned about the absence of a social safety net. We are concerned about police violence. You can meet everyone's needs by freezing the police budget and actually investing in this community. We're not asking you to implement the community alternatives. That's the whole point of community alternatives. We're not asking for partnerships, co-production models, referral models, diversion models, neighborhood response teams. We're asking you to take a step back. Don't ask us, how do we get there? You're not coming with us. I would like to end by reminding the members of this board that when they approve the 2022 budget, even at frozen levels, they are approving the funding required to hire OPS officers to purchase guns, bullets, tasers, cartridges, batons, uniforms, and handcuffs. When a person dies at the hands of police, that person dies at the hands of resources paid for by this board. I understand that these next two weeks will be challenging and you'll be hearing conflicting information from all sides. Do not take your role lightly. Do not underestimate the consequences of the decisions you're going to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inez. Uh, I'm looking to see if there are any questions for you. Uh, I don't see any. So I wanted to thank you once again for taking the time. Uh, your voice is certainly heard and we are listening. And uh, I do appreciate that you've once again taken the time to come and speak to us. So thank you very much. And uh, I will now ask uh, for the next delegate to, um, to come forward, May Mason. If, uh, if May is present. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Your voice sounds a little... Oh. Uh, can you, is this better? Uh, I'll see if the... If the uh, uh, go, go ahead and, and hopefully uh, we're, we're okay. Okay, yeah, definitely let me know if anyone can't hear, especially the ASL interpreter. As mentioned by many of the delegates before me, countless mem uh, community members expected a reduction or freeze to the 22 OPS budget, as it was mentioned in a motion tabled in November of 2021. In all honesty, I can assume most of the public does not want to be here. Moreover, we wouldn't have to be present today if this past year's interactions with the board had instilled confidence and trust in their ability to follow through with their promises of at least a freeze for 2022. I have a few things around the budget I would like to address, but firstly, I would like to speak to the recently abolished SRO program. After the publication of the Community and Human Rights-led Review by OCDSB and their withdrawal from the local school policing program, the Ottawa Police Service decided to close the program as a whole. I wonder if any of the members of this board have read this review or the, the grassroots report by the Asilo Collective that led to the inevitable abolishment of the program. It is imperative that the board becomes familiar with these reports because the involvement of Ottawa police officers in schools created systemic barriers to education for two-spirit LGBTQ plus disabled and, race and racialized students, a human rights infringement. I do not have time to go into the depth that both of these reports offer. However, it is clear in hard data and in qualitative analysis that OPS officers caused trauma to youth and perpetuated anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, ableism, rape culture, and queer phobia on a systemic level. How can this board and this force confidently build trust in the community when this program has been abolished due to these harms, but the group of officers found to cause them have simply been passed off to another unit? You have promised less policing. You have promised no more expansion and that you are listening to the voices of the community. 
while those voices include students. And in my opinion, active listening would be would mean laying off the SRO officers and so that $3.6 million that mostly paid their salaries could be reduced from this budget. And hopefully at the power of the city council, these funds redirected into the student led recommendations such as youth mental health workers, breakfast and lunch programs in schools and tutor support among countless others. I would also like to address some of the things mentioned so far today. Member Sueda often and others often spoke tonight that it is not sorry, often spoke tonight that the work of the 24-7 emergency crisis and mental health response has simply fallen on the lap of the police. That reality actually has been constructed. It has a historical context rooted in racial capitalism, colonial genocide, disappearing the disabled, and the persecution of queer and trans people. In sum, we live in a society informed by our history and have constructed a reality that values profitable systems of punishment, isolation, and disposability at the expense of care, housing, education, and self-determination of the people. In other words, the reason the police are the only service set up to respond to the concerns you and others have raised, Member Sueda, is because they are the only social service with access to over $300 million and beyond inflation increases every single year. A power granted by the board on which all of you sit and are a result of your own votes. The collective agreement mentioned earlier today cannot be found online. I have spent near the entire beginning of this meeting trying to find it. Nothing beyond 2019 is visible. Please make this publicly and easily accessible as 80% of this budget goes into salaries and the community deserves to know the bounds of those agreements. For one, I know that the OPS has access to unlimited psychological support covered in this, in this collective agreement, yet are also trying to justify spending 400,000 more on member well-being next year. This is egregious. I have to ration my own $600 in student therapy benefits, and I consider myself privileged to even have the funds to pay out of pocket and await my reimbursement, less, let alone have access to insurance at all. I have friends and family who have been on mental health wait lists for months on end. I have literally been sent home from the AR because my suicidal ideation wasn't as bad as the person in a more acute crisis, and they only had one doctor on staff in the emergency mental health department. Again, this is not a coincidence. Coincidence. This is orchestrated and continuing to bloat police budgets will perpetuate this violence. It is time to reduce or freeze the budget because it is time for real change. Thank you, Diane Deems, for promising to go line by line through the budget. Scoff's intimidation speaks to your power and his incapabilities, not the other way around. Thank you, Sandy Smallwood, for showing the community again tonight that you are deeply engaging with this information we present you. Lastly, it has become abundantly clear just how many board members are not valuing the community work being done to educate them this past year. Questions from members such as Sueda and Johnson show that they have not been engaging with the information presented to them, like the Vivek report, over the past monthly meetings. We already take so much time creating and gathering information for you. We should not have to repeat and repeat. And that actually shows how many members are not doing their job. So again, do your jobs, do the homework you need to in order to make the responsible informed choices and follow through with your proposal to reduce or freeze the 2022 police budget. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any questions for you. I don't see any now. So once again, I thank you again for coming, taking the time to come to speak to us. And um, I'll now go to uh, our next delegate, which uh, is Sean Meager. If Sean is present, if he can, there, I see Sean. Sorry, I'm just trying to turn on all of the elements that need to get turned on. Um, thanks very much for um, uh, taking the time today to hear from the community. Uh, like other delegates, I have to say how disappointed I was to see some of the comments made in the media in the last few days. This body, the civilian oversight body, statutorily assigned to the police, is eminently qualified to assess the police budget. And it's precisely because it's a neutral, independent site of sober second thought that it's tasked with that duty. In every municipally funded department or agency, staff put forward a budget that outlines their perspective about how money should be spent. 
Um, when it comes, for example, to homelessness, um, the shelter staff want more shelters and the housing staff want more permanent housing and the income, uh, the social assistance staff want better income supports. Uh, and they're all important, but it's the overseeing bodies that looks at the whole picture, balances the different interests and the different perspectives and makes sure we have something that works for Ottawa as a whole. And I hope no one on this board is discouraged from doing that work. Um, by the comments that were made in the media this week. And there is reason to give this budget, like all budgets, close scrutiny, because there are numbers that bear scrutiny. For example, the salary and benefit costs that are, uh, are budgeted in, um, here rise by $14 million in 2022. That's more than 30% higher than last year's increase. We have that rapidly accelerating staff costs despite canceling offer hirings, uh, officer hirings for last year and canceling officer hirings for next year and freeing up 26 more officers from the SRO programs and schools that were canceled at what should have been cumulatively about a $10 million savings. It's certainly worth exploring why costs go up faster when the number of officers being hired goes down. Um, there are also investments that make sense to at least defer. For example, there are several studies in the last three years that very strongly indicate that the use of CEWs, um, often mistakenly called tasers, don't actually reduce firearm use at all uh, or keep people safer. And despite that, the OPS is currently recommending spending $1 million on new CEWs without a robust analysis about what that investment is capable of achieving for the people of Ottawa. Budget oversight is designed to dig into exactly these kinds of questions to ensure that the budget is as efficient and as effective as possible. But there's another reason for close scrutiny on this budget, which is that the options here might, um, there are other options that might better meet community needs. There is broad agreement that we need significant change. That's there in the public surveys. Um, it's there in the options presented to the board by the community. It's there in the budget documents themselves. But the changes planned in this budget are distressingly low and modest. The current budget plan leaves room for about one tenth of 1% of the budget to be used to fund one pilot in one neighborhood downtown. It also sets aside $400,000 to divert calls to not, from 911 to other providers, but there's no new money for those other providers to take on those tasks, so diversion will be difficult. Even if you include all the new investment of any kind noted in the budget documents and the funds committed by the city from the social service review, the balance is still 90% of the new investment going to traditional policing and only 10% going to change. That may not be the balance that the public was imagining when 73% said in the police survey that they wanted new delivery models for Ottawa. Everyone's concerned about the need for change and several participants in today's meeting had asked if we are ready, if there are organizations that can take these things on in a timely way. And the good news is, yes, there is. The Rethinking Community Safety Report presented a long menu of options for investments that improve safety in every neighborhood in Ottawa. Investments that provide Orleans and Barhaven and Canada with new programs, but also investments that free up police to attend calls in those communities. Expanding crisis support in Ottawa community housing could uh, to 24 seven um, on the existing infrastructure could displace some of the 14,000 police calls that go there, largely for non-criminal and non-violent incidents. Um, that means more officers available to address things that police are uniquely um, skilled at doing. Um, uh, a new uh, crisis van would provide um, support for uh, homeless people, but also some place for the 911 diversion calls to go so that their staff to divert calls to and free up officers for other tasks. Similar things can be said about investments in community houses and community-based mental health. Today, it was asked several times, what's standing in the way of those changes getting off the ground? And the answer is very simple. It's investment. This budget, like previous budgets, allocates far, far more of the new funding available into traditional pol policing, far more than it invests in alternatives. And the fact is that if there is no shift in investment, there will never be a timeline long enough. There will never be a set of partnerships robust enough. There will never be alternatives that are ready soon enough to create change. Change comes when you decide to move investments to the things that make change. This budget is an opportunity to make that change by not taking the maximum allowable city increase and supporting the city in taking up the opportunity to create exactly the alternatives people talked about today. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. And I, I also want to take the opportunity to thank you for that report. Uh, 
I did read it. It is a very thorough, very comprehensive report. It was very impressive, uh, the lengths to which you'd gone to uh, not only determine where the possibilities were, but to cost them out. So really do appreciate that and highly recommend it for anybody who hasn't read it. It's, uh, it's certainly a very good read. Uh, I'll look to fellow uh, committee members. Are there any who, uh, Chair Deans, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Smallwood, and uh, thank you, Sean, for being here today. Um, in that report that uh, I think you penned, um, there was sort of a smorgasbord of options that um, we could perhaps pick and choose from if we wanted to move to a more community response. And I'm wondering if you could just indicate to us how many of those options or even if you could send me an email and tell me more specifically which ones uh, would be ready to go early on in 2022 if we wanted to choose any of those options from the smorgasbord or how many would take more time and how much time would they take uh, to be ready to implement? You're on mute, Sean. I'm, I'm muted. Um, I'm happy to do that. And, and we did take a look because we had been hearing people saying, well, you know, these are all great ideas, but, but we're not ready and it has to happen later and, and we need to take more time. So we had a look at, at the, the um, items on that menu um, and about a third of them are, are things that, that exist um, now on infrastructure that's expandable um, that you could implement in 2022. Um, uh, in, a, in a really timely way. So about, there's about $10 million of investments um, uh, in uh, things like community-based mental health, um, homeless outreach, um, expanding the number of youth outreach workers um, uh, that not only are readily accessible and available for expansion, but have a direct impact on the number of um, calls police are required to do that fall outside the range of traditional policing, um, thereby not only making sure that the right person is going to the right place at the right time, but that the police are freed up to uh, you know, arrive at the calls in suburban jurisdictions that so many folks have talked about today. Um, uh, so you kind of end up feeding two birds with one seed because you get the better programs in all neighborhoods all across Ottawa, and you get the better response times as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair uh, Deans. I don't see any other committee members. Uh, Chief Slowly. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, Sean. Thank you for your presentation. Um, as we've discussed in the three meetings we've had, I think over almost five hours worth of meetings in the last uh, month or so with the coalition, um, I appreciate there's some really good information in the report. Uh, we will have to agree to disagree on, on how some of it was presented. But I think at its core, we have we have agreement. Um, uh, again, maybe for more for the board's edification. We have had three separate meetings with Sean and the coalition. Um, uh, interestingly, um, uh, all of the coalition members were invited by Deputy Chief Bell at the start of the year to participate in some meaningful way within the guiding council uh, to devise to, de to help to divide. Um, uh, develop and implement uh, a, a pilot or, or a strategy. Um, um, this report was undertaken at the same time as the, as the guiding council was being developed uh, for whatever combination of reasons, and it's been explained to us. Again, we'll have to agree to disagree on some of it. Uh, the coalition chose not to directly involve the police service to provide uh, data, to provide information, and actually to potentially support the report, sign, be a signature to the report, and move it forward. Over the course of the time that the report has been developed, uh, the guiding council has been developed uh, through your help uh, and leadership chair. It's uh, moved on to the community safety well-being plan. Um, again, this is one of those many opportunities that if we had started back in the early part of this year, we might not be talking about the possibility of doing something early next year. We might be already six months into the implementation of some new project, some type of pilot that could be evaluated where we could actually have data that could look at um, uh, further resource detasking and resource reallocation. Um, we have not been doing that. So uh, again, well, I thank Sean for his delegation and the very useful elements of the report that he and his team have provided. Um, we should just start working together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. And uh, thank you, Sean, uh, for I your presentation. 
If I can just fill in some some details on, on well, that. I don't want to I don't want to get into a to and fro and back and forth on this because sure. it's not meant to be. The, we've heard from you uh, and we'll be hearing from you again and uh, look forward to. And I think you're going to be providing the chair, chair deans with some information. So you can certainly take that opportunity to uh, increase uh, the, the what you uh, what information you send her. Thanks very uh, much. So uh, thank you very much, Sean. And uh, I'm going to move on now to uh, Luke Willett of the Orleans Cumberland uh, Community Resource Center. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Luke, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you for coming and please proceed. Alors, euh, merci beaucoup. Mon nom est Luc Ouellette et je suis le directeur euh, général du Centre de ressources communautaires Orléans-Cumberland. Euh, je représente un des 12 centres de santé de ressources communautaires qui ont récemment publié le rapport « Repenser la sécurité communautaire », aussi appelé « Rethinking Community Safety Report ». As uh, Sean mentioned, this report found that we currently send police to do a lot of things they are not the best trained or the best prepared to do, and that's expensive and ineffective. The report lists a wide range of relevant and effective services, over 30 recommendations that could be scaled up to better respond to and reduce crisis in Ottawa and at a, and a low, lower cost. This makes sense in a context where there will be no new officers hired and there will be a need to free up officers to do police work rather than tying them up doing social work they are not the best trained or the best prepared to do. To illustrate the number of calls that police respond to that would be better served by social services, police reports of any kind and less than half, about 43% of the calls they attended in 2019. Investigative staff attended three crime scenes per month per person and each officer attends to about three incidents per year that involve ongoing crime or danger. We need to move beyond our current paradigm of policing and reimagine re community safety together. In response to the budget inclusion of a pilot project in the Byward market, in our discussion and research to inform rethinking community safety report, we found that any work to promote safer responses to community crisis should not be done in isolation as a one-off. Any new investment should be situated in the community and lead by the community, and pref preferably by grassroots organizations led by racialized individuals. And by community, we mean communities across the whole city of Ottawa, including suburban and rural neighborhoods, not just one urban neighborhood. It is also key that any work to improve community safety include a long-term commitment to progressive reform. This is not work that can happen in one pilot project. We understand that when it comes to transformative changes, people get nervous. They don't know what to expect. What will foster confidence and trust is a substantive investment for funds that are administered by the city's existing social services infrastructure to be rolled out in collaboration with place-based services that are most familiar with the local needs and the communities across the city of Ottawa. Equally important is to get a clear commitment to a public multi-year planning process that moves us to a new model and that sends the right person to the right place at the right time. New funding should not be token. Small amount that go to the end special projects. They should not pick one neighborhood as the winner and leave the rest of Ottawa out. In order to be taken seriously, any new funding should go to a reasonable cluster of new services spread across the city and administered by the city of Ottawa through an appropriate process to distribute these funds to the most appropriate services and an equitable way. It is also important to recognize that the current plan to set aside one-tenth of 1% 1 of the police budget for one and pick project in one neighborhood won't get far far to free up the police police to do the police work. This small project will not provide proofs of concept to the city. If the Ottawa police services are serious about implementing a project and evaluating it, one small pilot will not be sufficient. Given that communities in crisis can often be better served by social services, and given that many of these issues that police respond to are not violent or criminal in nature with over 40% of calls 
are for social issues. And given that community services offer a range of interventions that more efficiently, effectively respond to community in crisis, dramatically reducing arrest, inter incarceration, and court time, we think it's time to look beyond the traditional criminal justice approach to community safety and to fully explore its current effort to adopt a community safety and well-being approach. And I guess to respond to some of the questions raised before, and especially by member Sueda, the last uh, project that was put in place in Canada was in Montreal. Last fall, uh, the mayor Valérie Plante put in her uh, platform that she would put a pilot project in place in neighborhoods in, in Montreal. A few months, it was only a few months was needed to do that. Her pilot project in Ville-Marie was put in place in September. And now the new mayor elected with 52% on, of the uh, votes on Monday night will implement a full um, crisis response team across Montreal starting in 2022, investing over 16 million by the year 2023. Montreal is not far away. It's another model and the population wanted that to be in place. So I hope this information can be helpful and we could look at what they are doing also in, uh, in Montreal. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you yes, very much. Uh, um, I saw a hand, but I'm not sure where. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the screen all switched around on me. Um, uh, Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Luke, for your, for your delegation. Uh, actually, um, uh, I'm interested to know more about uh, what they've done in Montreal, and I think we could probably do that through way of, uh, um, you know, you can refer us to some, some information on that. But I guess the question I have for you is, have, have you or any other organization that you know about engaged the city of Ottawa with similar programs? So if I understand your, your question is that with similar programs, so the, the report itself present over 30 recommendations that is supporting, uh, recreating these crisis responses for mental health or for youth or for homelessness in Ottawa. There are over 50 organizations that can provide these services and the report Rethinking Safety in Ottawa is really targeting and ident identifying like Sean said before, uh, for example, what are, there's about 10 examples here of, of direct and proportional and impact that we can have if we start moving right now as the chief slowly suggesting, but we need to do that and significant investment to do so. The city has a part to do. And, and we, what we are seeing here is that doing, doing police in a situation where we don't need police uh, is not necessary. Uh, beginning of my career, I work as a child protection worker. And uh, like I said to Chief slowly in our previous meeting, 80, 85, 90% of the time, I didn't need the police. But in some situation, I needed the police to work in their lines and for me as a social worker to work in my lines, my lanes. So I think it is important to have a uh, boat involved here and to have an investment that will support the people in our community. Okay, um, I was, and thank you for that clarification that actually answered the second question I had for you, but I, the, my, I guess it wasn't clear my first question. I was more referring to the, to the uh, uh, program that you talked about in Montreal. Um, have, it has a similar program like what you described in Montreal have any, has anybody put that forward or is that part of the report that you were talking about to put a similar program forward? Well, Montreal is the newest project that was put in place, right? So it's not different than working with a 24-24 uh, uh, 20, 24, 24 hour service project. So uh, seven days a week. So it is done in other communities across Canada and the States. I think it was discussed this afternoon. I think Montreal is the, the last one. We have um, agencies in Ottawa who can do that. So we need to build on their expertise, build on what they can do and to provide them the, the service they needed to work in their lanes and to provide that service. Okay. Now, the, you mentioned uh, the mayor of Montreal is, a, is, a, is investing $60 million, I believe you said, uh, or they're allocating $60 million to this program. Did that... Did that come uh, as that new funds that the city is dedicating to it, or did they remove funds from the police or another uh, municipal program to fund this initiative? If I and I, if I, I apologize if I don't have the, all the details, but I think it's a mix of both. And at the same time, uh, the province is investing some of it at the same time. And I know city council has tried to get the province engaged last year. 
uh, following the uh, vote for the 2021 budget, the mayor's office wrote a letter to Premier of Ontario, uh, but uh, there was no response to that. So again, we're working in, in all these, these areas. And to, ref and to respond to some of the questions before, there, there, there has been a lot of requests in the past, but there was never a clear, clear menu presented to, the, to, the, to your board and to the city council about things that we can do. It's clear right now. And organizations, we interviewed over 50 organizations. They are willing, they are ready to move right now. It will not happen overnight. It will not take a year to happen. It could happen really fast. It really, we're, we're, you are really wanting this, this community and uh, us to move ahead, we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Member Sueda. Uh, Chief. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Luke, thank you for your presentation. It's good to see you again. Uh, just for clarification, Luke, I'm not sure it's been referenced a couple of times by yourself and, and the previous speaker. Uh, Ottawa Police is not, has put nothing in our budget in regards to a pilot project in the market. We are very interested in doing a pilot project or whatever we want to call it. If pilot is not a good word, uh, a new program, some sort of new initiative, whatever we want to call it. Um, and we'd like to do it in as many different places as possible. Totally agree. If we can do one in an urban environment, one in a suburban environment, one in a rural environment, that would be far better than just doing it in one environment. We should actually do it in some sort of a structured way so it can be evaluated. So we can have a pilot site and a neutral site. So you can compare between one area that is similar that got a, a particular new investment and one area that has a status quo. So I think we're in agreement again. We come back to is, let's do it. If my understanding is correct and my people are just looking at uh, the Montreal site, the Montreal is a in-service model where social service workers are working with the Montreal police to provide enhanced social services and police services. It is not a cahoots model where it is entirely a separate organization delivering a portion of services. But either way, Luke, either way, let's get going on doing something in multiple locations in the city. We keep studying this, we keep talking about it. Ever since I've come here, every single person I've talked to, can we start doing something together? Let's get going. Yes, and I think clearly Chief um, was glad to meet with you, I think on two occasions or maybe three. Uh, the, world, the word that come to my mind here is trust, okay? And I think we, we are moving towards that, but we need to work and building that because the model, the, I think the model and the, um, uh, the market, I don't think we uh, necessarily were aware of all the details. Uh, and that's, I'm representing a suburban and rural environment where we also need to have uh, that kind of pilot and we need to have our own challenges. And I'm only one community. I'm not talking about what happened, what's happening in the South and also in Western Ottawa. Uh, so we have to include the rural and suburban communities and these pilot projects. Totally agree. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, Member Johnson. Thank and you. Member Swede, you still have your hand up. I, I didn't uh, go to you because I, yeah, okay. So Member Johnson. All right, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Luke, for your excellent presentation. In the budget, there is a discussion of a 5% call uh, redirection so it sounds like we really, there is an intention to do this in 2022. So, you know, just, just adding that, adding that component from the budget to really, you know, the plan is there to do it. So, so action, you know, we should be at the action stage on this. So. Thank you very much, Member Johnson. Uh, I don't think you weren't asking a question, I assume. You were making a statement, Member Johnson. I was just making a comment because okay. um, there's, you know, been comments about how long and things, but it actually talks about it in the budget. So, right. um, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chief. You're on mute. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Montreal project um, is described as. Uh, Mayor Plant, this is Plant, has uh, promised to hire an additional 250 police officers by the end of 2022. This yeah, includes this includes a pledge for an extra $110 million to tackle gun violence. 
to ensure the safety of Montreal neighborhoods in addition to a $15 million emergency fund. It also promises to give $5 million to local community groups that work to prevent gun violence. Mayor Plant has said Montreal's police force will be outfitted with body cameras. There's no uh, dollar amount for the body camera investment. We are not asking for body cameras. Um, and this pilot project, which will send social workers to respond to some 911 calls without police is also promised to be expanded to all boroughs. But it seems all of that is an increase to staffing and the operating budget of the Montreal Police Service. Okay, I think we're heading down. I don't want to get into, this is heading down a sidetrack here. We're, we're never going to get through with this meeting if we uh, get on too many uh, sidetracks. So I want to thank you, Luke, uh, for your comments. And I'm sure that all of the board will look forward to uh, the report on what's happening in Montreal when it's, uh, when it's made available. Before I go to the next uh, delegate, I did want to mention there was a question about the arbitration award. And the one that's posted on our, uh, the collective agreement that is on our website is from 2019. However, um, the, and it will take a bit of time to update that, but the award is posted and all the, the new provisions uh, are contained in the arbitration award, which is on the on our uh, website. So uh, anybody, if they just take a look at the arbitration award, they'll see all the new provisions. Um, so uh, I'll now move on to our next delegate, which is Aaron O'Neill. I see Aaron, is there, uh, is your microphone? Aaron, can you unmute yourself? I'm not uh, hearing Aaron. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not hearing Aaron. Um, it appears your mic isn't working. I wonder if you could try reconnecting. Uh, it would appear your mic's not working. Maybe if you just try disconnecting and reconnecting again. Still not hearing any audio. Perhaps there's a problem with your microphone. Uh, if, if you'd like to try to reconnect again, what we could do is uh, is try to go with the next delegate and uh, and then Hopefully you'll be able to um, maybe try a different device or if there, if you have such a thing or just try reconnecting again. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. So I'll ask uh, Jen, if Jen is present, if Jen could uh, connect and we could uh, try to get back to Aaron after Jen. Okay, can we hear me? Yes, I can. We're good. Okay, so I'm not as energetic as other delegates just because I'm a full time student and I have like three classes today and a bunch of assignments. So I do apologize. That's <laughs> great. Um, we have five minutes. So please. Yeah, please no, I'm, I'm fucking tired. But <laughs> um, so hi, my name's Jen. Um, so we're approaching our third year into this pandemic. Um, and as we're approaching to the third year, which is crazy to think about, more and more Ottawa re residents are actually struggling to pay their bills, put food on their tables, and just meet their like day-to-day -day needs, right? 
And I've seen this firsthand being on the streets with people, doing outreach, handing out food and other essentials to folks. And the overwhelming uh, response that I hear is that they're really struggling and that the struggle is harder every day. Um, and the services that they rely on or have relied on in the past are also struggling to meet this demand. Um, other services in the city are also struggling to have enough food for everybody, to have enough, uh, you know, toiletries for people. Um, it's, you know, and it's just, it's been awful. And while this is happening, OPS is asking for more money. So last year they were granted $1.5 million into their mental health strategy. And a question I kind of have, and I think other people have, is where has this money gone towards? You know, where has this money gone? Because um, I haven't seen it. And I think that other people in the community haven't seen it. And I think that we have a right to know because we're paying essentially for this through our taxes of like seeing the result of that money. Um, and in the 2020, 20, ugh, 2022 um, draft budget, they're asking for $2.2 million into quote, culture change. Um, again, what does that mean? Um, because more training isn't conducive to a decrease in police violence, racial profiling, police brutality. Um, and we've seen this, and there was a, a meta-analysis that came out in 2017 that kind of talked about that more in the American context, but it does kind of translate here as well. Um, no amount of training will fix a culture that is embedded in the fabric of the system. Policing is by its very fabric and the way it operates is, is one that is, of course, racist, white supremacist, um, is exists to, to protect the colonial and capital interests. And so there's no way to have these anti-racist, anti-sexism, you know, workshops for officers for them to be not racist or not sexist because the, the actual system is racist and sexist and, and anti-Black and et cetera. Um, which is what, you know, systemic oppression is. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's one thing. Sorry, I'm really like fucking tired. Um, I also think it's really disingenuous and insulting to reduce us as just like a small group of people who represent, who don't represent the rest of the city. Because those who are most impacted by policing um, through those lived experiences, people who are Black and Indigenous and racialized, um, people who are unhoused, who are street involved, people who use drugs, uh, people who are marginalized and other ways are the ones who are most impacted. Um, and so their voice should really matter more than the voice of like Karen living in the suburbs who's calling the cops on black and brown teenagers playing in the streets at 9 p.m. Um, so I think, and in addition to that, those who are often most harmed by police don't feel safe to speak up. So that's why they're not coming to these meetings because they don't wanna be re-traumatized. They don't wanna be gaslit as we've seen multiple times of delegates being gaslit when they talk about their very true lived experiences are not these things that happen in in theory it's 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 real and it happens and it's traumatizing to folks um i've heard members on this board and as well as the chief himself talk about how these changes can't happen overnight and that it can't be done and this and that and all these excuses but at the same time they're asking for money for more money and they're saying well we can we can do the mental health response we can do gender-based violence responses we can do all of this but when these like grassroots movements and organizations are saying well we can also do this if we just have the funding um and i will quote <laughs> slowly he said this january i think during 12 2016 uh which was reported in the sun on the 15th he said until policing stops being focused and driven on the reactive enforcement model it will continue to be exponentially costly and I'm using your own words, and that is absolutely true because policing doesn't prevent crime. It doesn't stop crime from occurring. All it is, is it's reacting to something. And so really, if we wanna prevent crime, and if that's the interest we're in, we need to prevent it at its cause. Why are people stealing from people's cars? Why are people assaulting others? Why are people committing quote unquote crimes? And if we're addressing those economic, social, and political reasons, <laughs> then we don't need police. Um, and so ultimately, yeah, I'm not interested in just freezing the budget. Um, I think that, you know, some people want that, but I, I believe really in abolition. Um, and so for me, it, it's decreasing the funding. I think getting rid of the amount of cops that we have, 80, I think 87% of our, uh, the budget goes towards uh, compensation. Um, so people's paychecks. Um, I want to live in a city that ultimately pri prioritizes people, care, and community, and not private property and capital. Um, we can and should imagine a world with pol without police. Um, and yeah, that's that's all I have to say. <laughs> thank you. I'm really tired. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jen. I really appreciate you taking the time to to join us and uh, make your your voice heard. Um, I'll look to members if there's anyone who has any questions of anything that uh, Jen raised. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands up, 
now. So thank you, thank you, Jen, for coming and taking the thank time. Thank you. Um, I, I'll try to see if uh, if Aaron, uh, who we weren't able to hear before, if Aaron uh, can reconnect and maybe we can hear from Aaron now, if that's possible. Uh, Aaron, you're shown as muted. Now you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry about much. that. No, that's okay. Thank you very much. I'm for not very good at the tech stuff. Neither am I. So really appreciate you met you were you kept at it and uh, you have five minutes. Please, uh, oh. please proceed. Okay. So I did also just want to bring up um, some of the same um, points that some other people have mentioned. The reason really why I wanted to speak it in part is because of what Matt Scoff had mentioned about this whole business of activists. I'm not an activist. I'm someone who lives with very severe mental health um, issues. Um, but the people who keep showing up at these meetings speak for people like me, people who can't come to these um, meetings, people who can't speak regularly. Um, and I think that it's important to mention that, um, you know, just the fact that he, he, he said that was really, to me, offensive. Um, and I'm sure it was offensive to the people that he made that comment to. So I wanted to mention that. Um, so I would like to ask the board to not increase um, the budget again this year and to realize that police aren't equipped to deal with community concerns that they are regularly faced with. They're not the people that we should be relying on for mental health crisis calls and they do not provide the resources um, to prevent the kinds of crime that communities want eliminated. Personally, myself personally, um, I've had Ottawa police at my apartment uh, twice in the last six weeks. And I can tell you my neighbors definitely did not want to have to have the police come and deal with my breaking down. Um, they would have preferred a different alternative, but there was not one available for them. Um, and many times I've had the police show up over the last two decades. As I said, I live with very severe mental illness. Um, so uh, over the pandemic, I've been seeking, oh, sorry, I've been seeking more support um, and there really isn't any because over the last two decades, I have used every available service in the city. I am on ODSP, so my options are very limited to what is available for me. And that's something that I do sometimes wonder, um, Chief Slowly, you are in a position of power. Why are you not using that power to, to um, to pressure the province into um, providing more funding for people who are on ODSP. I, I get so little money to live. Talk to your provincial counterparts and say, hey, guys, increase the funding for people like me. You have people that you can talk to as, a, as, in a, in a, as somebody who has power. I don't. So that would be something that I would like to see you do as somebody who has power and some of the other people who are sitting at this board meeting, use that power and say, please, please fund ODSP because that's ultimately, it's, it's a, an immoral um, amount of money for somebody like me to be living on. Um, and I realize that that is without, it's out of the city budget, but you can speak to people who are in those positions to fund ODSP. Um, so although my doctor has referred me to Salus, which is a community agency, one of these agencies that we talk about that is scraping by for more funding, the wait list uh, for that on their website says three years, if I even qualify for service. I've been with Salus before, I may not qualify a second time. Um, I have gone through Access Mental Health. I was declined for the Royal Ottawa, one of their programs twice. We don't really know why. Um, no, nobody can really get answers there. I've reached out to my MPP. 
I've gone to CMHA, um, Family Services Ottawa, even the Ottawa Police Mental Health Crisis Team cannot get me any more resources because they simply do not exist. Um, I'm asking the board to really take a hard look at why people like me fall through the cracks. The last time that I lost a social worker, I was homeless and lived at Sheps for a year. Um, I'm trying to prevent that now and I'm scared. I'll be honest with you, I am terrified that if I don't get social work, I will be in the hospital at Sheps or involved in the criminal justice system because that's what happens to me every time I lose social services. Um, I don't wanna have the police come and take me away in handcuffs, which they've done before. And they take me away because quote unquote, this is a direct quote from an officer. They were tired of talking to me. Let's go, you're going to the hospital. I am tired of talking to you. Direct quote from an officer. I've had to talk to duty cops at my door and explain the difference between someone like me who is autistic and neurodivergent versus someone like them who is neurotypical. They don't understand, they don't have the training. That's fine, but then why are they at my door if they don't have the training? I don't understand. So I'm asking you again, Again, if you continue to say that they don't have the resources and they don't have the training, please do not give them any more money and put that money into agencies and resources that do have the capability to deal with these issues. Okay, um, I'm, I'm just gonna leave you, you with a quote. Wrap it up, if you could just wrap it up, Erin. Yeah, the, I'm just gonna leave you, um, I'm just gonna leave you with two quick points. Um, I do think it's my belief that some members of the board are resistant to change simply because they're afraid of change. That's it, they're just afraid. They don't wanna change because they're afraid. And a quote that I will leave you with from Abjit Naskar said, politicians and police are not the makers and keepers of the law, people are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Are there any, uh, would any of the members like to uh, ask any questions? Uh, yes, Member Johnson. I just wanted to really just thank Erin um, for sharing your story with us today. It is helpful to hear your perspective. And I think it is really important that ODSP is funded well. So I will uh, certainly look at ways to uh, add my voice to that. Thank you very much, Member Johnson. Uh, Chief. I'll join, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll join Member Johnson in expressing uh, gratitude to Erin for her delegation today. Probably the most important and impactful one for me that I've heard uh, today and in, in many different board sessions. So thank you, Erin, for your courage and, and, and your own eloquence in that. Um, for me, the, the narrative, albeit five minutes worth of obviously a lifetime of struggle for this individual and, and Resilience in that struggle, because obviously to, to be able to be here today shows a remarkable level of resilience at the, at the individual level. But there is a there is an, a, an important set of messages that Aaron has shared, and I'm sure it's clear to everybody on the call. What Aaron described in five minutes, the Help Seeker report um, described in over 50 pages. It is an insufficient social safety net. There's no one area of failure. It's failure across the entire ecosystem, across the entire social safety net that causes people like Aaron to never receive truly the right services from the right agencies, including the Ottawa Police Service, in order to manage her very difficult and challenging life to a level of, of decency for herself. No doubt, the vast majority of the times that she's called the Ottawa Police Service over the last 20 years, if there had been another set of social service options for her, that would have been a better way for her to get the help she needed. And if in the next 20 years we fail to correct that, then we've all collectively failed, not just the board, not just the police service, but the entire city of Ottawa has failed. I come back to it again. There's a great example of a person in this city that if we could get a pilot project or some sort of new initiative going with a range of social services providers, we could start to provide very real and practical options for her that she has not yet been able to experience over the course of the last 20 years. 
And the only thing stopping us from doing that is just getting together and getting on with it. Specifically to Aaron's uh, call to action for me. I, I hear it and I will do even more than I've done before. As I was leaving the Toronto Police Service, I was assigned as a deputy chief to work with the then li provincial liberal government to review the entire provincial system around mental health and addictions, including child and adult. This took place under the direction of then Premier Wynne and under the leadership of then um, MPP, Dr. Eric Hoskins. I spent my last year with the, the Toronto Police on that provincial project. It included many of the current leaders from the city of Ottawa who were involved in the mental health and addiction space. I carried on that work as a private citizen when I went to Deloitte and concluded my support to that project. The recommendations in there were passed on to the current government, and I don't know to what extent those recommendations have been implemented, but it included significant funded increases to programs and, and policies, some of which uh, Aaron spoke to. I referenced earlier on this call, uh, Chair, I reached out specifically over the last year to the province to seek a million dollars plus in funding. They cut a $987,000 check. It went into the healthcare system and I have no idea how it was spent. I don't know if a single dollar of it went towards the types of supports and services that Aaron was talking about. I spent the vast majority of my senior working life in policing advocating for just that at all three levels of government and I will continue to do so. And I am joined with a command team of leaders who have committed themselves similarly. And we have been active on that fundraising front, capacity building front, since this command joined together two years ago. We'll continue to do that in support of the board. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I'll just uh, remind Aaron, it's, it's not a question and answer. So, um, but there are additional questions for you. Uh, Member Nerman, um, you had a question, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a brief comment, uh, Aaron, thank you for coming and your delegation. And I will echo what uh, Member Johnson and Chief Slowly has said. It is, it is a truly courage of coming and sharing your story. And I can say with conviction, we all are not that courageous as you are. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Member Nerman. And I don't see any other hands up. So I think I'll, I'll join the others in thanking Aaron very much for coming. Uh, obviously your words were uh, resonated with, uh, with uh, the members. Uh, so I do thank you for coming. And um, I just want to say this now is the, uh, the uh, includes, this concludes the public uh, portion of our, our meeting. Uh, we did provide an option to council members who wish to register to speak and have a time to ask questions of the committee or OPS staff to be held until after all of the public delegations have been concluded. So we'll now proceed with those council delegations. Uh, and we have uh, Councillor Matthew Flurry, who has registered to, uh, to speak. Um, and I've just been advised through the wonders of, of uh, electronic communications that uh, Councillor Flurry doesn't seem to be online. So uh, with that, uh, this, this therefore then concludes our registered delegations, and we are now going to open the floor to questions from committee members, uh, followed by board members. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, Chair Deans. Um, uh, Member Nerman, you have your hand up, but we'll be dealing with committee members first, or was this a process thing that you wanted to but that's fine. After the committee members, uh, I can be. I can. I can be after the committee members. Okay. That's so we'll, we'll start with Chair Deans, then we'll go to Member Johnson, and I'll ask some questions, and then we'll go to uh, the other committee members. So Chair Deans, over to you. You're on mute. Right. <laughs> I know Sorry first time using that. Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Okay, I, I have a number of questions. I'm gonna start with the ones arising out of the public delegations today. Uh, a number of delegations asked about specific, pardon me, um, budget line items, including um, memberships, um, miscellaneous rentals, police-related services, and police-related supplies. So it, I, could I have a breakdown of those line items and, and what, the budget ask is specifically for. Yeah. Uh, 
Chair Smallwood, Chair Deans, I'm not sure if you want us to respond as- I, It's up to you, Chief, if you want to give us a written response, if that would be better. I, I don't think there's an expectation that you would just automatically have the answers to these questions because obviously we're you're just hearing them, we're just hearing them for the first time. So did you yeah. want to answer some now or did you want to, to as you had promised, you would get back to us uh, uh, in, in, in good time with the answers. So I, yeah. I'm open to whatever you prefer. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and and so that that will be my caveat for all of this all of this area. I will just quickly defer to uh, CAO Deputy Chief Bell to see if he has any any answers at this moment. Otherwise, our commitment to get you those answers by Monday is still on the table. Uh, Steve, do you have anything specific to the chair's questions? Um, yeah. So actually, what I could do is take you through a bit of the process that's in the book. I do think on a line by line that we'll actually have to take to Monday to go through, drive down, and be able to provide you that information. So if if you look at these four different categories, uh, memberships, miscellaneous rentals, police related services, and police related supplies, those actual numbers that were quoted by the dele delegates are pulled from page 112 of the budget book. Now, what page 112 of the budget book is a roll up of all um, the finer information as each of those sections, each of those uh, line items would be attributed to different areas within the organization. Um, miscellaneous rentals is, is a good example. There are different uh, sections within within the organization right now that would actually contribute to miscellaneous rentals. Um, our um, quartermaster stores actually rents units to store our protect our PPE equipment. There's other um, or investigative units that rent the rent um, facilities to be able to store vehicles. So what you're seeing here is a roll up and a line of all of the different uh, budget groups that have contributed. Um, what we will do, Chair Deans, in that is we will actually pull all of that information for those four categories. We will provide you that answer in writing as it goes by a different org unit. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, my second question um, uh, is one posed by Councillor Riley Brockington during his delegation today. He asked how we measure the success of our neighborhood resource teams. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, the neighborhood policing strategy is two years old and it's a constantly evolving piece of business. The NRTs, the neighborhood resource teams, are the most visible and accessible element of that. Uh, we are looking at improving the overall evaluation of that going forward, but I'll turn things over to Acting Deputy Chief Jamie Dunlop to speak to how goals are set on a uh, daily, weekly basis, monthly and annual. Um, the first thing I would say was establishing the NRTs. When I arrived here, we had three pilot projects. We uh, expanded them in the 2020 budget and then have in the 2021 budget expanded that to the suburban and rural areas of the city. That creates the, the citywide access to NRTs. The neighborhood policing strategy is an overall strategy that is still in its development. So with that, I'll just ask, uh, Deputy Chief Dunlop to provide a, a better uh, explanation around the NRT specifically in terms of expectations and measurements. Yeah, thanks Chief. Um, and uh, so with the NRTs, each, each team, as you know, they're in whatever specific neighborhoods, they're kind of geofenced within those neighborhoods. Sometimes they cross different wards and what have you. Um, there's crime analysts or business analysts that look at social disorder things, crime, traffic, all those type of things that may happen within those areas. They also take information often from, from counselors. Um, for example, I know with, with Councillor Brockington, I have a long list of regular meetings that are both our community police officers that he has, as well as NRTs to discuss issues. So they're often, the, the measurements they often have is, is actually done on uh, often a weekly basis uh, by identifying these trends, things that need to be addressed directly within the community. Um, and we, we accept them and, and begin now to start looking at the longer, what, what do we wanna see at the end of a year, for example, within a particular neighborhood. I think it's important that as we go, this is what we learned after these two years, each one of these neighborhoods where we have established the NRT, although the model remains fairly consistent for each, the needs are very different for each one of these communities. And I think we have to establish those metrics on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, working with the 
potentially the res certainly the residents, the BIAs, as well as the city's uh, councilors' offices and things of that nature to establish that. The, the issue often comes too is in the measurement piece is how do you establish sometimes that something's not happening? This is what happened to the old NHOs and why they disappeared. How do you establish things that don't happen um, uh, as opposed to things that are happening? So this is why we, we lost the NHOs and we realized when we lost them, what was missing um, clearly from, from those departments. So we need, to, we need to find a proper matrix uh, from looking at it from a longer term perspective. Certainly the pandemic has interfered with some of that. I certainly think we want to find a way of, of uh, identifying public trust as being a main component in these, each one of these neighborhoods, which means we also have to establish that baseline for the NRT cash zone. So um, I think going into this year is something that we definitely have to sit down and work with more, uh, more stringently in terms of identifying those longer term matrices. I can certainly talk to on a week to week basis where there's um, home takeovers or things of that nature within a certain neighborhood and how the NRTs work with the communities to address those, those type of things. But then beginning to, to have those longer term goals established is still a matrix that we need to work on and how to establish that. There is an ongoing a study as we know, but I think using even tapping into other academia um, to begin to actually drill down within these neighborhoods, maybe will be a, give us some assistance on what it is that we need to draw upon in, in order to, to get that flavor. Okay, so just, you. Chair, just uh, if I could just finish off on that. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Um, the study that was being done by Linda Duxbury out of Carleton University, unfortunately, the, the global pandemic and its impact here, um, it was very much a, a, an in-person type of exercise. So that has uh, significantly hampered us getting results out of that to apply for this year going forward. We have recently engaged the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance, which is the predominant think tank in Canada that's been supporting uh, the most innovative efforts around community safety well-being, integrated uh, hub service delivery models. They've been supporting uh, the Edmonton Police Service specifically around their rollout of community safety well-being and their approach to neighborhood policing. And so we've engaged them this year to help us to build out our overall framework for neighborhood policing and the evaluation tools necessary to provide better information. That's part of the ongoing improvements of the strategy. So when could we expect a report to the board on a matrix and um, how you're going to measure it and outcomes and all of that? Because we're a couple of years into this program now and, kind of, I, and I get there's been a pandemic, but I'm also a little bit surprised to hear that we don't have a system in place for measuring it. Uh, we do have a system in place for measuring it. The system that was in place was affected by the pandemic and it has been a significant impact on every aspect of society. Recognizing that we've engaged another agency that has broader experience, a specific experience and broader experience in this area and that is CSKA, the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance. To answer your specific question, Chair Deans will endeavor to start providing you quarterly updates as, you, as the board requires around the progress of the implementation of the neighborhood policing strategy, more specifically the, 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 the NRTs. Again, as a reminder to the board, uh, the restructuring that we did in 2020 included the creation of a community safety well-being directorate. We're currently in the process of hiring the, hiring the director of community safety well-being, and that will be one of the primary responsibilities of that new director. It'll be a civilian member, not a sworn member, someone who knows Ottawa and has credibility and an academic background, who will be able to start to build out that strategy and the reporting requirements for the board and the community alike. Okay, thank you. And maybe you could just very briefly um, explain to me what the expected outcomes of the NRTs are. Expected outcomes is uh, very briefly, they, they are our upstream prevention uh, model. Uh, at the last board meeting, I talked about um, we have some 13% of our, of, our, of our police services now engaged in NRTs, crime prevention officers, youth outreach officers. That is that shift from a reactive model that has been quoted so many times from that 2015 article. That is that fundamental shift of resources to an upstream model rather than downstream enforcement model. So more prevention, more opportunities for partnership within those neighborhoods and across the city now with the expansion of the program to suburban and rural. Through that visible accessible uh, NRT program, we can then start to do that range of, I'll call them in air quotes, pilot projects that so many delegations have talked about here today, 
where we embed them with social service providers, youth outreach providers, mental health and addictions providers, whatever the particular needs are in that geography or that demography. Ultimately, that fits into the community safety well-being plan that's been approved by the city. And that reporting mechanism rolls up through the service to the board and from the service and the board to the city's community safety well-being plan. That has been the vision I articulated for my first day in office. That has been literally the foundation of every new investment we've asked for, for from the board over the course of the last two years, two budget cycles. And that, those are where the, the, the majority of our investments that we're asking for in the 2022 budget come from. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Chief. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and zip through these because I have a lot of questions, but, and I know lots of other people do too. Uh, Sean Mahar, when he spoke, um, posed a question around the school resource program. And um, he proffered that since the grant was canceled, why do we need the program to remain in place? Oops, sorry, uh, Chair, I'm going to put uh, Jamie Dunlop on cue there. The, the grant, um, was a funding for, I believe, one officer. Um, so that money is gone. That was a pressure that we had to relieve as part of the overall budgeting process. Um, the, the program has been canceled because the largest partner from the school, school the four school boards declined to continue with the program. Um, there was some information shared earlier on about the report that went into it. It is not accurate information. And I do recommend that people do read the entire report as well as the minutes of the trustees of that board as to why they made their own decision to cancel the program. The SRO program is canceled, but we still have hundreds of thousands of young people in the city that require services and specifically services of the police. We are still getting calls for service and in fact, increased calls for service from all of our school boards for police officers to come to the schools to address public safety issues. There are still a mandatory requirement through the, the school boards and provincial legislation for the police to partner with and work with school boards. And we still have young people who are at home, at community centers, who are victims of crime, who are committing crime, who themselves are struggling with the mental health and addictions issues, where parents and the kids themselves are calling our police officers. Those officers are working as hard, if not harder now, than they were before. We've now switched them from a, strict, a straight day shift to days and evenings and weekends, so we can actually provide better coverage to our young people in this city. The problems of youth did not disappear with the ending of the SRO program. Jamie, if I missed anything or misrepresented anything, if you could top up on that for me for the chair. No, thank you, Chief. You did a very good job there. Uh, but I mean, in inclusion, again, these are youth issues don't disappear just because of the SRO program per se. Um, the, the amount of work that they're now doing is uh, has allowed to see a more of a community-based uh, working directly with a lot of their services. But don't forget, we have a lot of youth serving providers. We still have diversion that's, that helps with us through the Boys and Girls Club. We work with places like U-Turn. We work with places uh, like Cornerstone, U uh, YSB, all these type of things. The youth officers that are dedicated to youth and they were very well accepted within the school program. Um, never been a complaint against them. They are all very youth oriented. They're actually specialized and trained uh, to help deal with youth specific issues. And they spend a great deal of time working with community based programs, some of which I just named, as we all want, want to see, um, but they get their referrals from us. They have a very strong uh, support for our youth officers and had great concern what was going to happen uh, regarding to diversion and referral. So um, we also have mandatory uh, protocols with the Ministry of Education that the schools still have to follow in terms of notifying police for a great deal of things. Um, so despite the fact that we don't have an officer necessarily assigned to a school, or in our case, there was a series of schools, 24 schools, where principals had and other administration had the ability to tap into them for various things, um, they now have to be more proactive in contacting our youth service, but we still have to respond to calls for service uh, to the schools for certain type of things that are listed in those protocols. Um, as well as you're all talking about, I know uh, Councillor Meehan had a particular problem around traffic safety around schools. These are extra support in and around that piece for to ensure that the safety around the schools remains in place. Um, so there's a, there was a lot from the SRO program per se that still has to be maintained by ministry standards, but not to mention, quite frankly, serving our youth properly and ensuring that they're actually getting services, referrals, and in, when necessary, diversion um, to help them hopefully uh, be supported in life as they grow. So there's still a lot of youth work. Right? There's not a service that doesn't have a youth component, and that's where we're continuing. 
Do we measure somehow, like, can you kind of demonstrate to us the um, youth related work that is happening, how it was happening before the cancellation of the school resource program and now, like, can we quantify the, how? Yeah, what, what, we certainly are tracking. I can certainly give you a, well, I can't provide that right now, but I certainly endeavor to get that to you, sort of show you a week snapshot of what's currently happening and the amount of work that they're actually doing. Yeah, just for clarification, though, just for clarification, Chair, um, we can show you the demand numbers around the types of calls and numbers of calls that have continued since, I guess, June of this year when the program was canceled. If you're asking whether or not we've done a full evaluation of what's transpired since the cancellation of the SRO program, no. We had almost no uh, time to prepare when the decision was made. We had to make a decision in, in, in a state of flux, and we're still trying to um, recreate a youth strategy now that we don't have an SRO program. So the, the short answer is, do we have an evaluation framework for you? No, we don't. Again, that's a component of the community safety well-being director when they come in. They will continue the build out of our youth strategy that will include an evaluation strategy and that can be part of the ongoing requirements of reporting that this board has and it can feed into the overall reporting of the city community safety and well-being plan. Okay, thank you for that answer. I want to talk about uh, one of the proposals in the budget is outsourcing the uh, collision reporting center. Um, the draft budget includes 550,000 and five reduced related to the proposed outsourcing of the center. I guess my concern on this one is, I don't recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't recall any reporting at all to the board on this. And I don't actually recall any public consultation. And I don't know how the board would evaluate the impact on the community of taking out this collision reporting center, we haven't done any public consultation on it. So I'm just wondering if this is the cart before the horse and I'd just like to hear your reaction to that. Yeah, Chair, I'm just queuing up Inspector Hugh O'Toole who was responsible for the research um, and the consultation on this. It was one of the, actually the first reports I received as Chief of Police. Uh, okay, apparently Hugh's not here, so we'll provide you, I'll have to provide you uh, more specific answers after this, but it was a long-standing research that, that predated my arrival here. Um, this is part of our efforts this year to try to find those efficiencies against the pressures that we've reported on in the budget. And so, yes, we've had to, in real time, look at every way we can offset those pressures to reduce the financial impact of the budget in 2022. We've also heard repeatedly from the board, specifically from Vice Chair Smallwood, that outsourcing is a key component of, of his expectations and the board's expectations. So we'll provide you with a more fulsome review of that. Oh, I'm, I'm advised Rob Bernier is available to provide a little bit more depth to that answer right now. So if we can, I just ask if Rob Bernier could be brought into the panelist section and ask him to top up on anything that I've provided. Chief, uh, it's uh, Hugh O'Toole, I'm on as well. Okay, thank you, Hugh. We couldn't find you before. Hugh, can you top this up, please? Uh, absolutely, Chair Deans. A uh, good question. I know this has been included in the um, in the budget report as as an item for 2022. Um, I led the customer service review project last year, which was sort of evaluating the the changes from the strategic initiative around civilianizing the front desk services and sort of the 2.0 version going forward. And one of my recommendations was to outsource collision reporting to Accident Support Services International Limited. Um, they're a sole source provider in Ontario. Uh, currently, 28 of the moderate to, to major police services in Ontario use this company. Um, there's no cost to the OPS. Um, you know, their services are paid for through the insurance companies that subscribe to their program. And basically what it does is it replaces our collision reporting model. It outsources it. Um, the insurance companies like it because it's a value added for them because they facilitate claims and reduce fraudulent claims. So, you know, all my numbers were sort of pre-pandemic. Uh, I know uh, Superintendent Bernier sort of took it forward um, because the, the recommendation did go on pause because of the pandemic, because of there was at one point, I think we were a 75, 80% reduction in, in actual collisions. So, um, but, you know, now we're starting to see pre-pandemic volumes creep back up. So I know Inspector or Superintendent Bernier had done a, a revision of the numbers, but basically what it came down to, Chair, was 
the collision reporting model that we instituted in the auto police service in 2012 was costing us about a million dollars a year in budget pressure and, and, and overtime, budgeted overtime costs to maintain just by the sheer volume. Um, so outsourcing would, would reduce a, a line of revenue on the sale of collision reports because that money would go to ASIL, but it would relieve us of about $600,000 in, in staffing pressure and allow for the reallocation of some civilian positions at front desk services to other areas of need within the organization. Um, why you're seeing it now, because it is relevant for 22, but I understand from Superintendent Bernier, the plan was to propose this to the board either at the end of Q4 or very early in Q1 2022, because ACIL does not implement um, during winter months, just because of the volume of, of collision reporting. And, and you know, they want to make sure they get it right by implementing in, in low de demand times. Um, there was a, one other point I wanted to make. Yes, around consultation. So when I did the project, so ASIL is the sole source provider. We did an RFI through the city, a couple of tire kickers, but nobody with an established process. Um, again, all the other police services in Ontario are using this product. Uh, the only exceptions right now are Ottawa and York. Peel uh, actually very recently went to ASIL. So um, it's a tried and true product. I didn't go into public consultations because, because it's widely used and accepted in every other municipality um, with good customer service ratings. Um, I, I believe, and, and for the reasons that will be outlined in the presentation of the board, it's an enhanced product for the board, for the, for the service, for the city, for the community, for insurance companies, for the ministry. Um, but we, we did extensive consultation with police services that use this product to assure ourselves that we we're moving in the right direction, including uh, relying very heavily on the Waterloo Regional Police Service, who are the most recent uh, agency to, to switch to um, ASIL services. Okay. Is, thank that, you. Uh, is that helpful, Chair Deans? That's very helpful. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, just three more questions. I'll try and be really brief and then I'll um, uh, stand down so other members of the board uh, can ask their questions. There is uh, on pages 29 and 30, there's a statement, a new services investment target of $1 million to continue to deliver on the board's strategic direction with an offsetting efficiency target of $1.5 million to achieve that outcome. Um, so I guess my first question is, is that the same $1.5 million that's mentioned on page 18? And can the service provide additional details and clarity? So we have to, in, I gather in 2023, 2024, 2025, we have to invest a million dollars every year to save a million and a half. I'd just like some detail around that. Hey, Chair, this one I'll, I'll refer to uh, Steve Bell and or Kathy Murray to provide some additional detail if we need to kick that over to the Monday report that's still on the table, Steve. Get my mute. Yes, thanks, Chief. Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Dean. So um, what that identifies in that table, so it's table six you're referring to on page 28, is that correct? Just to make sure I'm referring no, 29 to 29 and 30. Okay. Um, there, it's uh, not yeah. a table. Yeah, so, but I, I do believe it's also referenced in, in table six. So what that identifies is year over year in our forecast, we've, ident we've identified that we continue to need to find efficiencies within the organization. There's the ability for us to do that. It also, and that's the efficiency line 1.5 you're seeing year over year. The new services also identifies that year over year, we have emerging pressures on us to conduct uh, different types of investigations, invest in different higher trend, either crime, social disorder issues, look at how we can refine our services in terms of working with partners better, like we've talked about largely today to deliver mental health services. So th that is what is captured in those that new service line. We identify that year over year, we will need to make investments within new service streams, new ways of delivering our services. And we will uh, fund that within those efficiency targets, as well as contribute to the decrease in our overall budget year over year. So I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, my next question is about the privacy lawyer who is in the uh, new services on page 24. Um, it's going to cost the OPS $100,000 in 2022. Uh, it's an investment to support the community diversion initiative and the community safety plan, but it's our understanding that the community safety plan is the city's responsibility. So I'm wondering if there's been any discussion with the city to pay for uh, these legal services. Um, and if so, what's the result of those discussions being? Yep. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll start that off. And again, I will invite uh, uh, Steve to top up on, on the second part of the question. Um, this is not the hiring of a lawyer, although we did consider that. This is the um, accessing services of, of a legal firm that specializes in privacy. Um, literally in every effort we've, we've seen in the last decade to, um, to provide integrated services or the, or the transfer of services, the referral of services, it will come down to some sort of an information sharing process that informs a memorandum of understanding, uh, a standard operation practice, uh, SOP type of relationship. Uh, we need to share information with partners so that they can actually take on the demand from us and report back in an accountable way around how that demand was met one way or the other and vice versa. So it was one of the biggest inhibitors for Prince Albert when uh, then uh, Prince Albert Chief um, uh, Dale McPhee was trying to create the first integrated hub table based on the Scotland model um, uh, that was that's still the best overall model for harm reduction and integrated service delivery in the world. Privacy issues and privacy lawyers were the biggest enablers or disablers of progress around those partnerships. We anticipate that will still be the, the problem here when we move into these demand detasking integration referral diversion processes. We don't want to hire a full-time lawyer because that will probably double the cost and then, and then contribute to the overall uh, cost curve of policing. We want to see if we can get these, these SOPs and MOUs set up through uh, a rented uh, option rather than a bought and employed option. We have considered whether or not the city's lawyers could be able to provide this on an ongoing basis. And we figure in the first year, there's going to be a huge push for us and the city to get these programs up and running, the information exchanges up and running, and that the current stable of, of capability at the city level will not meet us. The pressure is also on us to produce these 5% per year uh, demand transfers. So we have to have the capability in-house, or at least within our control, to be able to move these forward in an expedited manner, as we've heard multiple times over the course of this call alone. That is the basis around which we're seeking the money to get that extra privacy legal advice to get this process going as fast as we possibly can. Steve, I'm not sure if anybody, you or anybody else can talk about our efforts to assess the, or, or, or Christiane, you know, to assess whether or not the city could provide these services, but we did consider it. Um, yeah, so thanks for that, Chief. And um, I don't see Christiane on, so I think I'll be answering it. Um, so Chair Deans, yeah, it, it's a great point. We will continue to work with David White and his team to see if there is that expertise within the city. Um, if not, we'll look to work with them and leverage some of their preferred rates that we have within other, um, other members of the legal community to provide work and expertise around this specific area. So it's a point well taken. It is something we will continue to work with the city on. Okay, thank you. Um, my final question is just around pay, table four on page 18, the $1.9 million in cost reductions and uh, efficiencies and the reduction of 15 FTEs. Where can I find a breakdown of those FTEs and those uh, and that $1.9 million bucket? So, Sorry, uh, Chair. Steve, have you got have you got that page? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, Chair Dean, that, that's something we'll be able to provide you in in the written response to the specific areas that are being looked at and the cost savings associated with them. Okay. Thank you. Um, those are all my questions for now, uh, Chair Smallwood. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Dean, and uh, I'll go to uh, Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Smallwood. Um, Okay, so I have a few questions as well. 
Um, so on page 10, there's a statement and I'll read it. The end state vision of this multi-year change strategy is to build a police service where every community member and every service member feels respected, supported and accepted no matter their background, status or circumstances. So this strikes a chord with me. My question, are we investing in the right areas to achieve this? Thank you, Member uh, Johnson. Um, uh, I'm glad you share that vision. Um, it's 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 a stretch, but I think that's what vision statements are supposed to supposed to do. Um, the short answer is yes. I believe we are. Um, it started with the board and, and its search for a chief. Um, it started with the board's support to the construction of the command team that's in front of you and the senior leadership team. Uh, the budgets that we've put forward in front of this board since my tenure here have included the, uh, from an operational standpoint, that shift of reactive and enforcement resources to preventive and, and partnership focused resources. At 13%, I believe we are the, we are the most upstream staffed and modeled organiz police organization in Canada. I stand to be corrected. If we're not number one, we're at least in the top three and trending towards number one. Our commitment to partner, we've said it over and over again, um, we recognize that trust is a factor that is keeping some people from coming to the partnership table right now, but we have long-standing partnerships. We have new partnerships like the, the Guiding Council, and we are encouraging all partnerships, particularly in the areas of advancing that community safety well-being piece. You've heard me advocate literally every month to the board around the urgent need to establish the community safety well-being plan for the city. I was so happy to receive that news in October that it's finally been approved. And we've had tremendous support from the board and the chair, sorry, the board and, and specifically the chair in advancing that. Those are all incredibly important efforts. Our neighborhood policing strategy fits in with the community safety well-being plan. We'll be able to start to now really move those calls off of the police service into other agencies, assuming, assuming we have partners who come to the table and want to start to do that work together. And that's been brought up over and over again in terms of the internal changes, because that's the external sense of better service, more trusted service, more needed service, not necessarily by the Ottawa Police Service. Internally, we have to change the culture and the structure. We have changed the structure of the organization by some 70% in the two years that I've been here. It includes creating the Respect Values and Inclusion Directorate, uh, Directorate which is currently led by Dave Zacharias, the substantive of Acting Deputy Chief Isabel Granger. We've substantially increased the diversity of this organization while building out a full equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy through RVI. We've diversified the organization at the, at the grassroots level by the most diverse recruit class we've ever seen. And we now have the most diverse senior leadership team and command team ever seen. Diversity alone is not a substitute for culture change, but it is a needed ingredient and it is couched in a larger equity, diversity, and inclusion plan the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Action Plan was presented in January of 2020 and has continued to receive commitments of resources through the budget process. This year's budget continues investments on external service delivery change and internal organizational change. I'd be happy to break down each of those investment areas for you, but they are well laid out in the actual budget itself. And if you need additional information around the business cases, we can provide that for you. Hey, thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive answer. So a second question I have about the public consultation. Um, so public trust has been eroded. Distrust of the Ottawa Police Service has gone up by 19% since 2018. What are we doing to improve the trust and build more bridges? Are we doing enough to build trust? Thank you, Member Johnson. Um, and at some risk, I think it does bear speaking to. Public trust in public institutions has been eroding for 25 years. It has had a major impact because of the global pandemic and other global issues, global warming, ongoing uh, mistreatment of Indigenous communities across the world. The trends in the Ottawa Police Service hold true for the, all the other police services. We've heard reports from Dr. Vera Etches around de declining trust and, and, and similar issues in the healthcare sector, 
We've seen reports from the provincial education sector. This is across the board. And having worked in the private sector, we saw the same issues around trust in private sector institutions. This is not unique to the police service. It's not unique to any other public institution. It is a fact. Declining public trust in public officials, elected officials, and public institutions has been an ongoing trend for over two decades in every Western-based democracy and society. Now, what are we doing here in the, in the Ottawa Police Service? Because trust is the number one ingredient for the ultimate sustainable success of change in the police service. I won't repeat my answer to your first question, but all of that are trust building efforts. We brought in Ruben Tomlinson to look at trust within the organization. We brought in Diversity Pro to look at our overall approach to equity, diversity, inclusion, both internally and in terms of our service delivery. In fact, we just had a command meeting today where Diversity Pro is helping us develop a very customized engagement strategy for some of our most low trust demographic communities in the city. We're gonna pilot it at two ends. One, a community that very much wants to work with us. While they have low trust, they have a high desire to partner with us. Another community that has low trust and has cur currently said, we have a low desire to work with you. We're gonna try these new engagement strategies designed by this external firm of experts to help us to get new tools to use to build trust internally and externally. Much of the cost of the new investments are around the recommendations that have come out from Diversity Pro and Ruben Tomlinson. It's the cost of implementing those recommendations that are embedded in the majority of those internal change elements. So are we doing enough now? No, but we've done a lot more in the last two years than we've done in the past. This budget speaks to those needed investments to continue to accelerate that process of internal trust building and external trust building. Okay, thank you, Chief. My next question uh, is on page 23. Um, actually, sorry, I'm gonna do my questions in a different order. I'll come to that one last. So I'm gonna to go to page 18. There is a 5% target for the call redirection target in 2022. And um, I think this is very important to a lot of our delegates and our counselors and board members. So in table four, it shows a $1.9 million cost and 15 FT reductions shown. Um, and is that related to this call reduction target? So that's one question. Maybe I'll just keep going on the next one. How confident is the OPS that reduction can be achieved in the first year? Thank you, uh, Member Johnson. I, I, I'll ask uh, Deputy Bell to consider the relationship between table four and what you cited as the, the paragraph at the bottom of page 18. Um, as it relates to the 5%, Again, we've, we've tried to, to demonstrate progress year over year, 5% in, in 2022 through to 15% in 2024. There is a big caveat again, and I've said it a couple of times. If the Community City Safety and Wellbeing Plan is, is robust in its implementation, if we can draw the right combination of partners to work with us on that demand or tasking transfer, and if we can get good evaluation to demonstrate that that transfer has occurred, it's sustainable, and the organizations we've transferred to, to it can, can maintain that demand and grow with us over the course of that 5, 10, 15%. Those are stretch goals, but they're, they're doable. Why 15% after three years? Because that's as high as we've seen the best model in North America, the CAHOOTS model, get to over three decades. We don't intend to take three decades, but we know we can't do that in one year. So we've, we've set reasonable stretch targets, assuming we can get an overall city plan, supported by specific partners with good evaluation to demonstrate the sustainability of that transfer, we believe that we can then meet those, those targets. Now, whether or not those targets are tied to that line item in table four, I'll turn to Deputy Bell for that answer. Yep, thanks, Chief. Uh, thanks, Member Johnson. So um, the 2022 efficiency targets or uh, call reduction targets are not directly related to that 1.9% other efficiencies and reductions. What we'd identified is even some of the most optimistic uh, projections today would take, it would take at least six months to establish a proper system of call intake, call uh, referral, and then call response and closing. So we didn't actually incorporate the 
um, the, the savings that could that we would achieve this year in our overall efficiency targets. Yet, if we hit the 5%, they will help to contribute to it. Hope that answers your question. It does. Um, I wonder if in the information you're providing on Monday, if it wouldn't be too much trouble to provide what an estimate of that 5% reduction would be. Uh, one additional question about that. Will there be additional investments in subsequent years be required? And can you give us an estimate on the size of these investments? So uh, it's all around the call reduction. Uh, I guess some of that will depend on the nature of the partnerships we form and how that process that Deputy Bell just described. Um, for instance, if we're able to, as, as, we, as was presented in the Help Seeker report, if we're able to use the backbone infrastructure of the police service communications and call taking center, then that could facilitate the transfer and it will not increase costs to any other agencies, whether it be the city as, a, as an entity or other social service providers. We've heard many delegations say, we don't want any involvement of the police service. Well, then that would mean that other service providers have to have their own call taking dispatch center that can work on a 24 seven basis. So I come back to it again. If we have partners that come to the table, can look at it from a strength based process, even though they, they don't like everything that we do, but they can look at it from a strength based uh, perspective. They can see that we have existing backbone infrastructure, capital funding and staffing on an operating side that can accelerate that process of demand transfer, integrated service delivery, while reducing the cost across the entire ecosystem. That's a central part of what the Help Seeker report was trying to say. We have a lot of money in the system. We have capability in the system. We're not coordinating the use of those resources and the, re and the use of those capability to achieve more optimal outcomes and use money more efficiently. So we're hoping that people will come with that spirit of partnership. Once we get them established, the evaluation will be critical to see how much demand has been transferred and how effectively has it been transferred to those other agencies. We should be able to start at that point looking at what that resource change and difference is and then have a discussion around whether those resources go to, to supporting that. I need to put a very important caveat here though, and it is in the board report. There is a reduction of resources and then there's a repurposing of resources. We currently right now have zero capabilities, zero dedicated resources around cyber related crimes in the nation's capital. We have a fraud section of I believe four people to support literally tens of thousands of frauds that happen to small, medium and large sized businesses across the city. The vast majority of which we do no investigations whatsoever. It's an insurance form. There are huge demands on this organization from the community that we're currently not servicing at all or extremely inadequately. So again, it's a simple equation to say, well, if you're not doing these mental health calls, the money can just go. Well, the money may have to go to other demands that we're currently not meeting at all or insufficiently. We also don't know, and we've heard it from many delegations, we don't know the impact of COVID. I can assume we're gonna see a rise in a range of crime and public disorder issues from partner assault to sexual assault, Yes, violent mental health incidents. So we, we still have to consider what does the next several years look like post pandemic in terms of demands on the policing. And nobody has a crystal ball for that right now, any more than we know what the demands will be on the healthcare sector, the education sector. But when I talk to professionals in those areas, they know there's a big bubble of pressure coming at them that they can't describe and don't have the adequate resources. We're no different from those other sectors. Fair enough. Okay, thank you. My next questions. Um, so in table one, um, are the efficiencies and reductions being used to fund and staff the new services on that chart? And I'm sorry, Member Johnson, I, what page were you referring to? Uh, it's table one. I'll tell you the page. Page, for this one. page seven. Thank you. And, and your question there, Member Johnson, sorry. Sure, absolutely. Now that we've got the right table. Are the efficiencies and reductions on table one being used to fund and staff the new services on that chart? 
And then I have a follow-up question once I clarify this. Uh, the short answer is, is I believe no, but Deputy Bell, would you like to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, it, to go through this chart, uh, if you look at the maintained services line, so that's our collective agreement commitments, our um, inflation pressures, that comes in at $14.7 million. As we look at our tax rate increase, we have uh, incremental requirements of $14 million after we go through all of our efficiency exercises and our investments. So for me, the, sh the short answer is yes, uh, in order for us to be able to meet our inflationary and contractual pressures, it took all of what our 2.86 and 1.7 um, assessment growth would would take anything that we've looked to invest in within the organization from a new service perspective, from uh, continuing on the our approach to change uh, initiatives had to come through efficiencies found internally. So as you can see, new services is $5.2 million in investments, and we have an efficiencies and reductions line of 5.1. Okay. So then what is the contingency plan for funding the new initiatives if the efficiencies and, re and uh, reduction targets are not met in 2022? So, uh, Chief, do you want me to start with that? Yep, please go ahead. Steve. Okay, uh, for sure. So, um, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, what we've done is we've actually entered into what we think is, is quite an ambitious yet achievable efficiency targets. We've spent uh, quite a bit of time through the year through our work with our FAC working group, um, through FAC reporting and board reporting, doing a more uh, in-depth, detailed dive into the budget to look at areas where we believe we could find efficiencies. Uh, we've laid out ambitious targets. We've had those discussions at our FAC working group. But in those ambitious targets, we do believe that they are achievable through the year in the work that we are going to do and have already started to undertake. Excellent, thank you. Okay. And then I have one more question. It's my final question. Um, it has a few parts. What is the number of staff attrition we are expecting in 2022? Steve, again, if you could. Yeah, ab that. absolutely, Chief, I'll do that. So for 2022, we have a total number of 89. So attrition would come into um, a dip, couple of different areas. The main area that we look at would be around retirements. Um, and I'll remind the board that we report on these on a quarterly basis through our workforce management report. So um, from a retirement perspective, we have up to, sorry, we have 89 members in 2022 who will be eligible to be retired. We also know over um, a, a number of years where we start to track them that not every member who is eligible retires in their first year of eligibility. So with that, we we anticipate between 40 and 50% of those members that are eligible will retire. So that puts us at a retirement attrition of between 35 and 45 <coughs> members. So we usually start, we try and plan around that 40 member attrition on a year. Uh, beyond that, we have a much lower attrition rate, but we do have an attrition rate uh, relating to separation from the organization as well as resignations within the organization. That is a number traditionally year over year that is well under 10 members. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And I guess my other question then is that um, with that staff attrition, are you going to hire to move the needle on the Ontario Police Service Board and OPS's strategic plan or just replace the staff? Steve, you're on a roll. Please keep going. <laughs> oh, I'm, my apologies, Member Johnson. Somebody was just uh, talking to me. Can, you, can I ask you to repeat that question? My so, apologies. No problem. So is the plan for the attrition loss, is the plan to hire to move the needle on the strategic plans of the OPSB and the OPS or just replace the staff? So what I could tell you in the, in the, uh, the draft budget that we've put forward, there's no growth numbers. So in order to, um, we had anticipated last year and in our forecast to look at a 30 member growth within the organization as the pressures came in, as the dialogue around the building of our budget 
uh, emerged, we took those 30 growth positions out. So anything that we hire within the organization next year would only be for attrition. And in that attrition, what we'll do is, uh, as we do all the time, and with every position that retri- retires, we actually do an evaluation of that to see what is the best fit. Is it a needed position, continued needed position? Is it better provided? Um, is the, could the position or work better be done by either a civilian or sworn member? So there's a complete evaluation that's done on that as we, as we go through the process. But th- the short answer to it is, as people retire, we will look to fill those positions, but there'll be no growth in the budget. Okay, okay. And I guess really what I was a little bit asking as well is just, um, you know, the, at that point, as we look at, you know, the, the, the goals and the priorities, you know, there's a chance for just um, continuing to look at where the staff is best used. Even if we don't have the funds, to, the funds aren't there to grow, there's still an opportunity to move the needle on the uh, strategic plan with that. Oh, so, so absolutely. And I think... Um, I think um, you answered that actually. Yeah, I was just yeah, restating no, it. Sorry, yeah, I wasn't Okay, meaning. good. Just, just a, just a caveat on that, though, Member Johnson. We, 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 the board, the board has yet to announce its strategic priorities. It, so, as of right now, we, we've been, we've been over the course of the last, well, since the, the existence of the current plan, we've been putting resources in that direction. Um, I don't want to presume what the board's new strategic priorities will be, and whether or not we'll need to be able to repurpose resources. Yeah and realign them with that new set of priorities. Um, if the new set of priorities are very different, we, we may not, it may not be just simply a hiring piece. It may be a, a lot more around knowledge, skills, and capability. So again, there's a little bit of the caveat in there as to what the new priorities will be over the next several years and how we'll be able to align those resources. But for instance, if we're able to, to replace every member that goes next year, civilian or sworn, outsourced, what level should they be at in terms of a rank and classification? And you know, where do they work? Is that in partner salt and SACA because VAW is still a priority? Or does that go towards an internal mental health staffing unit to support our, our members' mental health and wellness? It depends on what your priorities are and how we can repurpose those attrition hires against that. And we still have the steady demand of what's coming in on our front line and the other parts of the organization to consider in that equation of what do we do with each individual hire? Thank you very much for all those answers. Thank you. So I'm finished now, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I do apologize. I have a series of messages that are coming in, uh, which is making things somewhat confusing for me to, uh, but I, because I'm trying to pay attention to the answers, the questions and pay attention to the messages that are coming in and I can't do both at the same time. So I'm gonna suggest that I read my questions, but I think to a certain extent, some of them were answered. And so I will, uh, I can forward them to you, um, but I, I don't want you to, uh, to go ahead and answer them now, because as I say, I think I may have missed some of the answers when I was trying to deal with some questions and comments that were coming in um, at the same time. So my first question was, uh, with respect to, uh, and this is one I could hear that you were discussing at the same time I was trying to deal with the messages coming in was explain how the OPS considers whether to civilianize or outsource positions or services. I know Chief, you were, you were discussing that uh, and the comments going forward, can the service provide an update on how civiliza- civilianization or outsourcing was considered for all retiring positions as part of the quarterly workforce management plan. So I know you discussed that and that will be part of, I think, a further discussion we have. My second question was with respect to uh, page 34, a description of a new service uh, entitled data-driven service optimization that will cost 700,000 to improve the collection and use of internal and external data to improve the optimization of OPS resources and service delivery to the community through an IMIT strategy. Is this cost only to produce the IMIT strategy or will some implementation also occur? Can the service provide detail on the anticipated costs in future years of the IMIT optimization implementation once the strategy is being completed? Then the third question, which uh, 
I have in two parts um, is with respect to the culture uh, change strategy. And I know that um, you were discussing that and the, the, it, since it carries the largest cost of new services at 2.2 million, um, the uh, investments part of the ongoing cultural change strategy that will result in the implementation of the reports and findings of various reports. And I wondered if, I know you discussed it, so I'm just wondering if, in the, if you could give us an answer when you provide the answers, just uh, which I assume you will break down. There's uh, four new FTEs, in, including hiring two lawyers to respond to the RT recommendation that OPS establish an independent office of workplace investigations. So I just wondered if you can give us a breakdown. Is the 932,000 for the compensation of these four? And if it is, then what is the balance of the money for? So uh, I don't want the answers to those now because I, I think we'd like that as part of the, the answers you're proposing to give us in writing. And that would be helpful because I think all of us will need time to digest it. There's an awful lot coming in at the same time. So um, if that's okay, if, if we could just add those into the answers you provide when you provide them. And yeah, that Jared, would... Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, if you could forward that to us, because yes, there's a lot there, if you could forward the, the, the actual wording to us, then we'll commit I to get the information. I absolutely will. That will allow us to go on to uh, Member Nerman, who has been patiently waiting for, uh, for his chance to ask questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so I have a few questions, maybe three or four. Uh, Chief, as, you, as uh, you would know, I am not a member of the FSC working group and not privy to the discussions held during the development and preparation of this draft budget for the past several months. I would be very interested to know if adequate provisions for staffing, intelligence, and other tools have been kept for guns and gang unit to keep our city safe. I would also like to remind or that I have been raising this issue and presently one of the inquiry I raised a couple of months ago is still outstanding. So I will be very interested to know the position. And in this regard, I will also say that I will draw your attention to page 21 concerning the new services where 5.2 million have been proposed, which goes from page 22 to 27. However, I don't see any allocation to this unit in this present budget. Okay, Member Norman, thank you very much. Um, I thought we'd responded to your inquiry around the guns and gangs unit, but if it's an outstanding inquiry, it's definitely on the list that we review with the board uh, executive director and that, that information will be provided to you. Um, I'm gonna uh, put Isabel Granger on, on deck to speak to the, the staffing levels in guns and gangs unit, in the guns and gangs unit specifically. Um, we, uh, we still have 28 positions that were budgeted, approved and budgeted for 2021. Uh, and as we talked about earlier in, in the, uh, the, the meeting here today, uh, traffic is a number one priority. Guns and gangs and the effect of, on public safety is often cited as one of the top priorities in, in the majority of the sub suburban and, and urban uh, areas of the city. Um, so if we're able to continue hiring that 28, a, portion, a, a significant portion of that will go to upstaff our currently understaffed guns and gangs unit, as well as the intelligence and other investigative supports that are around that. With that said, I will turn things over to Acting Deputy Chief Isabel Granger to give you some more details. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Member Nimmin, it's a very short answer I will give you. Right now, the uh, Guns and Gangs Unit is, is at 60% uh, staffed. So you can imagine with the, uh, the, 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 the volume of, of, uh, of related uh, calls for service and, and for investigations and for um, work in, in, in trying to meet this demand, it, it is 60% staffed. Um, I don't know what, what else I can tell you uh, uh, with that, except that it is, uh, it is short. Uh, so Chief, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, I, have, I have, as I indicated in your new services, I don't see this and you are saying that in case you hire 28, uh, full-time FTEs, you will be allocating is 
So my direct question to you is, is the shootings and the killings is not a priority for the OPS in this budget? I appreciate the way you framed the question. It is a priority. That's why we've maintained our guns and gangs unit. That's why we've maintained our drug unit. That's why we've maintained our, our homicide unit, formerly major crimes unit. That's why we have an intelligence section. So we want to maintain those levels of staffing. You've heard from it, uh, Deputy Granger, even though we have units, they're understaffed because we have not been able to continue to hire for growth in those areas. Now, the trend lines around guns and gang shootings over the last five years with the dip in COVID, which we're the only city to benefit from uh, in 2020, our numbers have been pretty steady over the last five years. They have not been dramatically increasing. So we, we are staffed adequately at this moment. And I put in air quotes, we're staffed adequately at this moment if we can get our actual establishment uh, positions filled. If we're going to be, um, if the budget will be reduced significantly, we're going to have to consider the impact of that reduction and how that will affect those current levels of capacity, not just in guns and gangs, across the board. We're understaffed in a number of areas. We're understaffed in CID. We're understaffed in frauds. We're understaffed in SACA, in traffic. We're not maximally staffed in almost any of the core areas. So it remains a priority. We just can only staff to the level the resources allow us to. So, so chief, uh, if I have correct, if I've understood correctly, is that the budget will have an impact. So, what what the acting deputy uh, Granger advise that it is the present staffing level is at about sixty percent. So, if the budget or there are impact of the budget further, it will be impacted further, right? Yeah, the current, we're, we're budgeted for 20 positions in guns and gangs. There are only 12 members there right now. And so that's that's the 60% number. Okay. Again, I, I, just, I just want to be clear, Member Norman, sorry. I, I can't tell you that it's a one-for-one one equation. If we go down by a million dollars, I got to take, you know, 10 people out of guns and gangs unit. Whatever the board ultimately decides, and it's the board's decision at this point. We've made a submission that allows us to maintain what we believe is the adequate and barely effective level of police service delivery in this city. It's the board's decision whether they want to increase that amount or decrease that amount. That is now over to the board to decide. If you decide to increase it, we will allocate those extra resources against the priorities of the board and the expressed priorities of the community. If you decide to decrease it, We'll have to find a way to reallocate, but I can't tell you for sure whether or not the, the money, the resources will come out of guns and gangs, come out of frauds, come out of partner assault, come out of anywhere. We will have to wait for your decision about the resource allocation and then make the adjustments based on it. But we've presented a draft budget with the staffing in the areas and the resources in areas that we think we can maintain adequate and effective policing in 2022. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, it leads me to the next one. Uh, what is the situation in the units of sexual assault, cybercrime, and fraud? Uh, you have briefly touched it, but I, I, I need a further enhancement to that. And my reason is because especially during the COVID, the use of internet has exponentially increased. And I wish to know what is the situation of the OPS in that direction presently and the future impacts. Yep. Thank you very much. And again, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Acting Deputy Granger to give you the exact numbers in those areas. Thank you, Chief. And Member Newman, I was going to give you the number on the, the uh, numbers on guns and gangs, but the Chief's already done that. But in terms of uh, the uh, uh, sexual assault and, and child abuse, we have 23 constable positions. Uh, uh, right now, our total active uh, strength, is, we have 21 constables working. We have uh, the supervisors were seventy-five percent uh, staffed, um, so that's the that's the number there. You asked as well about the cyber. Uh, we we have uh, positions for uh, cyber positions, but they've never been filled. We do not have uh, a, a a dedicated cyber uh, unit uh, at the moment. So this leads. So so what I have correct understood correctly. 90% of the business nowadays, and as a business, as a businessman myself, 
and my clients, if 90% of the business is being done on the internet, OPS does not have a cyber crime unit in case there is a financial fraud of 10 rupees or $10 or $100, 100 thousands, you do not have any resources or capabilities to handle that? We have, we have a, a staffed establishment of four positions for a cyber crime unit. Because we are so stretched in all the other areas, we've had to make decisions to spread those resources to those other priority areas. So yes, right now there are zero people working in our cyber crime unit. We are one of the few major police services that don't, do not have that capability. But as we said at the very beginning of this, we're trying to find that balance between the wide range of expectations around what services are needed and what we can actually deliver within the envelope that we've been given and within the pressures that we've, we've been trying to mitigate. Member Nerman, I believe we should have a cyber crime unit in, in the nation's capital for all the reasons you just talked about. We do not have any dedicated people in that area. Frauds is another major pressure that is affecting small and medium sized businesses. We are understaffed and overtasked in that area. We are trying to maintain more optimal resources in the area of partner assault, sexual assault, human trafficking, because VAW has been an express priority for this chief and the previous chiefs, but we can only spread it so thin for so far for so long. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, and thanks, Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Member Nerman. Uh, Member King, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd really like to uh, thank uh, the members of this uh, committee for uh, providing really in-depth questions, uh, not just uh, during this budget process, but throughout the year. Uh, I did uh, participate in some of the working group discussions. And I know that um, the, uh, the, the committee here is uh, committed to uh, really asking the hard questions to uh, find efficiencies. I saw that myself and will continue to do that. Um, I guess uh, I just have two questions. One uh, dovetails uh, with uh, Chair Smallwood's uh, question around the data-driven service optimization, and maybe this is something uh, that uh, can be added um, uh, to uh, his, his questions for written uh, response, is really uh, what will the service optimization look like? I know that in uh, the um, description, it says the application of this uh, information management, uh, information technology data strategy will enhance the OPS's ongoing efforts to find efficiencies. Uh, I, I would also like to see us uh, or see the service speak to um, the uh, potential efficiencies that would be found and what their range could potentially be for the investment uh, that we would be making that $700,000 investment. I also would like to get a sense of whether uh, this would be, a, you know, more of an in-source solution or outsource solution, what the solution looks like, uh, how it would actually improve service delivery, and how it might actually uh, determine uh, greater efficiencies. Um, the other question I have is um, on the other side of the ledger, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe uh, either the chief or the uh, somebody from the command team could to speak to this, is uh, obviously the revenue side. And uh, we know that there's uh, going to be, um, eight, I guess, a uh, $800,000 increase. And uh, it was noted uh, that uh, the provincial and federal uh, revenue budgets are experiencing an increase uh, um, to the grant. Um, I was just wondering um, if the service could speak uh, to uh, whether this is uh, sufficient, uh, considering the uh, policing responsibilities um, often uh, that are dictated by, um, you know, uh, federal uh, imperatives. Um, you know, we have this problem, obviously, at the municipality around grants in lieu of taxes. So I'm just curious, and I know we had a bit of discussion about this before. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to whether the dollars that we are receiving in, in terms of grants are uh, sufficient for uh, the, uh, the requests uh, for service uh, based on other uh, initiatives and, and federal events that emerge in, in the capital. Uh, we'll try to thank you, um, Member King um, and Chair Smallwood through you. Um, uh, we'll provide the, the details in the first series of your questions in the Monday report. So thank you for that. And again, if you're able to send the specifics of your, of your questions so we can make sure we understand and reply to them. Probably for a bigger discussion that this board needs to, 
needs to have on an ongoing basis. It's come up a couple of times today, but really not as much as it should have in my tenure here. We're the police of jurisdiction in the national capital region. Um, while we get some transfer funds from the federal government, I don't think it's anywhere near enough for the overall responsibilities that we've always been under, and increasingly because of the withdrawal of particularly the RCMP from policing in the national capital region itself. I've undertaken discussions with my federal partners from the RCMP to CSIS, to CBSA, uh, to the Parliamentary Protection Services. I've had a series of meetings since I've been here around the integration of our operations, the sharing of information and the costing of the delivery of those operations. I believe that we are significantly underfunded based on the responsibilities we currently have and that we will have in the future. And that will require a substantive ongoing discussion beyond myself. I would encourage the board to become more informed about those pressures and more involved in seeking to rectify that. The provincial government is set to make some announcements around funding for police services across Ontario. I can tell you that the OACP, Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police and myself have been actively pushing the Solicitor General to a lesser degree, the Attorney General, to properly fund the new Police Service Act, specifically the requirements of the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. Funding that doesn't necessarily go directly into the police service budget, but goes to implementing those plans in all municipalities and regional municipalities. Again, I have to tell you, it's been very frustrating, the, the commitment from the, to, from the province around funding the requirements of that act. By the way, that goes back to the funding of the previous act as well. And so a lot of that does get left to scrambling around for grants that you cannot count on stable funding, that have requirements that don't allow you to actually deliver what you need because they, you, you have to deliver to what the province needs. And by the way, I've heard social service providers and not-for-profit sector providers complain about the same challenges. We're no different. This is a challenge when you don't provide core funding to core legislation. So this issue of provincial transfer payments through granting or, or other transfer mechanisms and federal transfer payments through granting is a challenge for us and we're going to have to work together on that. Provide more information for your other questions in the Monday report. I appreciate that, Chief. And uh, I'd also love to see um, a breakdown, if possible, as to the gap in terms of the dollars that uh, we should be receiving uh, from uh, the federal government in terms of a grant based on the policing responsibilities uh, that are uh, being driven uh, to the to uh, the Ottawa Police Service. So um, if that would be uh, possible as well in some type of uh, fashion, it would be uh, much appreciated. That may take a little longer than the Monday promise, but that definitely should be on the agenda for going forward into 2022 and beyond. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Member King. Uh, Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair Smallwood. Uh, I wanna thank you for a very fruitful and informative discussion of the FAC. Uh, there's been a lot of information uh, going back and forth and it's been very helpful. Um, uh, like Member Nerman, uh, I'm not a member of the FAC, but I really appreciate all the information that's been coming out. Um, Chair, I would like to know what, what is strategies, what is Strategy Corp's role now at this point? Are they going to be providing any recommendations uh, and, and guiding us on different uh, things that we can do? Absolutely. Yeah, we we uh, will be, they actually are part of this. They have been uh, part of this meeting today. They've been monitoring the meeting. So we will absolutely be uh, uh, talk, speaking to them and, uh, and part of the, our discussions going forward will be influenced by uh, their recommendations and their answers for uh, um, uh, the questions that have been raised. And uh, it is our intention that the working group will be meeting with them again. So yes, absolutely, they will continue to be part of. And, and once this is finished, I'll be talking to the other members of the working group, Chair Deans and Member Johnson, and we'll be uh, discussing the next steps with Strategy Corp. Okay. And can you just refresh my memory on when we can expect something from them? Well, I, I'm not going to try to, to predict that because we haven't spoken to them yet. But I think after we've had a chance to speak with them, we'll be able to answer that question. Uh, I, I would think fairly quickly, given that we don't have a lot of time. But it would certainly be my intention that 
subject to the chair's availability and member Johnson's availability to, to get on this immediately and then have some sort of uh, feedback uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you. And then uh, I just have one question uh, uh, for the chief. Um, chief, uh, based on the questions uh, presented by member Nerman, uh, there appears to be a lot of deficiencies in many areas of, uh, of our police service. Um, is there a requirement under the Police Services Act to ensure that they're properly resourced? I mean, as, as it, it's very important, definitely, that uh, violence against women and guns and gangs are taken care of. But is this sustainable to leave these other areas under-resourced? Thank you, uh, Member Sueda. An important question. Um, from a provincial regulation standpoint, the regulations and standards are underpin the Act itself. We're in compliance with our provincial requirements. But, but that's where the, the, the the art, the science, and voodoo of a police service and a police service board in terms of describing effectively and resourcing effectively adequate and effective policing. Um, are we in compliance? Yes. Are we effectively in compliance? There's a question mark. Um, in the fourth industrial revolution, which is an information age, we should have a cyber capability where it's staffed and, and available to the million people in the city, including small, medium, and large sized business owners. We don't have that capability. We're not in non-compliance with the act or non-compliance with the standards and regulations. We're just not staffing an effective and needed resource to provide services in the city. We are very staffed up in the area of our sexual assault unit and partner assault unit, not 100%, but much more than we are in the 0% that is the, the cyber crime unit because we have an express priority from the board we have an express priority from our community and we are needed to, to be in compliance with standards and regulations in that area. But that's not to say we're providing the full range of police services that a city of this size and complexity actually needs at a level on an ongoing basis. There's another reality that's very hard to write into a budget report and hard to understand. But when you have an ice storm that, that cripples the city for weeks, if not months, when you have tornadoes and floods, when you have the potential of, of a terror attack, like we had back in 2014, and you have to surge resources, particularly uniformed resources, towards that on a 24-7 basis, if you cut things down too much, you don't have that surge capacity. We have not made that claim in the 2022 budget. I want to be clear about that. But at some point, when we really need that surge of resources, not for an hour, but for a day, a week, or a month, we may not have that ability. And that is something that I, as a police chief of jurisdiction here, and you as a board have to consider when you're adding up all those line by line items. I can definitely appreciate uh, what you're saying for sure. Um, you know, it's easy to say we need less of something or more of something when nothing is happening. But when something does happen, um, you know, who, who's available? Um, and I just, uh, Chief, for just a final question, because a lot of my answer, a lot of my questions were already answered by other uh, other uh, members. Um, what would you say the one thing that keeps you up at night with regards to this budget process? Decisions to the base budget have a compounding effect. The decisions that this board will make around this budget positive or negative, will have a compounding effect. If you increase the budget, it'll have a compounding effect on the tax base. If you decrease the budget, it'll have a compounding effect on the ability of this police service, not just this chief in command, the next chief in command to deliver adequate and effective police services. I also think that this is an important time for the city to review the relationship between the oversight body and the police service, the entire city. Are we aligned towards a shared vision even though we're not exactly on the same page, but are we more rather than less aligned on a shared vision of what a different and better police service looks like that is differently and better working with broader civil society in this city, the nation's capital. And I really hope that coming out from this budget process, we have a sustainable organization to deliver police services beyond my term in office. And we have signaled to this city that they have confidence in the overall vision and direction and alignment of the service and the board in that in accomplishing that 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 multi-year approach. That's what keeps me up, keeps me up at night. I got to tell you, beyond that, 
the health and safety of my members. They are stretched and they are strained. And they deliver services on a 24 seven basis over the entire pandemic period. Every call they go to could result in a range of tragedies and traumas to the community and to our members. And they do a fantastic job in delivering services day in and day out. And I have to tell you the stress and strain on them keeps me up at night. And whether or not a phone call that comes in at 10 o'clock or two o'clock in the morning is gonna be a call where there's a member of the community tragically injured in whatever the circumstances or a member of my service tragically injured or killed. That's what really keeps me up at night. The stress and strain that we're experiencing in society broadly. We have human beings that work for you, board. We have human beings that work for you. They're tired. They're stressed. They're under pressure. Quite frankly, they're underappreciated. And they need leadership within this organization. They need leadership from the board and they need allyship and partnership within the community. We know we need to be better. We know we need to change. We know we need to be the best possible group of professionals and individually the most professional we can. But the strain is palpable. It's been that way from the first day I took office. It's only gotten worse. And I need the board's help to turn that around. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, um, Member King. Uh, thank you, Chair Smallwood. And this is just a uh, brief uh, follow-up to uh, Member Sueda's uh, question around the Strategy Corps and the Working Group. Um, you know, I'm not a formal member of uh, the Finance and Audit Committee, but I had the opportunity to join the Working Group for a few sessions, and I just wanted to uh, reconfirm that uh, that would be possible. I know that uh, this board has been very transparent with um, uh, the results of these uh, of these uh, working groups and of uh, the agendas and uh, but i just wanted to ensure uh, that uh, that that invitation is extended to to all of us in order to provide some input if possible yes well i certainly have a discussion with the chair about that and uh, and see that uh, we we do as you know have an issue about we can't have the whole board meeting because then we have a quorum issue and everything but i think many of the questions that member sueda member nerman Others, uh, you know, it, it might be very beneficial if we could arrange for uh, some sort of uh, dialogue with Strategy Corp and the individual members so we avoid the quorum issues, but allow their, them to get their questions answered because I think we're at that point now where the more dialogue we can have and the more questions that can get answered uh, would be really positive. So I'll certainly speak to the chair about that and uh, with the chair's support, uh, we'll see if we can arrange that sooner rather than later. So that would certainly be my commitment. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Member Johnson. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so I have a motion right now that I'd like to raise, if that's okay. Um, totally. All right. So, so, I mean, I think there's been a lot of helpful discussion here and a lot of comments made on the draft budget today as well as some important questions. And uh, I thank uh, the command team and the leadership that they're gonna work on getting us answers by Monday. That will be very helpful for, our, for us to uh, read and think about and get strategy corps input on. And as we still need this detailed information pertaining to the budget in order to develop a recommendation, for this reason, I would like to move the following motion that the Finance and Audit Committee forward the 2022 draft operating and capital budgets to the Ottawa Police Service Board for consideration at the November 22nd meeting in the absence of any specific endorsement or recommendation from the committee in light of the outstanding budget related information the committee's working group will be continuing to seek from the service between now and the next board meeting. So that's my motion. 
Okay, uh, I just want to make sure before we vote on that, uh, I just realized uh, uh, we hadn't heard from uh, Member Meehan and oh. we had heard from everybody else. So I just wanted to make sure before we, we vote on that, if that's okay with you, if uh, just in sure. case Member Meehan had anything that she wanted to raise before we, we sort of wrap things up with your motion. I'm not hearing anything. So, uh, and I just want to confirm there's no other board member that wanted to ask any other questions before we wrap up. Not seeing anything. So, okay. With, uh, is there any discussion about uh, uh, member Johnson's motion? Is everyone in? I think that, well, maybe a better way of putting it, is there anybody opposed to the motion? Uh, <laughs> Sandy? Yes. Sorry, uh, is this a motion being proposed to the FAC or is it to the entire board? This is, this is what we would, this is what we would put forward to the board. Okay, so it's only the, it's only the FAC members who are going to vote on this motion. Yes. Yeah, because this is an FAC meeting. Okay, I just want that point of clarification. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a very good point of clarification. Uh, member, uh, Chair Deans. Well, I, I just want to thank Member Johnson for the motion. I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, we've left a lot of questions on the table that we're awaiting answers for, and I don't think we're in a position today to make a recommendation to the board. So I think this has been a, a very important information gathering uh, day. There's been a lot of good dialogue. There's been a lot of good questions um, asked, and I think we need to uh, await that information and deliberate on our final uh, decision decision at the board meeting. So when member Johnson, thank you for the motion. I think that was the right idea. Chair uh, <clears throat> Smallwood, is it possible that uh, this motion can be displayed now or a copy of that motion, we email it to us because uh, just to understand it completely. Uh, Certainly, it, it, as I said, this is for the FAC committee, this motion okay. for the FAC committee. So it okay. will, what it basically is saying is, is that we're going to bring forward that without any recommendation, we're just going to bring forward the budget to the full group. So you will act, you will be seeing this as a member of the board. This will yeah, come to funny. you as a member of the board. Sorry, um, sorry for bringing this up. No, 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 absolutely, it's okay. Uh, so uh, now I'll read out the final recommendation for this item, that the Finance and Audit Committee receive the presentation and delegations for information and consideration. Is this item received? Received. Received. So uh, is there any other business at this point? I'm not seeing any. Uh, this meeting could go on a little longer if we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner hasn't been served yet. We're, we're good, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> we're good. Day. Okay. So the next, the next meeting of the Finance and Audit Committee is still to be determined. And I'm wondering if I could find anybody who'd be prepared to move a motion for adjournment. I would do that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. So the motion, the meeting is adjourned and uh, we will be in touch shortly with uh, uh, discussions about how we can put you all in touch with Strategy Corp. So thank you very much. <laughs>